Hey guys, welcome to Outscale's Game Development Program. My name is Mayan Grover. I'm the founder of Outscale. At Outscale, our main goal is to train the next generation of technology leaders. We made this course so that anybody interested in getting into a game development as a professional career has the right access to the resources needed to get started. This tutorial will help you get started even if you have no prior knowledge of game development. I have been working in the game industry for more than 8 years now, both in companies in India and US. We have trained a lot of successful game developers in the past, which are now working with some of the best reputed companies in the world. Through this course, we will be teaching you the fundamentals of Unity and C Sharp and giving you all the right kind of tools and exposure you need to get your career started in game development. If you don't have any prior knowledge of game development, don't worry, we will take you through step by step from the most fundamental to advanced level concepts in order to get you started with building your own games. This tutorial is ideal for students who have already done a little bit of programming irrespective of which programming language you might have done it in. If this is your first attempt into doing any kind of programming, then I would recommend that you check out our YouTube channel which will have other resources where you can learn getting started with your first programming language. By the end of this course, our goal is to make you super comfortable working in Unity 3D Engine along with C Sharp so you can build your own games, be it 2D games or 3D games and play them with your friends. Here we'll be focusing on building a 2D platformer game very much like the Mario games where you'll be able to create your player, add animations to it, make your character move around the level, build multiple levels, add interactable elements such as keys that you can pick up along with enemies that you can add. At Outscale, one of our core initiatives is to support open learning and as a result we are launching this program completely for free. We are also building a dedicated community of passionate game developers, web developers on Discord. During this course, if you face any issues while building your projects, please feel free to ask relevant questions on our Discord community and other students who have already done this course will be there to help you out. The link to join our Discord community will be in the description below. In case you are interested in enrolling into one of our 6 months program for full stack web development or game development where we train students to become industry ready at no upfront cost, feel free to check out our website at www.outscale.com. All the relevant information for this program will also be mentioned in the description. We usually publish a lot of information such as interview questions, hiring patterns, what's the latest and the greatest happening in tech industry both in gaming and web technologies. In order to stay up to date on relevant information, please follow us on our social media channels, link below. Alright, so hopefully you guys can all see my screen right now. Um, so in our previous session, we covered the basics of all the tools that we internally use for uh, all our projects that we'll build, uh, all the uh, things that we use. So uh, going forward, whoever sort of, you know, continues with us for the full duration of the course, will get you all set up with all everything that you might need, uh, be it, you know, the, the Unity setup, the Visual Studio that we use, etc. All those things will get you set up, that's not an issue. Okay, so right now what you see on my screen, that's basically the Unity Hub. Okay, so this is something also we covered in the previous uh, session. This is where you can control what all versions of Unity that uh, that you can basically install on your machine. So if I go to this install section, you can see I have like these five different Unity versions that I have installed. I might be using one with certain project, I might be using another Unity version with another project, et cetera, et cetera. So it purely depends on what kind of projects I'm working on. Um, if I'm working with some company and they have like an old project from two years back, uh, you know, you'll see these older versions of Unity. 5.6 is like the older version, 2018 is like later, newer versions. Uh, now there is 2019 versions as well, but I'm not using those for uh, any, you know, uh, projects or anything like that. So I, I don't have it installed yet. But if you want, you can obviously add uh, and you can select which version of Unity you want to install. So I can select the latest version. As you can see, 2019.2.2 uh, is the latest one. I can just install this from here. And once it's done, it will let me know. Okay. 
So for, for now, you can use any version along for this particular project. You can use anything that's 2018 and above, and it should be fine. Uh, cool. So switching to back to the project view, but what we'll do is we'll first get you started with what uh, Unity is, how it works, et cetera, et cetera, okay? I'm, I'm pretty sure anybody who's in, even remotely interested in game development, you would have heard the name Unity 3D somewhere or the other, right? So essentially it's a game engine and that's the core game engine that a lot of the companies nowadays use and, and a lot of companies are hiring uh, engineers who know or you know uh, who know how to work with this game engine so once you have the unity engine installed it will come with visual studio as well by default so you can just do a tick while installing unity and it will install visual studio for you so once you have these two sort of softwares installed we'll come to this project window and we'll say new and all we are doing is we are creating a new project okay so i'm gonna say um, I'm gonna start a 2D project. Okay, I'm gonna say intro to game dev as my project name, and I'm gonna choose a slightly different location. I'm gonna create a new folder, intro to game dev. All right, cool. So I'm gonna select this folder and I'm gonna create. So now while this loads up this project, um, it'll, now you'll see what exactly Unity looks like. If this is like your first time, don't worry. Uh, we'll just cover the basics of what individual elements of the engine are and how you can, uh, you know, what you can do with it. Um, so give it one time, it's trying to get everything set up. Um, so based on whether you, if you are starting a new 3D project, so instead of the 2D option, you will select the 3D option. Um, if you're selecting uh, anything that's like the, uh, you know, you're, you're making an AR app kind of a thing or a VR application. So you'll accordingly, you know, from the opening window where we were selecting a new project, you can select uh, what kind of a project. In this case, we're going to go with the simplest possible one, which is 2D. So we'll start working with that. All right, cool. So typically now my, my this is how my project looks. Um, Right now it's empty, there's nothing in there, and we'll just quickly look into what each of these pieces that you see on the screen right now mean, okay? So essentially what you see here on the left, um, this is my scene view. What this does is if I create anything visual, right? Like if you work with anything, um, say uh, something more around uh, Photoshop or any of these visual editing tools kind of thing, right? So whatever is your entire uh, project uh, or entire thing that you see in the game that's set up, so this is that will show up here, which is basically the scene view, uh, what we call a scene view for Unity. Okay, it just means that this is the current uh, current thing that will show up in the game. Okay, but and you can like move it around, tweak it, and you'll see how you can change it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, while you are building this game, right? So, so it's like uh, the when 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 you talk about theater, right? Like you have a stage. So this is like the stage for your entire game. Okay. So essentially, that's your scene view. Uh, follow the rabbit. Okay, got it. Thanks, Vishal. Uh, so then you have this called thing called as a game game view. Okay. So this is essentially what will show up on the screen to the player. So if you're building, say, an Android game, right? So what will show up on the device uh, on your phone when you actually launch the game is basically your game view, okay? So it's like looking through the camera uh, of the game and what the camera sees is what you will see in the game view, right? So this in view is called the inspector. So it kind of details out each properties of each object that are currently in the game. And we'll just look into what exactly each project, like object is and what these properties are. But this is supposed to give you a view into what these properties are for a particular object, where it is, at what degrees it is rotated, things like that, right? Um, 
this on the right bottom corner that you see is called the project view. This is where you can see all the folders inside your particular thing. So, um, you know, typically what you see inside your Windows Explorer kind of thing, right? Like this is your entire hierarchy. So you can go create a new folder. I'm going to call it uh, scripts. So I'm going to start putting all the scripts that I create in here. Um, if it's like a 3D project, I'm going to create maybe a folder called models. I'm going to put everything, uh, all the 3D models inside, you know, this particular thing. If I have a lot of images, I might create something like um, images or textures, I might call them. So they can go by different names and I'll create a separate folder for that. Okay. So, so we'll, this is basically how you organize your entire project. Um, we'll come to what these scenes are, so don't worry about that. But this project view is essentially your window into your entire file hierarchy and your folder structure for that particular file. Okay. Um, and the scene that you see here, which is the default thing, we didn't create anything. This Unity created for us. Okay. So the sample scene is basically this default stage that Unity creates when you start a new project. We can delete it, we can start a different one, but basically each scene is like a setup. So imagine if you have, if you're building like a racing game, right? And you have multiple tracks. Each track can be represented and saved as a separate scene, okay? So the whole idea is that you break your game into these different scenes that you need at different times, right? So if you have a stage of theater, one stage reflects say, you know, uh, Melbourne, Australia, another one reflects India, another one reflects London, whatever, right? So each of them are like physical worlds that will exist in your game, but are separate from each other. So we break them into different things called scenes and each scene is stored as like a single file. So I can double click and open this scene. Right now the scene is empty. Uh, it doesn't have anything, so I don't see it. But imagine if this was like a full racetrack, I would see that racetrack. If I open another scene for another racetrack, I'll see that. And then I can make changes to it and I can save it. So essentially everything we build in Unity will be stored as a scene. Scene is basically the highest level thing that puts all the objects, cars, models, whatever you have, right? Packs them together into one file and stores it. So what you see in this hierarchy view is basically your current scene that's open. So right now our sample scene is open. So as you can see, there's only one object, which is the main camera, uh, is the only object in this particular scene. So we'll create more objects as we go on today, but this is where in the hierarchy view is where you can actually see what all objects exist. Okay, cool. Now, the thing that you see at the bottom, this thing called console, is the most important tool that you will have access to because this is where all the information that you want to debug in your game will show up as messages here, right? So if you've worked with any other development environment, say like Android or, or JavaScript or anything of that nature, you would be familiar with something like console.log right or debug.log kind of things so android has something called as adb that shows you log messages javascript in in javascript you can do console and dot log and it will show a message uh, to you know um, in your uh, browser window right so console is exactly the same thing it lets you uh, you know display certain messages with information that let you kind of debug uh, your game and figure out what's happening in the game at different stages. Now, when you start your own Unity um, project, it might not look like this. Uh, the reason for that is something called as layout. So I have this custom layout and I have stored this as a layout. So whenever I start a new project, this is the default layout that looks to me. So you can drag these, these, all these windows are sort of, you know, you can move them around, you can drag them. So I've moved the inspector here. So depending on what you're comfortable with, you can, you know, reassign these in parallel. So now I only see this, I can switch them around. So you can do a lot of these things. Uh, each of the window that you see is basically customizable. Um, I want to see my scene view and game view together. So I'm gonna do something like this. Now, the blue section that you see is my game view. 
which basically shows me how it will look on the device. Um, on the left is my scene view, which shows me how I'm setting these up. I can move this around. I can, you know, edit these things, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, you know, so every sort of window here is customizable. So the setup that you see is how I prefer it. Once you sort of start getting used to it, um, you'll figure out what you are comfortable with, and you can accordingly move things around and get a hang of how you like to, you know, create this view for you. And then you can go to layout and say save layout. But once you have organized this thing, you can just save it and Unity will remember that, hey, this is my custom layout, right? And next time, all you want to do is switch to the default view. So this is the view that normally Unity comes with, which is the default view. I don't personally prefer it, just a matter of taste. So I just switch to custom view. And this is the view that I like to use personally. I find myself more uh, comfortable using this, okay? So it's up to you. You go ahead, play around with it, see what you're comfortable with, and then you can go ahead and save that layout so that next time you don't have to move these windows every time around, and Unity remembers that this is the view that you want to use. All right, cool. So, so far that's a little bit about um, these different windows. If accidentally you end up closing any of them, they are accessible through this window option. So all these are available uh, under these different settings so mine is a mac so some of my options might look a little bit different but you can go and check around in all of these and you will be able to find uh, your specific ones uh, let me show you where so windows layout so you see these layout options and then you have uh, uh, one sec yeah it just keeps moving things around all the time I think I have all of them open at the moment. But yeah, you can basically just like don't worry in case you're using a, a, a Windows machine and some of the options look different. That's just because I'm on a Mac. Okay, cool. So, so now this is how, uh, how an empty project kind of looks like. So to get started, I'm going to refer to Trello. Now Trello is the basic project management tool that we use. Uh, again, something that I, a, a basic hierarchy overview of it I covered in my previous lecture. So uh, just refer to that YouTube video. We'll share you the link um, or just reach out to us after this and we can share you the link uh, for it. Uh, but this will basically going forward for everyone that's enrolled in our program, right? Uh, this is how we will cover specific topics each, um, each class. And then there will be a follow-up assignment for that particular class. That you know that will give you practice about uh, how to go about actually implementing the things that we have covered. Okay, so so we'll kick off by we just kicked off by doing a quick introduction to Unity and and the basic views that it covers. Next, we'll cover what is exactly a game object. Right. So switching back to Unity. So in Unity's world. Everything is essentially a game object. So when I say what that means is that if I want a character to be displayed on a screen, uh, it, it will be a game object. Anything that should be visible in the world is a game object. Now, game object is a very generic sort of a thing. Um, both, you know, if I, if I want to show a 2D image on the screen, uh, that is also a game object. If I want to show a 3D car, that is also a game object. Chances are 3D objects might be a complex combination of multiple game objects. So like the wheel might be one object. You might have four wheels, which are one object, one game object each. Then you have one game object representing the body. Um, and, and these five objects together form the car, right? Just, just giving you an example. So typically how objects are structured they can be simple objects they can be complex objects uh, it purely depends on what exactly you're working with okay so uh, ultimately the whole point is that anything that needs to be represented in the engine um, and needs to be say shown on the screen uh, it needs to have a corresponding game object for it so everything in unity's world is a game object 
typically each object lives basically inside the scene so we just talked about what a scene is right um, a scene is now the formal definition of a scene is that it's a collection of game objects so everything put together can uh, can be saved as a scene so now i have this uh, sample scene open i'm going to right click in my uh, you know in my hierarchy and you can see a lot of these options create an empty so this will create me an empty game object that has nothing on it yet i can go ahead and add it but unity also gives us these some sort of uh, uh, standard things that i want so if i want to create a text on the ui like you know show a high score or something like that or maybe create a play button anything of that nature right it gives me these shortcuts so it will create an object it will attach a button and all the other things that it needs to attach so it will be sort of like a complex game object okay so for now let's go with creating an empty so when i created an empty game object you see this new thing earlier we just had the camera now it has created this empty uh, it has created this empty game object um, but it still has this now when i actually select this object you can actually see in the inspector view we can see its properties so by default each game object comes with something called as a transform okay so now what is this transform transform is something that's internally defined uh, as a standard thing in unity what it's supposed to do is supposed to store three things each object's position its rotation and its scale that's the core uh, idea of a transform okay so and you can see all these three properties here so this is the position this is the rotation and this is the scale now this object if i double click you can see these arrows inside my uh, uh, scene view right this object right now doesn't have anything that's why i don't see anything in this particular thing so what i'm doing is i'm using my mouse wheel to zoom in and out so i can get closer but there's nothing in it because it's it's an empty object you see it doesn't have like you don't see a a box or anything next to it right because it's an empty object so but these arrow indicate its position in the entire world so where you see these two axes cross that's the position of this uh that's the position of this game object um in the scene view you have this sort of 2d button uh if you enable it then we are basically restricting our view our scene view to be just 2d so we are we're creating a 2d game we're just restricting it restricting the entire thing to be flat uh and and it will give us a 2d perspective but i can disable this and now i see the entire world as a 3d world so i can move around using my mouse so all i'm doing right now is right clicking and moving so i can see the things differently and i can use zoom in zoom out to focus on that specific object so right now i am clicking on the game object right so you see this arrows are positioned here when i click on the main camera you will see the arrows shift right because my camera is positioned there where you see this sort of uh, white dot thing right so this is the position of my camera you see the z value the z axis is highlighted as minus 10 versus for my game object it's highlighted as 0 right so there is a distance of 10 on the z axis which is this blue axis um so the z axis is blue and the matching arrow next to it is blue so when i click and drag this game object around you can see its corresponding uh z value here changes right so if i'm moving it closer to the camera now it's basically at sort of minus 10 right if i just move it something like this i say minus 10 i can actually type the value and the the position of it updates so now the game object the empty game object and the camera are at the same position right you don't see them move around but you can drag these things click and drag them and you can actually move them around right i can move them on all the three axes but for now we are focusing on doing something 2d so let's switch back to 2d and we'll come back to uh, uh we'll come back to this uh hey, can so somebody is trying to scribble on the screen can you guys just uh, make sure one sec that you can yeah one sec
All right, cool. So, so yeah, so let's go back. So now you can see since we moved this object around, I now want to bring it back to the center. So I'm gonna, you can position these things around if you know, uh, you want exact control, um, you know the values of the position. So for me, I want to position them at zero, 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 which is the center of the entire world. Um, the entire 3D slash 2D world is centered at coordinate zero, zero, zero. I'm just gonna change the values quickly. Right? So that's the basic idea about a game object, what exactly a game object is. And now we'll look into some of the other, other pieces. So we just covered what transforms are. Um, basically, they're storing all the position data, the rotation data, and um, you know uh, the scale. Scale is basically how how big. By default, everything comes with a scale of one, one, one. But I, if I want my something to be stretched along the x-axis, I can make it scale to two, comma one, comma one. So that means on the x is twice as big versus one, and and you can create like some kind of uh, weird looking objects with it, but sometimes it's helpful. If you want to quickly scale up something to double its size, you'll simply say two comma two. And now in the X and the Y, if you're making a 2D game, it will become double its size. Okay. So a transform stores rotation, position, and scale. All right. So essentially, um, everything that you see in Unity that, you know, if I look at main camera, we just looked at transform when when we created an empty object we saw this transform component uh, when like you you see these individual pieces transform camera audio layer each of these is called a component okay so the idea is that unity is heavily dependent on something called as a component architecture so game object is a generic thing rest everything is designed as a component so like an image an image is a component uh transform that we just talked about it's a component i can attach now transform is a special type of a component that cannot be removed from a game object but camera is just like image or any other components that we'll see but the idea is that any of these components can be attached or removed from a game object when they're needed okay so i can go on camera right click on this options uh, menu and say remove component you see this option right so you can say remove now even though this object's name is main camera it's no longer acting as a camera because i removed the camera component from it i can go to my other game object and say add component and search for camera now my game object suddenly became the camera because it has the camera component on it. So whichever object has camera on it becomes the camera, right? So you can do a lot more things with this, but the core fundamental principle here is that we've taken this empty object, attached a component on it that we wanted, and now that is serving a very different purpose. Earlier, it was an empty object. We could have attached an image on it and it would have turned into an image object. Now we attached a camera component to it, so it has become a camera object. And we can have multiple types of components as well. These are all the, when you click on this add component option, right? you'll see there are so many different components that Unity provides. So imagine I'm doing something with uh, UI. Right. So you see all are, all of these are nothing but components or some of them could be a group of components. So if I quickly show you, I'm going to create a empty game object. Now in this comp by default, it comes with obviously the transform component. I'm going to say, I'm going to add a UI and I'm going to select a button. Now you'll see unity add this particular component on it, button. it has a lot of things which are the different options etc and we'll just go into the details of it but it has created this i'm going to create another empty game object this time i'm going to add let's see something else uh what do i want to add so i want to add ui i want to add say drop down so now it has added this drop down component right so 
don't worry about what these components are we'll just talk about it so what i want to show you here is that each of these components can be added and removed at like on a game object that we want right so it's not something that uh, an object named main camera is the one that's supposed to have the camera i can even delete this uh, particular game object but i still have a camera by the name of game object in it and i can rename this to be camera so it's a very flexible system i can do any kind of processing on it i can attach components i can remove components and, and accordingly you know that's how my game will uh, like we'll build different games okay so hopefully you guys are following around what these components are transform is a special type of a component every time you create a new game object it by default comes with a transform okay cool so let's quickly and again all the all the scripts that we'll create right these are also components just that these are not unity defined components these are our components these are the ones that we are creating okay so so now we'll quickly jump into a little bit of uh, code and start seeing how how we can start coding few basic things in in c sharp and get a hang of it okay so remember i created a scripts folder i'm going to create right click uh, create and here you can see there is an option for c sharp script so i'm going to click on c sharp script i'm going to give it a name as my first script okay so i'm going to double click it will open up um, visual studio so one quick thing is that unity by default comes with uh, mono develop as the code editor but we prefer using visual studio it's just much more flexible powerful uh, to use and build games so i would recommend if you you know uh, use visual studio instead of mono develop uh, which is the one that the by default unity comes with okay so for my case i don't have mono develop i un uninstalled it so so by default it opens up visual studio all right so we're going to quickly look at what is this sort of we haven't done any code we just said create a new c sharp script and unity gave us uh unity gave us some of these sort of basic things that are already kind of set up so some of you might be familiar with uh classes if you've done any kind of you know java uh, c++ any of these uh high level object oriented programming languages so again this is a standard class that we created um we gave it a name so unity knows that we want to call this class as my first script and then it does something uh that you might not be familiar with so so what is this mono behavior so what we are doing is that we are inheriting the class we want to create from something called as a mono behavior which is another class okay so if we just quickly right click you can go to declaration and it will open up the actual sort of uh, code for that particular class not the full code but more like a definition of that code okay so you can see okay this looks scary right there's a lot of stuff here so let's not look at it and don't worry about it right but what i wanted to show here is that um even though unity makes it look very easy oh we just in created a class and we inherited from a mono behavior which is a unity provided class which gives us a lot of this functionality there's actually a lot of complex logic behind it and this is just the the header file if if you're familiar with you know c++.h files this is kind of like the header file and this just the header file right so you can imagine how big the actual code for this particular class might be right uh, and and that's not it because if you look deeper this class is inheriting from something called as a behavior class so you can actually go into that class and that class is inheriting from a component class and that class is inheriting from an object class so as you can see you are creating a class that has five classes above it there's object class there's component class there's mono behavior class and all that right so it's a very a uh, big hierarchy of classes and you're creating your class under it so that you get access to a lot of powerful things that you can do very fast and we'll look into what these powerful things are okay 
So by default, the mono behavior class that Unity provides, as you can see in this tooltip that shows up, it's inside the Unity engine namespace. So whenever you're using a Visual Studio kind of an ID and you start typing mono behavior, if you don't have this uh, using statement for importing the namespace, it will show that, hey, this class, it's not able to figure out where it is. But if you're using some ID, most likely it will give you the suggestion of where it thinks this class is. And you can just right click here and it will import it for you. Just in case uh, you, somebody deleted or something, that's how you typically uh, figure out that you don't have to ideally remember, but you should know that where this class exists, okay? So any component that we create, so my first script is a custom script that we're creating. It's inheriting from a mono behavior. And whenever something inherits from a mono behavior, it becomes a component in the Unity world, okay? Um, and now I can attach this thing, the script, to any of the game objects uh, through that same add component option, right? So now I just created something and it inherits from mono behavior. Because mono behavior has this complex hierarchy of classes, it gives me this functionality that I can say, create an empty object, and now if I say add component, and if I go to the scripts option, you'll see my first script show up here, right? And I can attach this my first script, and now my first script is, is something like when we were adding a camera, a button, or something. Now I can add and remove these from these game objects as well, okay? So if I remove this mono behavior from it, I would not be able to attach them, because then I'm saying that this is a generic, uh, so in case if this was something like, this, right? I was not inheriting it from a mono behavior. Now, if I switch back to Unity, it will throw me an error, basically. So you see, it's missing some attribute exception. So it's giving this weird error. And now here the name is also gone, right? Like earlier it was showing my script name because now this doesn't work. So if I try to add component, I go down to scripts, it will say invalid operation because it is not in, it needs to derive from mono behavior. Okay, so anytime you want to attach something to a game object, you basically need to make sure that it inherits from a mono behavior, right? So let me uncomment this out. Okay, so mono behavior acts as a component for the object in the scene. Yeah, that's correct. So as you can see, if you look at the hierarchy of the classes that we were seeing, right? So if I say go to declaration, uh, you'll see up here, Mono behavior inherits from a class called behavior. This behavior inherits from a class called component. So this is the, that component that we have been talking about so much. Everything in Unity is basically that is attachable to a game object inherit from this class component. Okay. So even the transform class would inherit from this particular thing called component. All right. Cool. So. So that's the basics of how to create a simple script that you can attach to something. Now, what are all the things that we can do inside the script, okay? So by default, Unity comes with a bunch of uh, predefined functions. So let me quick, so we just looked at C-sharp scripts, we just looked at mono behaviors. Um, so we'll cover this game loop in a bit. Uh, let me move this down a little bit. So we'll talk about the Unity inbuilt functions that we can take advantage of when we create something as a mono behavior. So as we just created this class, we didn't type in any of our custom code yet, right? But it came with these two sort of uh, predefined functions. One is start and one is update. So, so what is this all about? Okay, so Unity is like, you know, it, it's, it gives you even a basic comment about what these functions are. So with start, it told us that this is called before the first frame update, okay? Well, what does that mean? So whenever I, so I'm gonna quickly do something here. I'm gonna write a debug log. So just go with me for now, okay? I'll explain in a second um, what this means and I'll just first demo it so it's clear in your mind. 
So I'm adding a debug log message. So we saw the console window, right? So when Unity executes this line of code, it will put this string, whatever I'm specifying, in this case, my first script start function as a log message in my console, okay? So this will show up in that console and it will know, I'll know that, oh, Unity executed this line of code, this line number 10, okay? And I'm gonna put the same message, I'm just copy pasting it and uh, pasting it here, right? But here I'm gonna change the message slightly and I'm gonna say update function, right? Because I'm putting it inside the update function and we'll just see what, what this is, right? So Unity tells us that update is called once per frame, but we'll now look it at in action what's happening. So I switch back to Unity. Unity will first compile the code, make sure nothing is broken or anything like that, uh, that code can compile. After that, I'm gonna come here, I'm gonna attach add component. Uh, every time I don't need to go down scripts and find my script, what I can do is, if you remember what the name of your script is, you can actually start typing it and it will filter it for you. So this is like the shorter way to find the right thing. Uh, now my script is attached and you can see this, uh, my first script name show up as well, right? Uh, so now in a, when I want to run my game, you see this play button at the top, all you need to do is hit play. All right, so now Unity will start playing and here, if you look at the console at the bottom, right, it gave this message, my first start function, right? And you can see on the right side that it happened once. But when you look at this other one, my first script update function, you see its number is keeps going up. So it's happening multiple times. I can actually disable this collapse and now you'll see the screen keeps scrolling because I keep getting these functions again and again getting called, right? So we'll just look at what this means. So right now my game is running because I hit play. I'm gonna pause it, so use the second button to pause the game for now. And if you see here, you see all these different messages. These are from, every of these messages is from the update function, okay? So all of them are from update function. And the very first one is from the start function, right? So my first start, the collapse button in the, in the console, just since this is a duplicate message, Collapse button just lets me compress all of them together and on the right it shows me how many times it has occurred. So it just cleans it up so I don't have to scroll too much top down. Just a handy way to, uh, you know, merge all the duplicate messages together. So here you can see start got called once, but the update got called some 2,300 times or something, right? So what's happening here? The moment I press play, Unity sees that I have this game object on which I have this my first script attached, right? The component attached. So the start function is a predefined function that Unity has given us. It's not our custom function. We didn't call the start anywhere, right? Then how did my, typically when I define a function in any programming language, I have to call that function, right? So if you've written some C, C++ code, you know about the main function, right? Main function is the default function that gets called, right? Every time you run the program, you're not calling main function, somebody else is, the compiler is. In this case, Unity takes the care of calling the start function. It calls this function the very first time a game object is, you know, it comes into existence, it gets created. In this case, whenever we hit play, my game starts running, Unity loads the default scene, and it sees it has one game object on which my first script exists. So it goes in and checks my first script, does it have a start function? It says, oh yeah, it does, right? And then it starts executing this. It executes it only once, and then after that, its job is done, okay? So that's why we saw the debug log only once. But this update function is very similar to the start function, but it happens once every frame. So if imagine your game is running at 30 frames per second or 60 frames per second, then this function is getting called 30 times or 60 times per second. Each second, this is happening again and again and again and again, okay? That's why you see when we left the game running for 
you know, five, 10 seconds, it, the counter for this particular message went to 2000 some, right? So these are the internal defined functions that come with Unity. Now there's these internal functions, there's a big list of them. You don't need to know all of them uh, or you don't need to remember all of them, memorize all of them, but the certain key ones are awake. This is another function. Uh, start, update. There's another function called late update. So these are probably the four functions that you'll use the most often. Uh, awake is called even before start. So whenever your scene gets loaded, um, it again, it's very much like start. It gets called only once, but it gets called even before start. So if I have, I'll just show you. So if I make this change to say awake, right? And I go back to Unity, I just uh, stop the game. By, and then I, this, so right now what I've done is I've, when I uncheck this button, right? I've disabled this object. Uh, this lets me enable it, this lets me disable it. So right now my object is disabled. I hit play, you'll see the awake function get called once and that's it. No start, no update. Why? Because the object has been created but it is not active, it's disabled, okay? So awake gets called whenever the object gets created. An object is already created when the game starts. But whenever I, now when I click this button again, that's the time the object will get enabled and you'll see the start and update functions log message appear. So I click yes, and now you see start getting called once and update whose increment counter you keep seeing incremented because it's calling it every time. Now when I stop it, you'll see the update counter stop as well. So it stopped, right? Because now this game, this particular component, even though this game object is active, right? You see the tick mark next to the game object. That means the object is active, but individual components are disabled, right? That's why Unity is not calling functions on this component anymore. Our own defined scripts is not getting the start and update getting called because I've disabled it. I re-enable it, the update gets called again. Now you see the counter happening again, right? But notice that start and awake never have two next to it. They were only called once. So start will get called when the object is enabled. Awake will get called when the object is created. If the object is created and it is enabled by default, then you'll see awake and start getting called next to each other. But you can understand the difference when it will get called versus when it will not get called. Okay, cool. So late update is very similar to update. It gets called at a certain frequency, but it is primarily used for physics. So when you want to detect, like if you have, if you're playing like a, 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 a FPS, right? A shooter game or something like that, and you shoot a bullet, right? That bullet is a game object. It has some components on it that lets it detect when it hit something, say like an enemy or a wall or something like that, right? Uh, so that logic basically is inside late update. So anything that's related to physics is what's processed inside late update. Anything else that you need to happen every frame basically happens inside the update function, okay? Don't worry about the late update part. We'll anyways, once we start talking more details about the physics and the collision and those kind of stuff, we'll come back to it. But this is something I just wanted to introduce so that you know that these are the predefined functions that come with Unity. You, know, you can Google for it, you can look up Unity's documentation and you can find out what all other functions are currently used as well. Um, the list is huge, uh, probably like, 30, 40, 50 functions or something. So you don't need to worry about knowing all of them. Uh, most of the times if you're using some kind of a, uh, you know, uh, like IDE, uh, especially Visual Studio, you can actually start typing and it will show you, okay, in this case I have a big, uh, so there's something like a fixed update. 
function as well. So you can actually have that uh, fixed update. It's not showing up, so something's weird. With, but the idea is that you can always Google for it at that particular moment when you need something. But you should be familiar with what functions are. You don't need to remember all of them by heart. Uh, and as in you go with implementing these things, these things you'll naturally become, you know, uh, embedded in your memory that you don't need to remember what start is, what awake is. You you automatically know these things. It's just things that come with practice. Uh, let me look at the chat quickly. Uh, what? Sorry, Akash. Akash, I'm not sure what you mean. Akash, sorry, this is like your last warning. Uh, if I see any more sort of slang language, I'm going to kick you out. All right. Cool. Uh, Surya, your question is, what if my scene got refreshed? Um, refreshed as in, I'm not sure. Um, there is something called as reload. Uh, I'm thinking that's what you have in mind. Um, but the point is basically if you uh, reload your entire scene, it's as good as saying that I'm destroying my entire scene and creating it again. In that case, new objects are getting created and obviously the same logic will apply. Because you've created a new object, your awake will get called again. If the object is, if this component is enabled, uh, automatically, you know, your uh, uh, start will also get called and then your update or fixed update, late update, all of these functions will get called as well, okay? So, Whatever happens when an object gets created, that same sequence of things will happen again. Because when you are reloading a scene, internally what Unity does is it destroys all the objects of that scene, destroys the entire scene, and recreates everything again. Okay? Yeah. So everything will be called all over again. Cool. So, okay, let me see what's next on the list. So we just basically covered these things. So on destroy is another unity function that I didn't touch on. So something like uh, you will have on destroy, as you can see, this is also a unity specific function, which when I'm destroying a game object, unity will call this function. So in case, um, you know, I need to uh, clean up something. So if I have in my particular script, let's say if I have a, a, an array that I created, right, an integer array, for managing some say IDs, right? I have this array and I'm, I have this big list. So when this object is getting destroyed, I want to make sure that I'm deleting all these arrays so that you know there's no memory leaks or kind of thing happening. So on destroy gets called just before the object, just before Unity is about to destroy that object. Okay, so you can. If you've allocated some memory to data structures, etc., you can clean those data structures. You can make sure you mark them as null so that you know your memory is not getting wasted. Things like that. Okay. Cool. So these are some of the objects. Uh, we briefly talked about what enabling these uh, objects and disabling these objects are. Uh, one thing I didn't discuss uh, or rather show is so we talked about enabling and disabling individual components, but uh, what if I disable the entire game object? Now, in this case, my component is enabled, but my game object is disabled. So let's see what happens. Um, in this particular case, you'll see nothing happen, right? Like no awake, no start, nothing. Why? Because my entire game object itself is disabled at this point, right? So if I have something like this, even though the game object exists, but the object itself is disabled. So Unity is not communicating with this object at all. So awake didn't get called, start will naturally not get called. So now I enable this object. You'll see an awake call, right? Why? Because now Unity knows that this object exists in the game and on which there is this component that it created, right? Even though this component is disabled, the component which we created, my first script, even though this is disabled by itself, but still the awake got called 
because a week gets called, remember, when every time the object gets created. And then again, the regular flow happens. When I press this, naturally update and start gets start getting called. And if I destroy, I don't have the uh, log message in destroy, but if I actually, you know, deleted this object right now, you would have seen a destroy message show up as well. Um, if we had a log message in the destroy. So, so these are some of the internal functions. Every time you're creating a new mono behavior, these are the most common functions that um, you'll access. And this is where the real power of Unity shines because it's managing a lot of these things. Um, by default, it gives you access to a lot of this functionality that you don't need to worry about. It just works straight away. And, and that way, you can focus on writing your own game logic and not having to worry about calling certain functions at a certain frequency, etc. Nowadays, pretty much every every unit uh, you know engine does this, but this is how we do it inside you know uh, a Unity setup. Cool. So so far, if anybody has questions, just let me know. Um, I'll explain something real quick. Um, let me switch. Stop the screen share. All right, cool. So basically what happens is there is a very important concept of something called as a game loop. All right. So, so what is this game loop? So every time we have a game running in, it doesn't matter which engine we used to uh, be used for actually building our game, right? Even if you're using some other engine, the concept of a core game loop remains the same. Now, what this thing tells us that there is a certain thing of, you know, there's a certain sequence of things that will keep happening every time or every frame, essentially. And this was what basically kind of determines your frame rate. Okay. So when we say that our game is running at 30 frames per second, that means this sequence of events is happening 30 times each second. If I'm running at 60 frames per second, then it's happening 60 times, right? So this is essentially what a core game loop is. Now, now you'll be like, okay, so what are these events that, that are we talking about, right? So these events typically are things like checking for say collisions, right? So typically your collisions that get detected are detected in this loop. Uh, your UI that needs to be refreshed is happening here. If things are animating, they're happening in this particular loop. So the, all these things are happening every frame multiple times, depending on what your frame rate is, right? And this is where Unity also calls the update functions that we just saw, right? All the update has like three different variants, the regular update, the fixed update and the late update, right? So, but when I say update, I mean all the three, a category of update functions. So all of them happen at the exactly the same time, right? So every frame, Unity will process all of these events, or if there is any other game engine, it will process all of these events. And that's how your entire sort of uh, uh, game runs. So if my bullet is, you know, if I shot a bullet, it's here, next frame, it's here, next frame, it's here, next frame, it's here, and then it hits, right? It took this steps. How did it take these steps? Because Unity is processing that I fired a bullet with a certain speed. Based on that speed, if in my previous frame and in my current frame, I have, you know, moved, say, half a second, right? Then based on my speed and my previous position, in half a second, I'll be here. In next half, I'll be here. In next half, I'll be here, right? So that's how it calculates. So everything around it is called the core game loop, okay? So this is where it knows and processes all the things behind the scene. And one part of the core game loop is calling all the update and the fixed update functions. You'll see there are other functions such as like collision detection functions, etc. Those also get called as part of this particular game loop, but they only get called when a collision gets detected. Update and late update and fixed update gets called every frame, but certain other functions get called only when they are needed. When the 
physics system inside Unity says, oh, the bullet collided with, say, another player, right? Then it will call the collision functions on that particular thing. So behind the scenes, it's processing everything, every frame, but it's calling the right functions at the right time where it needs to, okay? Cool. So this is typically what happens, but this normally doesn't happen when you're building, say, a normal app. Right, a normal app doesn't work like this. It a normal app doesn't have like a physics collision detection logic, so it doesn't need to do a lot of these things. And that's why when we're building games, we need to be a little bit more uh, aware of that. Hey, we are not building uh, things that take too much CPU, right? Because then we'll see our our game starting to lag. Uh, so so that's why we have to be extra careful in how we are. Uh, building, uh, you know, things when it comes to games and not, you know, when, when we are talking about building, say, an Android app. There we can be a little bit more, uh, you know, generous when we are, say, allocating memory and doing things like that. But in games, you have to be very strict because any kind of slowness in, in, in our frame rate, etc., can lead to a very bad user experience, right? Cool. So hopefully that's clear. That's one of the core concepts that uh, people sort of uh, uh, miss. Uh, let me quickly look at the chat. Uh, so game like stick football is also an example of a game. So every game, it, it doesn't matter what game, behind the scenes, Unity or any other game engine is running this game loop no matter what. Uh, because when even if you don't have any physics or anything like that, still you need to redraw entire screen because if you're moving a character or moving a ball or moving anything around, right? It needs to redraw that screen to update and refresh it. So everything kind of is a game loop, no matter what. I'm good. Um, what is my screen? Everything else? Yeah, all right. So let me go back to my screen share. All right, so, so that's basically the core concept of a, a game loop. Now we'll look into something about how to, you know, we can do um, uh, basic things around, you know, reading input, et cetera, et cetera, and, and how we can detect input. That's the most common thing that we have to do in any game, right? Uh, even when we restart the game, uh, Aryan, I'm not sure exactly what you mean. Um, Right, so I mean, if you're talking in context of a game loop itself, yeah, game loop is running anytime your game is running. So even if you restart the entire game, it doesn't matter. If the game is running, then the game loop is running, okay? Hopefully that clarifies your question. If it was something else, just, yeah, just leave a note in the, in the chat and I'll come back to it. All right, cool. So we'll look at how to next detect some basic input um, be it key, oh, first we'll look at keyboard, then we'll look at mouse as well, all right? Um, does game loop even run when we close the game? No, so uh, game loop is basically, like I said, right? Like when your game is running, uh, that's when the loop is. When your app, whichever your app is, so if you build it as an Android app, right? Whenever that app is running and taking up screen, uh, that's when the game loop is running. If you minimize it and move to some other app or you know something like that, then basically you have stopped the entire app. And that's when the game loop will also stop because it's part of that entire uh, process itself. So it will stop naturally. But if you un you know if you maximize it and come back to it, then the game loop starts all over again. Right. Cool. Um, let's switch back. All right. So now, when we want to do something with, uh, you know, uh, let me remove some of this code that we don't need anymore. So now the most common thing that any script that we build is, uh, you know, something that reads first detects user input and then does something on top of it. Okay. So the most common scenario is that you want to detect certain input. So if you're building something for the desktop uh, or like Steam, app, you know, Steam game or something, you might be working with say a keyboard or a mouse 
But if you're building something with mobile, then you might be using uh, the touch screen as well, right? So there are different ways on how you can uh, read input uh, from a particular, you know, from a particular device, be it a keyboard, be it a, a mouse, be it a touchpad or anything like that. So the most standard way, so we'll start with uh, basically a keyboard as the simplest scenario. So what you want to do is you want to uh, do something inside the update function because I don't know when my player is gonna interact with my game, right? So I want to make sure that every frame I'm detecting if somebody has pressed a button, say, okay. So in this case, let's imagine that I want to detect uh, pressing say T or you know, any, any key for that matter, but for example, I'm gonna go with T. So Unity comes with a standard way of detecting input. So there is a class called input. So you can see the first class that shows up is input, input dot get. So here you can see that there are these uh, different functions within the input class itself. Some of them here you can see is mouse button related. Some of them are touch related and others are like key related. So key related corresponds to, key related functions correspond to anything on the keyboard, mouse obviously mouse, but there are different variants within each, right? So if you say get key, you can see there are three different versions of it. Get key, get key up, get key down, right? So what these individually mean is there are three specific stages when a user presses a button, right? So if I have a button, the moment I press it, it basically is a down function. Basically the get key down function will get called in the very first frame that I press a button. As long as I'm keeping it pressed, if I keep it pressed for five seconds, for all the five seconds, Unity will call the get key function, okay? And the frame in which I lift my finger and release the button, in that frame it will call the get key up function, right? So that's the core philosophy between down and then the regular function and then the up function, okay? So this lets you control when you want to do certain things. So the standard is either use up or down, right? Because up gets called once, down gets called once, but the regular get key function will get called multiple times. So if you want to detect it only once, so if I have imagined like a fire button, right? I want to fire, a, say a gun or a bullet when I press the button, but I don't want to keep firing. It's not a rapid fire kind of a thing then I don't want to keep firing every frame the button is pressed. When I press a button, I might hold on for one second. That one second might mean 60 times, right? So I only want to fire one bullet when the user presses it once and then releases it and then presses it again, right? So I'm gonna either fire when I put, in this case, fire normally means when you, you'll do down, but in other games, you might want to do when I do up. So it's, it's based on game design, what function you want to use, but more or less you want to use either up or down in most scenarios, but there might be very few cases where you want to do detect it every frame. Um, so something like, you know, if you want to charge a super ability and you want to keep the button pressed for two seconds to charge up that ability, then you will see the get key function and keep counting that has two seconds passed since the user has pressed this button. If he removes it, before the two seconds are over, then you reset the charge ability or something like that, right? So those are typically the kind of cases where you want to use these different functions. And when you look at the mouse ones, you will find same three kind of pattern of functions, the regular function, the up function, the down function for detecting mouse buttons, right? So we're gonna use the down one, just an example. So input.getKey down. Now this function, when I, you know, uh, uh, see by default takes a key code. A key code is nothing but a unity defined enum. Uh, and we're gonna directly use this. Key code, when I say dot, here you can see a full list of all the different sort of uh, uh, keys that are available on a standard, uh, you know, uh, keyboard. So uh, I need to detect F. So when I press F, uh, something like a fire, I'm gonna do something with it, okay? So now I want to see, uh, 
I want to detect this particular uh, uh, when this when when the user presses the F button, and I want to do something on it. So I'm going to put it inside an if statement. If input dot get key down key code is F. That means I pressed the F button in the very first frame. I'm going to put a simple debug log to see what happens, right? So I'm going to say update input F pressed, and that's it. Okay, and I'm gonna quickly just copy this so you guys can see if get key up and F, and then I'm gonna say input F released. Okay, so I'm gonna say pressed when I'm pressing it in the frame I'm pressing it. I'm gonna say release when in the frame I'm releasing it, and I'm gonna similarly do the last one which is get key and we'll see how each of them kind of work. I'm just gonna call this update input app, all right? So, so we have these three different things. Now we know Unity will call the update function every frame, right? So we'll see quickly this in action. All right, so I come back to Unity, uh, let it recompile my entire code, everything works fine, no errors. So. So now my game is running. So make sure you click on the game window uh, because your game window, if it's not in focus, it will pause the game. If I click somewhere outside, my game is essentially paused and it will not detect. So I click inside my game window and then I press F. Oh, what's happening? Did not detect. One second, let's debug what's happening. So I have input.key, key code is F. Input dot get key. Hmm, everything looks good. Then, oh, because my game object is disabled. That's why. All right. So now, if I press F, you see, I just pressed F and released it. So I got one F pressed down event, one released event. But even for that fraction, I got six frames that detected the get key, right? So, so you see every frame, it's calling that function the moment I have the button pressed, right? So I'm gonna do it again, and this time I'm gonna keep holding it. So you'll see the initial function come in, then the update function come in, so now I'm, I have the button pressed, and now I'm gonna release it, and you see the release message come in, okay? So it keeps calling that update function, but now, because I don't have the F button pressed, it's not going inside that statement, right? So exactly the same thing you can do by changing the input, um, you know, changing the different function on the input class. In this case, we can call get mouse. And you, here you see, you have the same three pattern of functions. Get mouse up, get mouse down, and get mouse. Uh, so we, let's try one. In this case, if you, so the standard convention is that the left uh, click is zero, right click is one. That's exactly that. So if I do this, and if I replace my if condition with this, right? So this will basically detect my left click on the mouse. And doing one, passing one is um, basically my right click. So that's literally like this is the only thing that you need to change if you want to switch from a keyboard to a mouse. And if you want to support both, let's say, in that case, what you can do is you can do an or condition and actually have both of them together, right? Now, in this case, I want to say, I want to run some logic either when I press F or I click left on the mouse. In this case, this if condition will evaluate to true in both the ways, right? So you can do things like that, that you can support both keyboard and mouse at the same time as well, right? Hopefully this is making sense. Uh, if anybody has any questions, just please drop them in the chat as well, right? Cool. So now we've looked at simply detecting how to, uh, you know, how to detect certain uh, key presses either on the keyboard or on the mouse. And now we'll move on to something. Uh, okay. So in this case, I was using spacebar, but we showed you with basically the different key. Right. Same with the get mouse button. So now we'll look a little bit more into the Unity how how we can create. A simple UI right so so far we created a custom component 
Now we'll look at some of the Unity's inbuilt components specifically around the UI. So for this particular scenario, I'm just going to delete my uh, game object. I don't need it anymore for now. I'm going to even delete this camera. I don't even need the camera. So now as you see, my entire scene is empty. I'm going to right click under UI. I'm going to create something called as a canvas. Now, if you see this, when I click canvas, it created two different game objects for me. So we'll briefly cover what these are. So canvas is basically the parent object of anything UI related in, in Unity. Okay. So anytime I'm working with UI, the highest level object for that particular UI will be the canvas object. Okay. So if in case I didn't have this canvas object, and I wanted, hey, UI, create me a text. I want to display like high score or something. When I click this, it will create a text, but it will say, oh, it doesn't detect the canvas in the game, in the particular scene. It will create a canvas and then create a text under it. So you see, it created a canvas because the canvas was not existing. And then it added a text as a child of that particular thing. So here you can see there is this uh, new text that you see it's slightly faint, but hopefully you guys can see it. Uh, so it created this text object. I can change the specs to be anything here in my uh, inspector view, right? So let's just delete this for now. But the point is that anytime you have a UI in your game, the parent object of all the UI would always be this canvas object. And this event system is something that comes uh, with Unity's canvas system to allow you to detect all the button clicks and, and whenever you touch anything on the UI, this event system is uh, for that. So anytime you're detecting any kind of a click kind of a thing, uh, whenever you're interacting with the UI, this event system detects those clicks and passes on to the right button slash right part of the screen that you're trying to click. Okay, So this is something that it creates by default. Uh, don't worry about all the all the complex parts that seems like these different components that it has created by default on it. Um, once you start becoming more comfortable, over time you'll you'll get used to you know what these are. So for now, if I'm going to minimize all of these, so again you see on the canvas there are these bunch of different components, right? Now here you should see something interesting. This is not like we talked that hey every um, game object comes with a transform right that's what we said but if you look at this this has something different it has a rect transform so since you're working with ui ui is all 2d it doesn't matter right whether you're making a 3d game 4d game ar game vr game your ui is always your user interface is always 2d so unity has something called as a rect transform which rect just means a rectangle right so a rect transform is for anything that's UI related. So it doesn't have uh, the, the depth of the Z axis. It only has the X and the Y, right? I only need a 2D version of something and I don't need its depth. So Unity created a special component from the transform component called the rect transform, which does the things exactly like a transform where it stores its position so you can see position x position y but it has a position z but it's always zero because like i said right it doesn't have a depth it only has an x and a y and has everything else exactly the same it has a rotation component it has a scale but it has certain extra things we'll just touch on this what this pivot and anchor and extra things are but this just lets us sort of quickly position our objects with respect to how my screen will look like. Okay, so so this is the parent object called the canvas. Now, when I look at the canvas component, it comes with these different things. Most of the time you'll use canvas overlay. So for now, let's use canvas overlay. What this means is whatever is my game, my UI will come always on top of everything. So if I have an object moving around and I have a button, then my button will always be on top. It's not like my button is behind and my uh, player is front of me. So my player obstructs the button, right? 
So if whatever game you have, if you think about like the settings button at the corner or, or any of these buttons, your buttons are always on top, right? So that's why uh, we'll just use the overlay uh, functionality for now, which just means that whatever my game is, my canvas is always on top of everything else. Um, don't go into the rest of the details. We'll, these are things that we'll cover in future classes. So uh, this is the only setting that you need to know. Most of the time, whenever you create a canvas, if you haven't changed anything, this is the default that comes uh, with, because this is the most common one that everybody uses. Um, there are other places where you'll use these two, and we'll talk about them uh, later as well. Cool, so, so now I've created this canvas. Now if I quick, so these top buttons that you see, right, these kind of uh, give you uh, custom sort of uh, buttons to play around. So this one is like a rotate tool that lets me sort of rotate things fast and quick. Um, this one is like a, a scaling tool. If I want to increase the size of something, I can scale this by clicking and dragging. You can do the same thing by changing the numbers here, but this is just a visual way of doing it. So. This is like a position tool. I can move the things around. Here you don't see anything moving because we're doing the canvas. Canvas is always fixed. It never moves. So that's why even these values are grayed out. You can't move them manually, but you can move all the objects under it. Okay. So these are like the different tools that Unity gives. And the hand tool is like the default when you want to move your entire scene things around. So this is the one that we default use. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a simple first an image. So I'm going to go to UI. I'm going to say image. So you see this sort of white box kind of appear right in the center of the screen. Now let's look at what this is. So my image by default comes with a few things. There's a rec transform exactly how we just talked about. It's kind of a transform, but for the 2D world. So it's it has a rec transform instead of the regular transform. Here now you can actually uh, change this. So if I want this image to be 200 by 200, now you see it's bigger because I just put in these new width and height. Um, scale is the same thing. I can say the scale is twice. So now I put in two for X. Now it's basically stretched the entire image to twice the size. So you can see there is a separate component uh, called image. And, and you can see the script tag next to it, right? Which means Unity has written a script by the name image. Very much like how we created our script, this is also a script, right? Just that Unity has created it for us. So we don't need to create these basic things. So I'm gonna click on this button called source image. Right now it's showing just a blank white color. I can change the color uh, by clicking on the color thing, it will just pop up this tool that lets me change these color values, uh, very similar to how you can even do things in like Photoshop and such. So I pick this random ugly looking color. Um, so right now there is no image that is showing. So it's just filling the entire area for this particular uh, image with the color that I selected. Because if you see source image, it says none. There is no image associated with this particular uh, there's no actual image to be displayed. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on this button next to source image and Unity will show me this sort of uh, some predefined images, the default one that comes with it. So I'm going to select a knob. Now you see this kind of green image show up. I'm going to just reset the color to be white again so you can see clearly. Now in this case, remember, I had scaled the X value to two. So you see this sort of knob image getting stretched. So I'm going to do it one and now it actually has, it looks blurry that's because it's huge. Uh, it's not supposed to be that huge, but the idea is that now the aspect ratio of this image is correct. If I increased it, you'll see it getting stretched, but I want to keep it one for now. So now this image looks consistent. The same thing I can do if I reduce this, it will still look stretched because I'm not keeping the aspect ratio consistent of this particular image. So now this is like 100 by 100, much smaller, and you know I, I can just uh, use it out of the gate. I don't need to import any other extra art assets or anything like that. But of course, I can drag and drop some extra images and replace this particular thing with it. So imagine if I had an image downloaded, I would have dropped into this folder 
what you can do is you can drag it from here and just drop it here and it will replace or if you are not able to do that then you can obviously click here and it will show all the assets uh, that can be applied to this particular image okay so so now this is like a basic image now what we will do is we can quickly select this option and now i can move this image around so what you see as the boundary this white box of the canvas right so if i select the canvas so you see these four corners right this is essentially my entire screen okay when i when i if i build this for android and actually run it on an android game this is what exactly i'll see so if i have my image at 0 comma 0 on x and y that means i'll see this image at exactly the center of the screen okay but i want to show this image at the top corner so i'm going to position it something like this right so if i come in the game world uh, sorry game view you'll see now it's at the top corner so i'm going to quickly get this game view here so when i make some change you can actually see it in action at the same time so now you'll see what happened is that since i changed the size of the screen thy my object has gone off so this this is the kind of issue that you usually come when you're working with like different screens and whatnot so what i want is my button to always be in the corner irrespective of what my size is right so right now if you see i'm reducing the size of the screen and my uh, image is going outside the screen right so what i want unity to do is instead of having this position as fixed because right now if you see in the inspector here right these numbers will never change because i manually position them at some location like this right if i keep reducing the you if you see in the inspector view the position for x and y is never changing right that's why on a smaller screen this will not be visible if my screen was this small for some android device this would not be visible in the game but we obviously don't want that so that's where these anchors and pivots come in and these are only for 2d ui these are not for 3d objects 3d objects works like it differently okay so what we will do is we'll select this image when you click on this kind of this icon right you see uh, this bunch of stuff show up so what this is saying is i want to position my object with respect to my parent object in a certain way so it always maintains that so if i have uh, so there's something called as a pivot and an anchor pivot is usually the center point of my image so in this case if you see if i have my image selected and i switch here uh, switch to this box one right so you see the center dot that's where my pivot is and these four are my corners right so you can probably see this now so the center dot is my pivot and here you can see 0.5 and 0.5 so zero, irrespective of what this size is pivots are always calculated along the x axis and along the y axis the one corner is 0 0 the other one is 1 1 and same with 0 0 and 1 1 so when i say 0.5 on x and 0.5 on y it means the center of the image irrespective of what the size is okay so if i want to say pivot 0 and pivot 0 now my pivot is at 0 0 but it's not at the center of the screen anymore okay so most like most of the time you don't need to change these values by hand what you need to do is you want to click on this particular thing and it gives you this predefined configuration right so you can see this one says pivoted to the top left corner pivoted to the top right corner and things like that right pivoted to the center of the right much like how you would sort of align say a text in a word document right so these are kind of predefined uh, conditions that come with it okay so what you can do is most commonly on mac it's basically shift and alt i think on windows it's control and and shift uh, but unity will show it to you here so what you want to do is you want to select so i have the two options pressed right um, right now i have basically control command and shift all of these three options pressed and i'm going to click something like this so so you see this kind of new thing show up 
because what it's doing is it's pivoting this particular image to the top left. Uh, don't worry if a lot of this stuff doesn't make sense immediately. You can go and revise this particular section and actually start playing with Unity itself and you'll get a hang of it better. It's slightly uh, something that you need to get a more, com more comfortable sort of, uh, you know, uh, getting a hang of things. And here also you can see it is showing the top left now. So now if you see, even though I'm reducing the size of the image, it's always with respect to that top left, it never goes off screen, right? So what I've done is I've said Unity, always anchor this object with respect to the top left corner of the screen, no matter the size, right? So now I can keep changing its size, the image is still always visible. There are other problems because now the small image is taking up half of the size, but the core concept is that when we are working with these, you know, different aspect ratios and different resolutions, uh, this is typically how we work. So you want to make sure that you're setting up the right anchors and the right, uh, you know, uh, right pivots. And most of the time you don't need to manually change these values because now you see these values have gone different now. Now everything is different because this is zero, one, zero, one kind of thing. I can do the same thing and I can anchor it to the bottom right corner of the screen, right? So I don't need to, uh, in this case, if I zoom out, now you'll see the actual uh, sort of thing is now reflected here in the bottom right corner. So now it will be anchored with respect to the bottom right. But in this case, it will go out because it's too far away from the bottom right, right? So if I want to do that, I want to make my object move closer to my bottom right corner on which it is anchored and now it will always be visible, okay? Hopefully it's making a little bit of sense. Um, again, you'll get more comfortable uh, once you sort of play around with these because this feel like there are too many options, right? So, so don't worry about that. Uh, you can play around with it and, and kind of get a more better hang for it, right? Cool, so this is something very sort of straightforward that you want to do. Uh, I just changed the settings. So now it is basically stretched vertically. Most of the time we don't want to do that. We always want to keep it like this. But certain cases uh, we want to make sure that if it's filling the entire right bar, like if you want to show it as a strip, right? Then you might use that option. So, so yeah. Cool. Um, any questions so far? Uh, just drop them in the chat. Now let me look at what. Okay, so we looked at the basics of this. Uh, so we looked at images. Um, other things which are very similar to images are um, text and button. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly go and say UI text. It's going to give me a text, say hello world. And I'm going to change the color just so that it, it stands out on the back background. So, so now let me just disable this setting. Yeah. So now you see basically this hello world. So there is this, since we don't have a camera, Unity says, oh, maybe you're doing something wrong. You don't have a camera. You can just uh, go to the game view. One, if no camera rendering, you can disable this thing. So it, it doesn't you know, block your view. We can see it clearly. So now we have this text. Again, it's nothing but a simple text component. So if you look at the image and let me minimize this. And so if you compare the two, right, they're nothing but two simple game objects. Each has a rect, rect transform and each has a canvas renderer, which just means that it's under some canvas. Um, so it's something that's internally Unity needs. And then after that, you see the image game object has an image component. The text game object has a text component. It's as simple as that. What you can even do is you can, so now we'll create a, say a button, right? So I'm gonna go to UI and create a button. Now this button is a complex game object. So it, it is itself a game object and it has a game object under it as well, right? Because buttons usually come with some information like what this button is uh, or what does it do? So say something like play, right? Or start the game or something, whatever, right? So play. Now, this is an example of a complex game object. So I'm gonna just move it up slightly. 
uh, just so I can show, show clearly. So if you look at this button, it comes with both an image and an individual component called button. So if I disable this image, you'll see the entire thing go away, right? But you can still see the play text. Uh, let me change the color so you can see it. So you can still see the play text because it's a separate game object under it. Okay. So I'm going to enable it. That's where the actual button is. Oh, so this is too light, apparently. Yeah. Cool. So now hopefully things are starting to make sense, right? These are all individual components that can be individually controlled. If I disable this image, you don't see that white box that button comes with, but the button will still work because it's there. The button itself is there. It's just that we've disabled the image for it. And I can go in and disable the text and naturally you will not see the, the play thing written there because obviously the game object for it is disabled. All right. So, so that's the core idea behind a couple of these more most basic sort of uh, uh, components that you'll most likely create in every game no matter what. All right. So, so that's that. Now, remember we talked about um, scenes in the very beginning, right? So we've created this as a sample scene. So whatever we have created right now here is nothing but a simple scene, right? So I can actually uh, rename this scene. So I just, you can right click and say rename or just click on it again and it will give you this. So I'm going to call it first scene. Okay, I'm going to create a new scene. So we created create new scene and I'm going to create second scene. Uh, so what I'll show you now is, so this is right now in first scene. If I switch to second scene, again, you see this is exactly how we started the project, right? An empty scene which just has one main camera and nothing else. We'll go ahead and even delete this one. We don't need it. And we're going to just create a UI text. And this text will tell us that this is the second scene. Okay, so we'll just write second scene here and change the color so we can actually read it. Okay, so now we have this first scene and then we have this second scene. So there are two separate scenes, right? Now we'll look at the most basic interaction of how to, now we want something to happen when this button gets clicked. And now we'll see a little bit of code, back to code again of how we can make this work okay so i come back to my original script i'm just going to get rid of this uh, other things that i don't need one second let's so right now we don't need any of this we'll just create a simple sort of thing which will let us create this button so i'm going to create a public button button so now import unity ui so now i have this button class imported okay so inside my start function what i'm going to do is button now i want something to happen when this button is pressed okay so let's first create a simple function private void on button click okay so what do i want to happen i want something in this particular function to get called when this button gets pressed all right so what i'll do is i'll say button dot on click so unity gives us this default event and i'm gonna say add listener and on button click so this is a standard format that we use so what this is saying is for this particular button, whenever the click happens, I want this specific function to get called. Add listener as in listen to this on click and call this function whenever this button is pressed. Okay. So here I'm just going to do the most simple thing and we're going to say debug.log uh, button clicked. So now we, we don't need to check for this button click inside every update why because unity has a standard way of detecting all these clicks on every 
uh, specific button because when you're doing that you're wasting a lot of resources remember you're running those if conditions of if input dot get button get key etc right you're running them every frame but the user is only interacting for a short amount of time so you're running that code unnecessary and that's wasting a battery right so for the standard ui unity every time there is a um, you know an interaction that's happening there is most likely an event for it so in this case this on click is a button click event. And whenever this event is triggered, we want Unity to call this particular function. And that's how we have told Unity to do that. Okay. So I'll switch back quickly to code. Uh, sorry, switch back quickly to this. Now I'm going to create my um, empty game object, attach my script on it. Now, here, if you see, I created a public button, correct? So I said this is a public variable. Now, if you see here, Unity has shown us that there is, there is a public button and we want a button object next to it. So I'm gonna take this button. I'm gonna keep this object selected. I'm gonna click and drag this button into here. So now I know that my first script is listen to this button, okay? So every time this, this button gets pressed, the respective function in my first script will get called okay so let me disable this text and image so it's clear now i'm gonna hit play and when basically we press this play button you see this log message show up click on this button you'll see multiple times this counter go up right and when we double click in this console it comes back to the uh, code and shows us where we had actually clicked it, right? So, so this is the most simplest way how we'll detect uh, events inside uh, UI. Okay. So now the most basic use case that we want to do today is, and this is the uh, the last piece is. Remember, we created these two scenes, right? So what we want to do is we want to start the game in first scene, whenever we click the button, we want to transition into the second scene, okay? So for that to happen, we'll go to something as build settings, so inside file, build settings, and here you see there is something called as scenes in the build. So this is something that uh, you just select and add here, and that's it. You don't need to do anything more than that. Uh, this all this does is that it lets unity know that these are the scenes that we want to work with these are the active scenes that we are using so we want to use these scenes so before you can change scenes on the fly uh, dynamically through code you need to make sure that all the scenes that you want to do are actually available here right so what we will do is we'll again come back here and we'll say public string second or rather say new scene, okay? So whenever, whenever we want to uh, detect this click, we want this game to load this new scene, okay? So what we will do is we'll use Unity's inbuilt functionality for uh, scene. So there's something called a scene management. Okay, so let me import the namespace. Using, using scene management. Now there is, uh, one second, what is the exact? Uh, let me import it here so it's easier and it shows in the complete. Using unity engine dot scene management. Okay, so now what we want to do is, now we want to use the scene manager and we want to load a new scene whenever this button gets clicked, okay? So I say scene manager, now you see this load scene function, okay? So this is what we're gonna use, we're gonna say load scene, and in this case, we're gonna pass it this new scene as a string. So we have defined this new string, and we're gonna pass this here, and this will let us, uh, whatever we define here in the inspector, will get passed here and the scene manager will load that scene for us. Okay, so if I come back, I look at this 
button, uh, sorry, I look at this game object, which has my script attached. Now you see a new variable called new C. Now what I want to do is I want to specify the exact string. So in this case, it is second scene. All right. So second scene is the name of the scene. And this is what I've specified here. So if I hit play and I hit, when I press this uh, button, what it will basically load a scene which has the name matching to second scene. So in case I made a typo here, it will show me an error. If I type this string correctly, then it will jump to that particular scene. So if I click play, it loaded the second scene, right? So here you can see that there is a second scene which has this text called second scene and that's what you see on the screen. Okay. So that's the second scene. So if I stop again, Unity defaults back to how my project started, which is basically the first scene. So that's how sort of scene transitions work in Unity. If your entire game would be broken down into different scenes. So imagine like if you have hundred levels in your game, right? Each level will be most likely a new scene. And when the user click, I want to play level 14, you'll say load scene for 14. And that way the scene 14 will get loaded and the user will start seeing whatever is inside scene 14. Okay. Probably some level for it, et cetera, et cetera. So this, these are the most common fundamental things when it comes to working with unity. Right? So I could have directly hard coded it here as well. So I could have done something like, uh, scene manager and passed it the second scene itself as a string here. But the only thing is then I cannot use the same script somewhere else uh, because I've defined it as a variable. Now it lets me reuse the script in multiple places and I can change it in the inspector. Okay, cool. So hopefully that's clear. Um, any questions so far? Um, that's pretty much the uh, if you have any questions, just leave them in the chat uh, quickly and we'll address them. Uh, but that's pretty much all we wanted to cover today. So we covered the basics of what each of individual these components are, how we structure them, uh, a simple look at some of the basics of Unity's UI system uh, and how to create some simple things in different simple scenes. Now your assignment for this particular week is all listed here. So we've covered all the uh, UI, canvas, anchors, button clicks, scenes, and loading a new scene, right? So now your assignment for this particular week is, so you'll create a new project and push it on Git as a first, you know, your first project. And then after that, you'll create four scenes. One would be your master scene, and three scenes would be um, basically just highlighting like how I had second scene. You'll create three scenes, let's say scene one, scene two, scene three, and the master scene says, master now you'll create three buttons each of these buttons will take you to the next scene okay so very similar to how we did but you'll have three of them okay so you'll have to create multiple game objects with multiple buttons and link them to multiple things so when i click on button one it should load scene one and i should see the text if when i click button two it should load scene two and something similar for scene three right the added is thing is that what we want to do is that once I'm in scene one, two or three, this is sort of a bonus challenge for you to figure out uh, that what you want to do is you want to navigate. There should be a back button in all of these scenes. One, two, three. When I click that back button, it should go back to the master scene. Okay. So this is something that you will have to do a little bit of Google and figure out. Uh, join our discord basically, and if you have any questions, we have a lot of game developers there active um, that you can ask as well. So, but this is the core assignment for, for this particular week. So if you're having issues or anything like that, just feel free to, you know, ping on Discord or reach out to us, all right? Cool, so, so that's core essentially what we are doing. So this is like the first technical session on, on game development, um, especially with Unity and uh, Going forward, we'll keep going deeper and deeper into each of the topics. So next, we'll start working on a proper 2D project. So we'll provide you with certain setup for a 2D project and start uh, building a game up. So we have an advanced level class as well, which I think most of you might already be familiar with. And that's the class where we'll actually 
start building a lot of these projects uh, up using the same fundamentals that we just used. Um, okay, so things will start getting more complex pretty soon. So cool. It's about uh, what uh, Unity is and what it does. Um, we're actually starting a little bit about actually building a project. So in the next uh, uh, four to five classes, we'll be working with one project and we'll be actually incrementally adding more and more features to it. So at the end of uh, five to six classes, you'll actually have a, a, a simple 2D uh, playing game. So we'll be starting with a 2D game. Okay. Um, before we do that, um, I just wanted to recap that uh, from the whenever you're working on each week, right? Make sure you're updating the sheet here. So I'll create a, a duplicate sheet and create it for uh, the current week, so week two as well. So uh, whenever you do the cloning your week, uh, uh, Trello board, make sure you're actually adding the link uh, here as well. All right, cool. Uh, again, this was all covered in the in the previous section, and this is only the sheet that's shared with you. If you didn't get uh, the link to the sheet, just let me know. I'll check the permissions and I'll grant you access. Just ping that on, on Discord as well after the class, all right? Um, so make sure that you are updating your uh, links here and, the, and today we'll be start setting up a new project on GitHub. So uh, you'll be providing the link to the GitHub repo that you created, okay, here. And same way you provide a link to the uh, this as well, all right? Okay, cool. Uh, let me remove this chat window out of the way. <laughs> All right. So today, uh, what we will do is we'll start working on a new 2D game. Okay. The basic repo is uh, the link uh, to the repo is provided here. Sorry. Uh, the link to the actual Git repo on the upscale uh, account is provided here. So you can just click on this. This will open up. And this is like a empty template project all right so um, unity has a lot of like tutorials and such so it gives these sort of uh, projects that are pre-set up for you to play around with okay but they have a lot of like scripts and a lot of other complexities as well because for that you it's like the end thing after you have to make a full game uh, you finish the tutorial this is what you get right so what we have done is we have taken that thing removed all the code and all the pieces there and just build a, a thing that has all the art assets in it. So since our goal here is to learn coding and learn Unity, our, our goal is not to learn artwork, right? So in order to build a simple game, what we have done is we have given you an empty template that you can use for all the artwork, all right? So, so this has a simple, um, you know, a skeleton of all the art assets that we'll need for this 2D game that we're going to build. So if you, you know, Google for Unity 2D game kit, this is the, uh, this is the template that we're using. So this kind of a character that you see here, right? This is the one that we'll be using and we are only using the artwork. We'll create our game our way, the way we will learn doing it, right? Not what Unity does. So Unity is, if you look at this particular thing, right? Like um, this hour and a half uh, long kit video, it takes you about just dragging and dropping things. It doesn't teach you anything about programming. So that's why we have removed everything. And we're only gonna use the, uh, the images of this character and the platform and the environment pieces and all those images we'll use to create um, the actual game that we want, all right? Along with all the code that we have to write for it. So the first thing you will do is, you will go here and you will click on fork. So when you say fork, um, you will basically, most likely you won't see this pop up because you're not part, you're not gonna be part of any other teams on GitHub. If you are, just select your personal account. So my, my grower is my personal account, I'll click this. And what it will do is, it will take this repository and create a duplicate repository in your code okay uh, so in your github account um, and once you have done that it will look exactly like this just that instead of saying outscale 2d game development it will say your name or your github id and and 2d game development okay and from there you'll basically clone it so the rest of the process remains the same um, uh, for you to clone a github uh, repository into your desktop 
um, again look back on the first video in case there is any confusion about that um, and always ask in this code if you're running into any issues right so you'll close this repository and you'll basically set up a new project in your in your laptop desktop whatever you're using okay so once you have done that um, you will have something like uh, let me show you so my desktop I have git I have within git I have uh, where is it yeah game dev intro so this is how uh, when I cloned the entire repository it gave me all the folders along with it okay so once you have this you can go ahead start unity and basically yep oh sorry this guy popped up uh, so here what we have is basically we have set up a player and by dragging this player into our actual project hierarchy we have actually created this player uh, prefab okay so this player prefab is nothing but actually a, a, a copy of the player right like i was saying so a copy of a player that's saved as a file uh, and then i can create duplicate instances of it by simply dragging it into the actual scene and if i actually switch to scene view you'll see like these are all like uh, different uh, instances or different versions of the same player i can move them around anywhere right and if i go to game view you see all these different players so i'm just going to quickly delete it um, right. so that's predominantly our uh, our actual player character so i'm going to set it to okay i'm going to set it to minus two so it's in the center of the screen okay so we have this particular player that we have set up and and we have like getting we're starting to show it on the screen but it doesn't do anything yet right so we just have a player game object and we have a sprite renderer on it now what we want to do next is basically we want to uh, start doing something with it make bring it to life basically right so what we will do is let's look at our trello for a minute um set up a player character uh, so build a simple let's do this at the end actually it's the platform part okay uh, we'll first look at doing some simple animations with this particular character so let's do this part first and we'll come back to this particular thing so what we'll do is we'll look into how we can set up a very simple animation to get this player looking like a live player all right so what we will do is we'll um, Right component, which is not here. We'll say Windows. Um, there is an animation, and we'll say animation. Right. So you'll see this new window pop up when you go to Window Animation Animation. I'm gonna just move this window down here and here. Right. Cool. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a very simple animation for our player and actually bring it to life much like how you see in games right so now with my player objects so this is important you have to make sure that you have selected the right game object for which you want to create animations so in case i accidentally selected main camera and said create here uh, to create the animation you say it say it actually gives us a message right to begin animating main and camera Press this create button, but you want to create animations for the player for now. So we'll make sure that we select player because if you don't have it selected or if you have nobody selected, then it won't uh, work properly. So what we're going to do is we're going to select this. We're going to open this particular. Uh, we're going to when we you see this right small like arrow thing here. So all it is doing is that when you click on it, you're now in the prefab mode like you can start editing this prefab since player is a prefab for us we want it change things to be saved in the prefab so we go into this prefab mode and now we have this uh, base object the same object as it is it's just that unity is understands that now we want to edit this prefab okay so what we'll do is we'll click create now right now we see that we have 2d game kit and scenes as the two uh, two folders and obviously today we created a new folder for Prefab. So we're going to create a new folder and we're going to call it animations. Okay. So animations and inside animations folder, we're going to create a new folder called player because right now we want to create animations for the player. So we're going to save it. 
okay so now if you i look in my project you'll see this animations folder inside this player folder and if you open this player folder it already has created this new animation for us right um new animation actually i should have named it in the window that popped up uh, so my bad uh, but this is the default name so i will just quickly rename it uh where's the rename option rename yeah so we'll rename it to player since it's a player animation and we'll call it idle i'll tell you in a minute what idle actually means okay so here if you see the animation window now it is slightly looks very different from when you know we we started or we opened the animation window it looks like different and here if you see we re renamed it so to player underscore idle so now unity uh, shows us that this is player underscore idle animation that we are currently working with okay since we have the player object selected this particular uh, animation that we are going to set up is going to be for the player and on the player game object since we said create new animation you earlier remember we had to transform in a sprite renderer now unity has actually created an animator as well for us okay so uh, there is just a new component called animator that is attached to it as well right cool so what we're going to do now is we're going to add the actual animation so for that we're going to 2d art again the same location animations uh animation clips so clips are nothing but the actual images oh, okay sorry not the clips one second uh sprites wrong folder sorry okay so inside the sprites folder inside the idle now what we'll do is we'll make sure first a our player is selected and then we'll select all of these uh i'm just holding down shift and click so it selected all of these and these are nothing so if i showed you quickly so so this is the image one this is image two this is image three and, and you'll be like oh okay these do look like much but remember like those flip books so if i click flipping to them quickly you'll see the actual image move right in the preview so this is what is called as sprite animations we'll show these images these uh what some 15 odd images yeah 15 odd images um uh, back to back really fast and it will give us that impression of that something is animated right so what we'll do is we'll click the first one shift and click the last one so everything gets selected and we're going to just drag it into here now you see this plus arrow show up means that i can add things here so now unity has added all of these one after the other in a sequence okay so here it's nothing but uh, you see the player object is selected and the sprite the actual image on it is going to change when we play this animation right so right now we can test it quickly by hitting this play button and you see the character actually animate right but you see it's like super fast it looks very very weird right why is that is because unity has added this image every point zero one of a second right so since there are 15 images all the images are starting at zero zero and the last one is ending at uh 0 0.15 so uh 150 milliseconds so every 10 milliseconds unity is actually changing them it and it looks it looks really weird so we're just gonna select all and we're basically over at the end of it and simply drag it out so what we are saying is this is too fast we're going to slow it down so let's say i'm going to move it to half half the, so so this is basically the time you see here is in uh, seconds so now i have said reality let's expand this out over the course of five point half a second so now if you play that okay looks more better but some looks like really slow so let's just adjust it a little bit so this is something that you have to kind of uh, experiment to what you think is like looking right right it's more about which one feels right okay it looks a little slow so maybe 0.3 of a second let's see and sometimes these numbers would even come from your artist right like the artist that has created these images will tell you that hey play this at so much frames per second right so you'll know how much time to set uh, one by frames per second you calculate that and that will give you the number right and accordingly you register okay so that that looks about correct right 
it doesn't it doesn't look too fast it doesn't look too slow and now we have this simple character that is just animating and the important thing to note here is like if you see this sprite render you see these numbers change these numbers are all the images that we had specified here right these are all the images all unity is doing is that after that fixed time interval it keeps changing the image and it just gives us that flip book kind of an impression and this is how typically all your games do to the animations there are other ways to do it through programs and through code as well but this is like the simplest way to get the animation we haven't written any code yet but we'll we'll start writing more code now okay cool so hopefully this is so far clear right if they have any questions just you know drop them in the in the chat so now we have created a simple idle animation this animation will be played by default any time we are in the game and nothing is happening that's why it's called idle animation so if i minimize this folder you see there are sprites related to all of these different animations there's walk there is run with some gun there's a normal run there's a pushing against the wall um, there's a hurt animation there's a death animation so all these are is there are different images that give you the effect of getting hurt right so in this case you see the character jumping uh, in the air when it gets hit or dies and then falls to the uh, ground right so these are nothing but sequence of images and this is like the easiest way to do those 2d animations so what we'll do is we'll set up a couple of more and you can go ahead and set up the rest that will be the assignment for you uh, um, for this particular class as well the part of the assignment as well right so let's say um, which one we want to do so let's do run uh, run would be an interesting fun one because we'll implement the run logic as well right so here we'll go to the actual player idle and we're going to say create new clip create new clip and we're going to call it player underscore run and save so now you see there is a player underscore run and a player underscore idle if i switch to idle the one that we just set up is visible i'll switch to run because we are going to set up a new run animation and exactly the same process like we did last time but in this case we are setting up the run animation so we're going to set up the run animation without the gun we don't care about the gun right now same process select all the images oh, say that. Okay. select all the images and this and drag it in here if when you're dragging it it doesn't drop just make sure your actual player object is selected right because if your object is not selected then that might be the actual uh, reason why or animation is not getting like like your images are not getting dragged into the animation window again the same process we'll hit play okay looks super fast so we're going to just expand this out remember just to grab this last thing not the individual thing if you interact with the individual thing it will shift the animation it won't actually expand it right so if i actually drag it you can actually shift so so you see it's actually moving the start as well as the end but the width of the animation remains the same so we don't want to do that instead we will uh, use this the moment you see this arrow thingy we'll drag it out let's just say half uh, let's set it to half a second okay yeah this looks better all right okay cool so now we have set up a basic uh, um, two basic animations all right we're going to hit save all right so now we're going to open another window animation animator okay so animation and animator this will open this new window and let's look at what this is so typically you'll see uh, you know when you are uh, <coughs> sorry typically when you have a player right they have multiple animation they have run die death etc etc and all these animations kind of play one after the other in some some shape or form right so the moment you start running the player goes from uh, idle animation into the run animation right so those kind of uh, like your player transitions from one animation into another and then either back to back animation or maybe another animation etc so it keeps moving from one animation to the other animation right so 
what that is exactly what you see inside the animator window so animator window lets you control how and when you want animations to go from one position to another position or from one animation to another animation right so when we are standing we're not doing anything we want the ideal animation to be but when we start running we should stop the ideal animation and transition into the actual uh, run animation right so this is basically uh, what you can uh, set up through this animator okay so what this animator lets us do is exactly that so this is the player ideal animation remember we just didn't set up the name correctly earlier so we're going to just change it to player ideal so we can actually see it here so so you have this player ideal animation you have this player run animation and just want to position it here and you have this entry entry is something that entry and any state is something that unity uh gives us by default whenever we create animations for anything okay entry just means is whenever the game starts or whenever the game objects comes into a scene um it comes into this entry phase and then from entry phase you see this arrow which just defines the default the moment an object comes into existing it will enter into the ideal animation so very first animation that you create will always be linked to the entry and an entry state and from this state it will enter into the ideal state right so because we created the ideal animation first if we created the run animation first you'll see that this would have been this and there would have been uh, an arrow from entry to run right so always try to create the entry uh, so i always try to create the ideal animation first because that's the most common one you want to play when the player uh, uh, you know gets created the very first time right okay so what we want to do is we want our player to go from idle to run but based on some condition we will define that condition what it is but how we can do that right so we're going to right click on player idle we're going to say make transition and then we're going to you see this kind of line show up and we're going to over over player run and press so it's created this custom arrow for us okay so what this arrow defines is a transition a transition from player idle to player run right and this might look a little complex but it's actually pretty simple once you get a hang of it so when i click on this arrow inside the inspector you see a lot of these things right um like all these things define when does a player idle animation uh, stop and when does a uh, run animation start right so uh, if i'm doing those 20 frames for uh, player idle do i abruptly stop them or do i let them finish and then start actually doing the uh, run animation so all those things you can finally control here right but for us the simplest use case is that we want the player to immediately switch to a run animation the moment user starts running we'll set up how and how does that happen but the simplest thing we can do is we can just simply say that it does not have exit time that means whenever we say that switch to the player run animation it just does that immediately and also it its transition duration is zero right so that just means is that transitioning from one state or rather one animation to the next animation is immediate right that's just the uh, the simplest way to do that immediate transition okay cool so what we now we have said that there is a way to transition from player idle into player run so but we haven't defined what is the condition on which this animation should transition so here you see that there is a section for conditions when i click on this arrow on this particular thing you can see there is a section for conditions now in order to create a condition we need to define some data or some variables on which we'll make this uh, transition happen okay so we'll switch to this particular parameter section and you see here that the list is empty so we're going to click this plus we're going to say we want a float value and we're going to say speed okay so if speed is say greater than 0.25 the unit is rounded off to 0.3 okay so um, so if speed is greater than uh, 0.3 in that case we want to do this uh, uh, transition right 
So now we have defined for the context of my player animations, speed is one of the variables that the, uh, the animation system will consider. So again, we click on this particular arrow of the transition and we say plus. Now you see there's this drop down that shows up where since we have created one variable speed, there is one variable speed and I'm gonna say it's greater than 0 0.25. In that case, now I've defined that my player should switch from idle to run when my speed is greater than 0.25, right? I mean, this is just a number, we can change it around later, that's not an issue, but I just want to demonstrate that we can set up this particular condition that player should go from idle to run the moment the speed goes above a certain value, okay? Now, similarly, we should stop running the moment we, you know, stop the control. So what we'll do is exactly the same thing, but in reverse. So we'll right click on player run animation, say make a transition and we'll say go back to idle. We'll select this particular thing again to remove the exit time, uh, set the transition because we want the transition to be immediate. We don't want these values. Usually you will need these values whenever you want to kind of smoothly transition from one animation to another. Um, but those are usually uh, used in 3D games. So we'll look at it once we do the 3D project, but most of the time for 2D, your animations are usually crisp and immediate. So the exit time and the transition values will be uh, removed, okay? Again, the same thing, we'll add a new condition. In this case, we want the condition to be on speed. And here, we remember here we are saying that we are going from run to idle. So we want the speed less than, not greater than, okay? So less than 0.25 and in this case, we want the uh, character to switch back to using idle animation. Okay, cool. So if we quickly set this up, let's uh, just play this value, one sec. Uh, okay, so if I play, so the moment I play, you'll see what's happening is if I actually bring my animator window here as well. So right now my, uh, my game is actually playing the idle animation. Sorry, let me zoom in correctly here. So you guys can see. All right. So right now my player is actually playing the idle animation. Let me just stop this and go back to the scene and not the, uh, yeah. Okay. So you see this kind of a blue uh, blue bar that fills up. This is kind of like it's playing this animation and then restarting and playing and restarting and playing and restarting. So it's looping over it infinitely, right? But if I set this uh, uh, value to be one sec, let me show you. Uh, Where is my transition? So if I set this value to be something bigger to one, right? So right now I change the value to one and now my character has started running, right? So here you see that now the, the running uh, part is actually animating, right? So if I set this value to zero, it goes back to idle, right? So all we are doing is we are able to test quickly that our animations are working correctly, right? So if I remember, we set the threshold here to 0.25. So if I set it to two, or rather not two, but 0.2, right? It's still playing idle. If I set it to 0.24, it's still playing idle. The moment I set it to 0.5, I actually specify greater than. So point we set it to 0.26, it immediately transition into run, right? And when I change it back again to 0.25, it does that. Right. So what we have done is we have defined a very simple condition on how to transition from one particular animation into another animation. I'm just changing these values right now here in the UI to quickly test whether my animations are working correctly and transitioning correctly or not. Right. But we'll write a simple code piece to actually control this through code because eventually we want uh, these things to happen when I press certain key, when I press like say the right key or the if, if I am using the WASD keys, 
if i press the d key in that case i want to transition into uh, my uh, from my idle animation to the run animation so we'll we'll quickly create a script for that all right cool uh, any any questions so far uh, on um, anything related to the animation parts no yeah if if there is any questions just feel free to put down in the chat anytime and uh, and i'll uh, i'll look at it whenever we stop and pause okay cool so all right so this is how we'll set up the player uh, and the player animations now if you look at it uh, the process for creating literally every other animation is exactly the same so you'll go in here you'll create a new clip and you'll name it appropriately and a new box for it will show up and automatically you uh, you'll be so let's quickly do the jump one as well so let's say we have jump um, and we're going to create player id create new clip uh, we'll call it player underscore jump now we have this jump animation we're gonna select the player object expand on it and Player, select player jump, make sure we are in the right animation. Select all these up, drag them in here. And most likely we need to tweak it a little bit because, uh, yeah, let's look at it in the game view. Okay, see, it's like doing freaking super fast. So we're gonna just pause it. We're gonna expand it out to say 0.45 of a second. Okay, maybe better, but probably a little bit slower. Okay, that seems about like decent. But you can you can change different values and see what animations feel right, and and accordingly configure it. And these can be uh, can be very easily uh, changed later as well. All right. So let's quickly go back to this. And now we want the player to transition from um, from state into a jump state based on a certain uh, jump animation okay now for jump the special thing is that we want our player to jump any time when the jump happens right so here we define that run we can enter into the run animation whenever the player is idle right from an idle state it can enter into the run state so there is this special thing called any state what this lets us do is that we can say that this animation we can enter into this animation from any of the states before it doesn't matter if i'm in the idle state i'm in the run state or maybe i'm in the shooting state or the hurt state or whatever the moment i press the jump button i should be able to enter into the jump state okay so we'll do exactly the same thing just that now we'll create an animation or a transition between uh, any state and the jump state okay so we'll create a variable in this case, we'll create, say, a boolean. We can create a boolean because um, jump is uh, uh, like either I'm jumping or I'm not, right? There are no other ways. Speed, I can have slow and fast. So that's why we use a float, floating variable there. Uh, but for jump, I can actually, uh, uh, either I'm jumping or not. This is a boolean, right? So either it's on or it's off. So I've defined a boolean. Uh, and here, if you can see, you can define different kind of things. You can follow float, integer, boolean, etc. So you can have a lot of these different types of conditions. Again, exactly the same thing. We'll uh, we'll disable the exit time. We'll set the transition value to zero. And in the conditions, we'll specify that we want not the speed, but we want the jump. And whenever jump is set to true, it should um, it should go back to uh, it should go into the jump animation. So from any state, we can go into the jump animation and from jump, we'll make the player transition back to idle. But when my speed, when my jump is false, so when I stop jumping uh, or rather than I have, when I've landed back on the floor, uh, in that case, I should go back from jump into idle but now we'll add another condition on top right so it's not just that my jump has stopped but my speed should be less than 0 0.25 as well right 
then only I should go back to idle. But if my speed is greater, then from jump, I should go into running, right? So I, when I land back down, I should either transition into running or I should just stand there depending on my speed. So hopefully this may, is making sense. Uh, I'm gonna set this back to zero. And now we'll say add a new condition. In this case, my speed should be greater than 0.25. And the other condition is that jump is set to false. Okay, so my jump is false and my speed is greater than 0.25. In that case, I should go to the run state and not the uh, idle state or rather the idle animation, right? Cool, so hopefully this makes sense. So now we have seen how we can actually create a slightly uh, complex looking animation structure as well. And you can imagine that for this particular assignment, you'll be creating animations for all of these. Uh, all of these assets that we have available, right? A push animation. You might not use all of them immediately, but the task is that you have to go in and create all of them. So you get com very comfortable creating these animations very quickly, right? Okay, cool. So, so now we have this, let's switch back to Trello and take a look what we have more. So we discussed about what these animations are. We looked into creating a simple animation and the animator. Uh, and your task would be to how we have created these simple two animations, rather three animations, idle animation, run animation, jump animation, go in and create um, the remaining as well, okay? And, and that's gonna be, give you a good amount of practice on getting these set up. So, okay, so now we're gonna build a simple platform. So what we're gonna do is, so right now we have just this character and this character, we're gonna ex exit back out of the prefab mode. So now we have this particular character, right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna um, create, we're gonna add something in order to make this character actually uh, sort of feel like an actual character. So if I hit play right now, all it does is just stands there in the air. It doesn't do anything, right? So we're gonna give this character actual uh, weight and gravity and add physics in. So we're going to briefly talk a little bit about physics, but let me get a little bit set up so that, so the first thing we'll do is we'll add something called as a rigid body. So here you see there are two things, rigid body and rigid body 2D. So whenever you're working on a 3D game or a object is 3D, you'll use rigid body, but we are working with 2D. So we're going to for now use rigid body 2D. Okay. Just added rigid body 2D, haven't changed anything. Let's look at first what happens if I hit play. Okay, so my just character just falls off, right? So if I uh, zoom out, you'll see the character. So the character is indicated by this dot. I'm super zoomed out, so you can't see the character, but the character is falling, right? So essentially what's happening is that we have added physics to this character that uh, now we're saying that this character responds to the physics of the world. And the first element of the physics of the world is gravity. So naturally, we have given it weight. So here you see gravity scale is set to one, which means gravity uh, value is exactly what it is on Earth. And uh, it has a mass of one, like its weight of one. So now the character stops, starts to fall, right? So if I set the mass to zero, or 0 0.001, it will fall, like still fall because gravity is affecting it. But if you want the character to not fall, right? Um, then essentially, or rather make some characters immune, then you can actually set this gravity scale to zero. All this is saying is that this character is no longer affected by gravity. So in this case, you see the character is still the same. It still has mass, but it doesn't get impacted by gravity. So for players, this is not something we'll use, but you can use this for other things uh, that can do collisions, etc. things like that, that still use physics, but we uh, want them to stay in place. You don't want them to suddenly start falling, right? Like imagine if you're making a, a solar system or something like that, right? Like you don't want the planets to just fall like that because planets don't fall like that, right? So in that case, you'll set the gravity to zero or gravity scale to zero, things like that, right? So, so you can do a lot of fancy stuff like this. Okay, cool. For now, we'll set it back to zero. Oh, sorry, back to one. Okay, so what we're doing here is we've just added something called as a rigid body. 
and um, in this particular case we want to add a few more things so let's again look back on our character so i just double since i was like focusing somewhere else in the world you can just double click on that game object and the camera will or your scene you will zoom in and fix it on that particular thing uh, the keyboard shortcut is f for it so if i'm like you know zoomed in on something else i press the f key and it will also refocus again so whichever is highlighted here it will focus on that okay that's like a shortcut for uh, navigating in the in the world all right cool so now you have this camera uh, sorry now you have a, a rigid body set up on this particular uh, object okay so what we want is we want to create something uh, on which the character can stand so it doesn't fall so for now we'll just create a new empty game object we will move this object down we'll just call this for now a platform right now we just want the character to stop falling still behave with gravity but stop falling right so we're going to again do something like the sprite renderer um we'll just assign some dummy sprite for now so that we can actually see it let's see which one looks appropriate so what i have done here is quickly is that instead of finding the actual sprite here inside my entire project you can click this sort of like circle with a dot button right next to the sprite uh and the same thing you can see here and since this is a sprite right uh unity will open and show me everything that is a sprite in the game so you see all these players plants things like that right all the things that are sprite and i can just click, quickly select uh the one that i want and it will apply that so i don't have to go around looking for a certain thing this is like a a, a shorter way of looking at something so i'm just quickly checking if there is something appropriate uh that we can use uh let's search if there is something by the name crown uh doesn't look like it so floor okay yeah there are some floor sprites and etc so let's uh, look if this one looks fine so there's something with like a plant yeah okay this one looks fine for now so we can work with it so so now we have set up a a floor looking thing right but this is just a sprite so we want this to be a uh, a floor for the player so if i just play uh, you'll see the character still kind of fall through it right nothing is really stopping it now in order for physics there are two important things one we just looked at that we need it in order to make something behave or rather in in order to have something react to physics we need something called as a rigid body this is what gives um, an object in the world physics properties okay but in order to make this object collide with other things we need to add something called as a collider so if i just search for a collider you'll see a lot of these colliders show up right these are different uh, colliders and again the same concept box collider box collider 2d and capsule collider capsule collider to it so everything has like a 2d version of it um so the non 2d versions is used for the 3d aspects of the game and other ones is for the 2d aspects so uh and the the reason for this is that unity when it started it only supported 3d there wasn't an easy way or an inbuilt way to do 2d games but i think 3 4 4, four or 5 years back they added this uh notion of whatever they had they made a 2d version of it right so 2d physics 2d images uh 2d animations none of this stuff existed 3 4 years back so so now you have this box collider 2d okay so we have add this box collider 2d and if i quickly show you this button which lets me edit this collider uh so you see this kind of green box that shows up this is the box around which will basically detect collisions right so what i'm going to do is right now you see this box is like super huge so what we'll do is we'll press alt and one second i have to, i'm on the mac so that's why otherwise on windows you can just press alt and what this will let you do is after you click this i have to press shift and alt because of you know mac 
active press command and all for now what i'll just do is i'll quickly click and drag the collider to fit my character right now it was like super huge but i wanted to fit my character so that whenever my character collides my the image of my character collides with something then only like collisions happen otherwise like um, like it will start colliding with things that are way beyond it so for now what i've done is i've just readjusted the shape of the collider to fit this actual character image okay and then i press this button again so now you see there is this green box around my character and this will act as a collider for that character now anything that um, that touches this collider and also has physics on it will cause a collision okay so essentially for anything in order to collide you need two things you need one you need physics rigid body on it and you need a collider on it okay now for our platform we don't want our platform to fall right because platform is just a thing right like it's a plane it's a it's a piece of ground right but we still want it to cause a collision with the player so what we'll do is we'll add a box collider to it but we'll not add rigid body rigid body makes it react to the physics of the world but in this case we don't want it to react to physics we don't want it to react to gravity things like that we just want it to be fixed there but if something falls on it which has physics if we want it to collision like we want it to collide with it and so we'll set this up again we'll click edit okay so in this case you see the image is correctly set up so it fitted the size nicely um, but what we'll do is we don't want the player to be kind of standing on top rather i'll just quickly show you so what will happen is if i have this particular object i'm going to just expand it just just stretch it out a little bit for now so that you can see that the player is standing on it okay so now you see this green box around it right so if i stop and play my game you'll see the character fall but it will stand slightly above oh so right now it's just falling one okay. second let me see what happened so we have dynamic we have collisions nothing is a trigger we have a platform are they in different okay so since we are working with 2d i'm going to quickly switch to a 3d view and show you what's happening so you see if i look from the side my character like my platform is here and my player is behind it right these are 2d images right so they're behind it so the way to with the way i noticed it very quickly is if i click on my player the depth axis what you see here right the depth axis the z this is the z value right so the one that you see going back this is the z value here the z value for my player is 0 but on the platform my z value is minus 1 something right so look at the arrow here right so when i switch to my player it's at a different depth and the platform is in front because that's why the player is like the platform is here the player is here and when it falls it doesn't collide it just falls here so what we want is we want them to be in the same line right so what we'll do is we'll bring our platform also to zero just to make it match okay so now my player in the depth they should like line up okay so now if i hit play the player will stand on the particular platform oh it still falls now let's look at why it is still falling so let's quickly check game player so this is how you typically you know um uh, do everything where you get things set up and then realize something's not working kind of figure it out debug that's the whole kind of process that you have to take for pretty much everything and i think like i've been doing it for so long and i still have to do it right so that's not something um uh, Uh, something that you can get away with. It's just part of how development works, right? Uh, okay, let's quickly check why is this particular character falling when we have a box collider and we have a box collider on both of them. Okay, uh, let me add a rigid body to this as well and see. So we're gonna set the gravity to zero. Uh, ideally, we want the rigid body 
only on one like we can get away with having rigid body only on one object see it's still falling let's see this is main camera this is square this is this no so when you use a trigger trigger will actually let it pass you don't want a trigger right um, you actually want it to be a collider and not a trigger trigger is when you want to uh, let things pass through right so if you have like a, a gate and you know you want to detect when a player is crossing through that gate which is open it's invisible to the player that there is something in the gate but for you to detect that player has entered the room and you can spawn the enemies in that room or something right you let it pass through there that kind of thing so so that's why you'll only use trigger for that for this particular thing we don't have this is trigger uh, is trigger enabled right so we'll actually have it disabled i think uh, let me just check on the collision type so we have sleeping collision discrete and uh, gravity here also we have everything set up let's check one is so we don't have any layers or anything configured oh, okay uh, i know why one second let's look so when this particular thing is falling they're falling in the right place but still something is not triggering the collision logic right uh, let's see what's happening so we have layer body 2d contacts Image. Both are dynamic bodies. We actually don't even need a rigid body on here as well. So we can get away with it. But let's see first why uh, this is. Okay. Ah, I have a feeling that we didn't save the changes. Let's try because we were editing the prefab, but we didn't save the changes for the prefab, right? So that might cause let's change interpolation, no discrete collision detection to dynamic or type is dynamic, which is fine. Okay, still falls through. We don't have any layers set up, so that's okay. Animator, rigid body, continuous, edit colliders. Because if we set it to trigger, it will naturally just fall through. That's like most expected. Uh, it's most expected that it will fall through. Uh, what did we do for platform? We set the gravity scale to zero, uh, but we have mass, linear drag, etc. Uh, simulated simulation along. Yeah, this will make it not respond to. Uh, so, if you disable this particular simulated thing, means it will basically stop responding to anything that's uh, collisions, etc. Right? So, we want it to be simulated, which is exactly how we had it. Collider um, so for this is there. Uh, is there something on the sprite render? Nope. The box collider looks fine. The box collider looks fine. Collision is dynamic. I'm not sure why it should have directly worked out of the box. Let's see. Okay, so we'll come back to it. It'll be easier once we write a simple script and we'll debug this. No, materials don't make any effect on that. Uh, material only. Um, uh, Materials only come into effect when a collision is detected and then the physics the physics knows how to respond to that particular material. All right. So that's why you don't need anything to do with the material. Material just gives you an extra effect uh, after a collision gets detected. I feel like it's actually detecting the collision, but for some reason it's actually falling through, uh, falling through it still. Uh, so what we'll do is uh, now we'll jump to the next section, which is actually creating a simple script and we'll check, uh, we'll uh, debug through script and figure out why uh, 
um, it's not stopping and why it's not the, so this is an actual good use case of even saving error uh, somewhere it created this player jump animation outside the uh, outside the uh, right folders i'm just going to move it inside the folder all right so what we'll do is we'll create a new folder under uh, assets and call it scripts we'll move it into the assets folder right so we'll create a new c sharp script we'll call it layer controller okay uh, let me just switch my view back here All right so now we have this particular uh, script set up we're going to just remove this things so what we have done is we have created a simple script um, it inherits from mono behavior very similar to how we saw a few scripts uh, uh, in our last class on how to you know um, set up a simple mono behavior so this will let, let us attach it to different uh, game objects etc right cool so uh, we have this player controller now what we want to do is we want to uh, first we let's debug why our particular um, uh, collision is not getting triggered so for that unity has an inbuilt function which is called on uh, collision on collision enter so this will let us detect the moment a body collides with each other so there are three types of function there is an enter there is a stay and there is an exit so whenever you touch the very first frame it triggers the enter collision whenever you are by whenever you are let's say going through it right so it will keep for each frame it will keep triggering the on stay and whenever you uh, disengage or like completely remove from each other right in that very last frame it will call exit okay so here we'll just put a debug dot log and again also this has a 2d variant and a normal variant and since we are working with 2d physics we'll use on uh, collision enter 2d so we'll say debug dot log um, collision and what we'll do is so my player controller or rather my current uh, you know player is colliding with something so this collision object that unity uh, passes it to us has an access to a game object so what we'll do is we'll just print the name of that particular game object that we have collided with and this will let us debug that did we enter into a collision with something but something is not causing it to stop falling right so we'll come back to hey did we attach 2d right yeah box collider 2d okay box collider 2d okay i thought we attached the 3d version for some reason all right cool so here what we'll do is we'll search for player controller we'll add the player controller here and let me look at the chat uh yeah so this is something that i explained in the last one uh, i'll quickly cover it again for you uh, but just like revise that from the previous lecture as well in detail so debug.log is nothing but a simple way for us to debug things so unity comes with this debug class which has a lot of these functions and all it is doing is that we can write a message in here that will show up in this console window at the bottom right so you can access the console window through windows section as well windows general console and if you don't have it open it will open up uh, but i covered this whole piece in our in the last class so if you look at that it has a full detail but the short answer is that whatever message we put here as a string will show up in the game whenever this function gets called okay so whenever this function gets called this debug.log message will show up and all we want to do is that we have attached this player controller here all we want to uh, we want this whenever a collision happens we want a message for it that what my player is colliding with so that appropriately we can figure out if my player is colliding with this platform or not right so if so what i did was after we created the script we attached that script to our player and once we hit play let's see what happens you'll see a message show up if the collision is detected okay so since no uh, uh, since no uh, collision was detected you didn't you like you see there's no message here that shows up so just to make sure unity has a lot of these sort of inbuilt functions that it give us awake is one of them as well so awake gets called 
uh, whenever we uh, whenever a new game object is brought into existence right whenever the scene gets loaded the very first time so we are going to just leave a message saying player controller awake all this well is the moment we hit play you'll see this message show up which is kind of a way for us to test that oh okay awake got called that means the script is executing and the player is alive now right so that's simply all it is doing is it's just letting us know okay so now we see that there is this message called awake and it tells us that it's called from this player controller dot cs class line number nine but we see that there is no message for collision that means unity is actually not detecting collision between these two objects okay so now we got to kind of figure out why that is the case okay so let's quickly change the ah i know why okay so i think this is because of players let me quickly check if this is true and we'll fix it so physics yes okay got it uh, so why this is happening is so you see each object whenever you select it there is something called as a tag and there is something called as a layer right so these things let us organize similar things so if i have a full platform i naturally uh, platform walls trees all these things usually i'll create a custom layer um, such as say the level or the environment I'll, i'll call it something appropriate and i'll mark them as that right so in this case my platform whenever you're starting off a new thing you won't see all of these since we imported the unity's 2d kit project it had these layers created that's why you see a lot of them but mostly unity comes with like these uh, first four or five layers by default rest are user defined layers so you have this add layer right so even you can go in and create more layers right so what we want to do is we want to change sorry the light went off uh, what we want to do is we want to change the layer to be the correct layer so by default this would have worked but if i go to file uh, if i go to uh, so i'm on the mac remember that if uh, you're on windows your options might look slightly different but essentially the core idea is that you want to go into um, edit project settings and when the project settings opens up you see a lot of these settings for different things right different parts of the game so we're going to look at settings for physics 2d this is what we are working with and if i scroll down here you see something called as a layer collision matrix sorry i minimized it um yeah so something called as a layer collision matrix all this defines is that objects in one layer which are represented vertically and objects in another layer which are represented horizontally are if there is a tick next to it then these objects will collide with each other during the physics part of the game okay right now if you look at carefully my player is set up into the default player that's whenever you create a new game object <coughs> so any time you create a new game object by default unity assigns the default player right so we created a new object which is for the player and unity created a default player now the 2d game kit actually has disabled collision between default and default so if you see default here which is the very first uh, row and the default on the very last column that means two objects that are part of the default layer won't collide with each other okay so this is a quick way to disable collision between certain things so if i want if imagine if there are multiple enemies coming like you know uh, like an asteroid game or some 2d scrolling game something like that right multiple enemies flying around i don't want my enemies to collide with each other and blow up and and die right i only want them to collide with bullets and my player so between enemy and enemy i'll usually have uh, like disable the collision logic so if you look at here um so enemy which is another layer that they have created uh, you can create more on your own as well so here what we are saying is that between enemy and say enemy weapon right there is no collision this thing is disabled right 
So an enemy cannot collide with an enemy weapon. It doesn't make sense, right? An enemy should collide with a player weapon, and a player should collide with an enemy weapon, right? So if I look within the enemy weapon, there is only one tick mark, but there are two tick marks, which is one for the player and one for destructible. So if I have uh, you know a barrel or a ball that can be shot down or broken down and an enemy can break it as well then now my enemy weapon can collide with player so so this is just a way for us to tell unity hey for this layer and this layer do the collisions or don't do the collisions it's a simple way of doing things so when you have a big environment all these game objects will be added to say the environment layer if the enemies cannot kill the environment or destroy the environment, you just disable this and all the collisions just stop working, right? So this is a quick way to control which layers interact with which layers, okay? So here we're gonna use the, we could have created a new layer, but we can use a, uh, uh, we can reuse the existing layer. So here I'm gonna look at player layer. So player can interact with platform, player can interact with pretty much everything except for one which is cameras so there is a separate layer for cameras and the player cannot interact with the cameras for some reason um, that's how they have configured it but for now what we'll just do is we're gonna set my player and we will change its layer to player and for the platform we're gonna change its layer to um, platform so player and platform they interact right so this is enabled so now if you go back and hit play you'll see this works okay so now the platform as well is falling but if you look here you see this collision with the platform uh, the message came up right because we have had if i double click i'll go back to the line where this message was triggered so my player has collided with the platform and now I can actually see what uh, this particular thing has collided with. Okay, so so this is how usually you can like kind of de start debugging and figuring out what could be potentially wrong, right? So we put in the awake message to figure out that oh okay the player script is working, the player controller script is working, and actually getting the message, the awake message, but the collision is not happening. So now let's figure out why is that uh, why that could be possibly the case, right? So we want the platform to stop falling. So let's do actually like like we were initially doing, right? We don't want rigid body on it, so we're going to remove this component. Um, for two things to collide, only one of them should have, or rather, only one of them can have a rigid body. Both, it, it's not necessary that both should have a rigid body. The one that has a rigid body reacts to the collision. The other one that does not have a rigid body does not react to the collision. So if a ball is falling on the floor, you don't want the floor to fall. You want the ball to bounce back up, right? So in that case, my ball will have the rigid body, but my floor will not have it because my floor doesn't react to that collision, but my ball does, right? Like if it keeps bouncing back and forth kind of thing. Cool. So now if I play, my platform is going to remain there, but my player will come and stand on it. Right. There you go. So now we know that my awake got called once. You see this message one here. And my collision also triggered one. We were detecting on trigger enter. Now if you look closely, there is a little bit of a gap between where my player stands and where the grass is. Right. So now what we'll do is we'll just tweak a little bit of my platform. So I'm gonna again click the edit collider button, go back to my scene view. Because there is the collider is at the top, right? I'm gonna just bring this part of the collider to like the half of it. So it, like, it looks like my player is actually standing on the platform, right? So these are certain things that you might have to adjust in order to make your game look a little bit, it feel a little bit more organic, right? Okay, so now this looks perfect. It looks like my player is actually standing on the ground and not just floating above it, right? So those are sides of like kind of tweaks that you can do. But now, again, going back to the animations, right? So we just had this player, we created animations for it. And now we know that we said that if you look back into the animator window, we said from the entry state, go into the, uh, go into the idle state by default, right? So the player is now doing the idle animation. 
So let's go in and set up our um, jump animation and uh, the other animation, right? Uh, the, the run animation. So what we'll do now is, so we'll, we can comment this piece out. We don't need this. So all I did was highlight all the, all the lines and hit, hit basically uh, control back tick. So it just lets you comment all of them, but you can do it one after the other as well, depending on which code editor you're using. Cool, okay. So Unity comes with another function called update function. Again, this is something that all gets called every frame and super important function that you'll use a lot. And um, I covered it in very much, in very heavy detail. So, so look back on the class, last lecture, the class one, uh, because it's a very crucial thing. But for now, just understand that the update function is something that gets called every frame, okay? All right, so now we have, um, uh, so now we want to detect uh, keyboard input and accordingly transition my player into certain uh, speed, uh, uh, into a certain different animation based on what the input is, okay? So first let's do the, the run one. So what we'll do is we'll do, um, We'll create a new uh, uh, float variable called speed. We can call it anything uh, since it refers to speed, we're calling it speed. So we'll say speed uh, input. Again, uh, I covered all of these kind of uh, functions from the last lecture. So we're just expanding on that. All we're doing is reading the input uh, using horizontal, okay? Using an input class that Unity provides us. So what this is doing is, if we are saying that if I'm pressing the right uh, right arrow key or within the WASD, I'm pressing the down key or on my uh, joystick, if I'm, uh, I'm moving my joystick either the right or the left. So this will give me a value between minus one and plus one. So if my joystick is fully pressed to the right, I'll get a my, uh, plus one. If it's fully pressed to the left, or the A key is fully pressed, or the left key is fully pressed. That means I, I'm intending the player to go left, it'll give me a value of minus one. And if I'm not doing anything, zero. And when I press the joystick slightly, somewhere in between, it will give me a fractional value, somewhere between zero and, and one. So always the value of this particular variable will be between minus one and uh, plus one, depending on what my current uh, uh, input is, okay. Cool. So if my speed, um, so we've defined the conditions that my speed variable inside the animator, if you remember, we set it to 0.25, right? So all we're going to do is we're going to first create a public animator, animator at the top of the script. Okay. Now, if I go back to Unity, I'll just quickly show you why. If I click on my player, so I'll minimize this, I'll minimize this. So now you see this animator also show up, right? Um, this animator refers to that, hey, um, in the current player, which animator are we currently working with? If this player had a lot of different animator, it could be that this player is comprised of a lot of different game objects and we have this complex hierarchy. Then the animator, this one, sorry, this one might be on a different object. So what we can simply do is just drag the object on which the animator is attached into this particular thing. And you'll see player, and then in the brackets, it will indicate that it's a type of an animator, okay? And the object name is player. So in our case, it's on the same object, so I just drag the same object in. That's it, it's as simple as that. So this lets us access the animator and tomorrow if we change our game object hierarchy, we can just drag in the new animator that's the actual animator. Maybe it's not on this object or something like that, right? So we define this as the animator and now we're gonna control this. Um, so remember, what is this animator? This is the animator that we see here, right? The one that we just uh, set up the full animation tree for, right? So it has two parameters. It has the speed parameter and it has the jump parameter. So first we're gonna work with the speed parameter, okay? So whatever value we are getting from the speed, we're gonna say that um, 
animator dot set now you see within set uh, we could create a boolean condition we could create a float condition uh, you know integer condition etc etc right so uh, since speed is the float condition we're going to use the float function for it and then we're going to pass in speed now remember this speed is the one that we set up in the animator window so if this s is capital you have to match it with this s capital this is a local variable, but this is referring to this particular uh, uh, conditions that we have defined here. Okay, so that's why this S is capital here. Speed, comma, then the act pass in the actual speed value here, right? And that's it. So all we have done is we have taken the input from the keyboard or the joystick, uh, whichever we are currently using, and this gives us that input. And we are passing that speed value into this animator. Okay. And we are setting that. So what when we were testing the animation, we were manually changing these values, remember, to make sure that the animation is transitioning correctly. Now we are doing the same thing to code. All right. So let's try this in action. So if I hit play, my character will fall and stand on the ground. And now it's playing the idle animation. Now if I press the right button, it immediately transitions into this. Uh, animation. If I press the left button, nothing happens. We'll look into why that is the case. Okay. So if I press now, I'm pressing the D key. So again, it's animating. If I'm pressing the A key, it's not animating. So we'll look at why that is the case. Okay. So remember when we looked at the animator, what is the conditions that we set up? So if I look at the transitions here, uh, right? So between uh, the run animation, right? We said that the speed should be greater than 0.25, okay? It could be 0.1, it could be 0.2. Uh, the point is that it's greater than a positive value. But when I'm pressing the left button, right? I'm getting a value between zero and minus one. So what we want to do is we want to always take the, um, positive value rather than the negative value. So animator, our animator works on the condition of positive value. So we're going <clears> to, <throat> sorry, one sec. So all we want to do is simply convert this negative value into a positive value. So we're going to use something called as a math F, which is a internal library. And we're going to use a function called ABS, which stands for absolute. So if you look at the tooltip, it returns an absolute value. So if you're passing it minus one, it will return as one. If you're passing in one, it will return as one as well. So it just removes the minus sign and returns as the positive value for it. Okay. So now we've done this. So if I go back and hit play, so now if I'm pressing the D key, it will run. I stop pressing the D key, it stop. I press the A key, it will still run. But in this case, you notice that it's still running towards the right. But instead we want it to run towards the left, not right, right? Because we are making, so now I'm pressing the left key, but it's still running to the right. So what we want to do is, we want to do something very smart here. We don't want to create duplicate animations for it to go right and duplicate animations to go left. Right, because that will be unnecessary too much work. So typically what games do is that um, you look at this. Uh, so there are two ways you can do it. One is through rotation. So you rotate the entire object and make it a mirror of it. Or the other way is through scale. So some games do one way or the other and uh, uh, both ways are sort of correct. That's not an issue. So right now what we can do is, so if I change the scale value, to be minus two, you see it went down because what we said is on the y axis, which is the vertical axis, we flipped it. So if you want, if you ever want the character like a bat hanging from the ceiling and still doing all the animations, you just flip it on that axis, right? So we'll revert this back to two. In this case, we want the character flipped like this, right? So if, if it's facing this way, we want it to flip like this, right? So let's see what happens when we do it minus two. There we go, right? So all we did is change the scale of the character so that it's flipped on the x-axis.
So we'll set it back to two. So it's facing the correct way. And you can do the same thing by rotating the character by 180 degrees. So you can play around and see what happens. Uh, and you can do a lot of cool fancy stuff. So let's say we want to set the rotation by X on 180 degree. Now remember these two are different, right? When you set the rotation on X axis, X is this. That means you're rotating the object like this, right? So if it was standing up here, it's rotating it. So that's why it looks like this. So that's why setting the rotation value and setting the scale value are two different things. So if I change the scale on X and keep going back down, you see what's happening on the screen, right? Like it's flipping across the X axis, right? But rotating it on the X axis is slightly different. So make sure you understand which solution you want to, you can use either. For us, we'll simply use the scale because it's the easiest one to control uh, as well. And if you don't want anything, you know, these kind of transitions, right? Like where it is actually rotating like this, if you don't want anything like this, you just need to set a simple value. So we'll use the scale version, but you can play around with the different rotation values of say on 180 on, on Y axis, right? Which is this axis. Y axis, if you rotate, it's like rotating like this, right? So that's why you see the character flip. Okay, so we'll reset it to this and we'll use the scale version. Both are correct. Um, you can use either of them. Uh, for us, we'll just quickly use the scale version. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, if speed is less than zero, we want our character's scale to be negative, right? So we're gonna say um, vector three scale is equal to, so transform is my uh, transform object. So the one that we've uh, seen at the top, right? Uh, by default, anything that's a motor behavior has access to the transform object, right? Uh, because it comes inbuilt into Unity. It's transform dot local scale, right? So this returns a vector three. A vector three means it has an X, a Y, and a Z, right? So I'm gonna say scale dot X is equal to, um, I simply want the value, whatever the value is on X to flip. Right, so in this case, I'll just say minus one into whatever is the current value. I'm not changing the value, I'm just changing the sign of the value. Okay, so it's important to remember because if tomorrow my artist changed the scale to be 1.25 and here if I was doing minus two, then suddenly in your game, the scale would change from minus one to minus two and things like that, right? So I'm not changing whatever the scale my artist had set up. I'm just changing its sign. Okay. So that's important to remember. Uh, okay. But now here, if we do this, if you think about it, there's one problem with it, right? One problem is that whenever the speed goes back, it will change to minus one. So it will reverse in the direction. But whenever the speed goes back up, it won't reverse back again, right? So we want it to switch back to the right side again, whenever it changes, uh, uh, the speed value changes. So if else if speed is greater than zero, then I want the scale to be positive. Uh, so let me move the scale out so I can access it both inside the if and the else. So scale, dot x is equal to again we'll use the same math function absolute value because now we want the uh, sorry math f math f now we want always because now i know i'm going to the right so i want the absolute value of it okay so i'll say scale dot x so whatever its value is take the positive and turn it back uh, and basically apply the same value back. So if it was negative, switch it. If it was positive, it will give us just the positive value and it will save the positive value, right? And now the important part is that we want to apply this new uh, scale value back into the local scale that we took it from. So we said, uh, give us this local scale. We modified the local scale based on our speed. And then we applied the same local scale value back 
into the transform.local scale property. Okay. Cool. So let's switch back to Unity and let's try this if this works first time. All right. Cool. Play. All right. So now I press the right key. It's running to the right. I press the left key. But you see something weird is happening. So when I keep the left key pressed, it's switching the sides, right? Like, like it's doing some weird flickering thing. So let's see what's happening. Uh, so I'll keep the animator window here so we can quickly debug when it is switching back and forth. So let's see here. Okay, so now, so it's doing the run, but somewhere our scale logic is not correct or got weird messed up somewhere. Let's see why. So I said speed is less than zero, then we are setting it to minus one. Hmm. Okay, I see why. So what we're doing is we are taking the scale. So remember the first frame we changed and applied minus one. Now what will happen the next frame? The speed is still negative because I'm going negative. So the scale value will always be what? It will be negative in the second time because we have already applied minus one before, right? Now we have applied minus one on top of it. So it went to plus one, then again minus one, then plus one, then minus one. So instead what we'll do is we'll just have the absolute value everywhere, right? So apps. And what this lets us do is Every time we take the absolute value, if it's negative, we apply the minus one. If it's positive, we take the positive value and we use that as a scale value. On the X, we don't change the Y or the Z values, we leave them as it is. And now this will actually work, right? So by looking at the animator window, I could see that the player is in the run animation. So there wasn't anything wrong in the animation, which let me understand that there was something wrong with our logic. So you see the, the blue, uh, you know, the timer under the idle. So right now we know that the idle animation is playing. So if I press right, now you see the player run animation playing, right? If I press left, now we see all the run animation is playing and now it's playing correctly. So when I stop, it's actually facing also to the left because we left it in the, so if you see the value here, we left it in the minus one value, right? So which is actually correct. So if I stopped the moment I'm turning left, uh, no, sorry, when I was running left and I stopped, I should still continue looking left. And if I press the right button, it will turn right and start running there. Okay. Cool. So any, any questions so far? Hopefully you're able to understand uh, this piece of logic as well along with it. Just drop down a question uh, in case you have one. Okay. Cool. So, so you saw how we were able to control this simple behavior through uh, a simple animation, right? Now, the next part of your assignment would be that we already have transition defined for jumping, correct? So we'll write the logic. So uh, in the assignment, you'll write the logic for first the jump, okay? Using the similar logic, you'll use it for jump. In this jump case, I'll, uh, so re first refresh the last class. Um, you'll use something like input dot get key, or actually you can use the get access itself. Get access draw, and you can use vertical. So this will tell us if we are, um, we want the player to move vertical, or also in the last lecture, we covered input dot get, um, key down like we covered all these three functions so you can reference those and key code dot space so these are the two different variants where you can learn how to uh, move a character vertically or, or rather detect a input for vertical so if i want my character to jump i'll use key code dot space similarly pretty much anything on the keyboard can be detected through this, right? And pretty much anything on the mouse can be detected through get mouse button, these kind of functions, right? So all these were covered in the last class again, just revise that and you'll get a hang of how to 
implement the jump uh, mechanic, right? So we'll do exactly the same thing. And now your uh, assignment would be to implement first the jump and make sure all the transitions between jumping and running are working fine. So whenever you hit the jump button, it should jump and when it lands back, it should stop the jump, okay? And then if it was running, if I still have the right button pressed, it would continue running to the right, it will continue running to the left, if I have the left button pressed and so on and so forth, okay? So we'll first implement the jump again uh, using exactly this kind of logic. And then you'll move on to implementing the other animations that we have. So remember how we saw all these, um, uh, let me open this folder up, um, not animations, but sprites. So uh, all these crouch animations, death animations, hurt animations. So you can bind them to uh, certain key, uh, key, uh, key presses on the keyboard. So hurt could be H, uh, death could be D or, or something else. D can be for running as well, right? So T or something. So whichever uh, keys you want on the keyboard, just use them and bind uh, or connect the animations to trigger based on those keyboard, uh, key events. Cool? All right, so that's part of the assignment. Um, let me quickly look back. All right, so we covered sprite animations. We implemented uh, a simple character to stand on a platform and then uh, animate from there, right? So I think that's pretty much all um, for today. So we'll cover the animations and getting this set up. Now, once you have this thing set up and have all the animations working, next week we're gonna start looking into actually creating a level around this character. So we'll look into something called as a um, what Unity introduced last year called uh, tile sets. So this lets us create these uh, 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 actual uh, platforms and full environments around a uh, character and that will let us create levels. So for now, today we just added a simple image and stretched it. So if I keep stretching it, you see how this image looks weird and stretchy, right? It doesn't look very nice. And obviously it looks very plain. So there is a quick way to fix it, which is basically uh, within the sprite, you can actually change the draw mode to be tight. Uh, is this set up for tight? Okay, I don't think it's actually set up to be uh, tight. Yeah, so original image is not set up to be tight, but ignore this part. We'll actually look into how, uh, uh, how we can actually create a full, uh, decent looking level through the assets that we have and and that will help us control um, and actually add movement to the player right now he's just running and jumping and standing and you know all standing in one place will actually make him move left and right across the screen and and actually traverse the full level so we start at one corner of the level we have like gaps and jumps and whatnot and we actually move to the end of the level cool Yeah, you can duplicate the floor, floor, but right now it just looks very ugly, right? Uh, because uh, A, uh, it's just one uh, one specific thing that we have used. Uh, and B, I really like, um, there's just easier ways to control different ways, especially when you're building a complex level, right? Like there, there can be a lot more game objects, etc., involved. And if you have to change something, then now you have to go and change a thousand uh, duplicated game objects, etc. So things can become a little bit messy as the project grows. So that's why, you know, there are certain of these inbuilt tools that let you uh, uh, do these things. So, if, so what you said is exactly true. So if we had the, uh, original thing, we could just say, you know, duplicate and actually move them next to each other, right? But there are weird things that can happen when you do a lot of these kind of duplications. So even though it looked like correct, but there's this set of weird gap and then the collision, sometimes things can get messier because uh, it's colliding with this and that. So there's a lot more complexity that comes if you keep like duplicating things left and right, right? So I just duplicated this as well. So whenever you're creating a new prototype for a game, duplication is very, uh, it's a standard thing to do because it just lets you get things uh, up and running very fast. 
but whenever you're actually starting to build a, a game that you want to actually launch to public or you're building it for a company or something, right? You're actually building a production project. Then usually uh, uh, just the base duplication, creating one and keep duplicating it forever doesn't uh, work very well. So within both 2D and 3D environment, the, there are certain other techniques that you can use to make it even look better and then also manage it well over time, all right? Cool. Anything else? So uh, you have access to the uh, the Git link and everything. Go ahead, create a duplicate version of it. Um, the class from today will is also uh, recorded. So you know you will. Um, I'll put it up by tonight on YouTube, and everybody within the class will have access to it as well. So. Uh, if you want to revise certain pieces of it, uh, then you can uh, as well um, look back and just, you know, go through the videos and whatnot. So, cool. So, anytime that there is any question during the week for the assignment, etc., just feel free to use uh, Discord and, and um, that way it can, you know, you can uh, keep asking questions if you are ever getting stuck anywhere. Uh, but how can I import it causing it? is not importing directly um not sure i understand like are you running into some error or something while you're trying to import the project in case if you're running into errors just uh, take a screenshot of it a uh, first thing is always you know just quickly do a google of exactly what the error is sometimes you know other people face the same thing uh, depending on what version number of unity uh, no it's just not showing anything uh, so you've cloned the uh, repo and you see the the folders inside your project correct like when in your uh, windows explorer you actually see the project correctly set up um, so if i go to my um, uh, let me see this right like act, you are you are actually able to see um, all of these kind of folders after you have cloned the repo into your local uh, machine Ah, okay, so you're saying it's not imported in Unity. Okay, so the simplest thing what I'll do is just close Unity. Um, sometimes if you would have selected the wrong folder while creating a project, that might have caused the issue. So what you can do is you can go to the assets, you can go to the scenes folder, and remember there was a default scene, right? Uh, and the, if you look at the file name, it will be some name dot Unity, right? So you just double click that, and that will let you open the entire project up. So I mean, I don't want to open it, but I just wanted to show you. So you can quickly open an, uh, any existing project by opening any scene as well. So if you went to say Unity, import new project, etc. In case you selected the wrong folder, right? Unity might not pick up where you want if it's an existing project, and it will try to create a new project which will look like empty to you. Okay. So just try that. That should work. In case you're running into any issues, just uh, take the screenshot or something and again put it on the chat. Oh, okay, cool, cool, right, awesome. So yeah, so let's get this started and uh, cool. And anything else, we'll just take it on Discord um, because I actually have the advanced class as well starting soon. So I'll grab something to eat. Yeah, freaking starting. Um, Today, what we're gonna look into is basically we'll do a, just a quick recap. So, if you remember from last time, what we did was we set up a basic character. Uh, we set up its prefab, and we have like a basic sort of a idle animation. And if I press, uh, if I press right, the character runs to the right and to the left, etc. Right? And I asked you to go in and implement the. Uh, the jump animation right and on uh, all the other um these animated images that we have under alan who's our main character if you look at animation so you have these images for all these different things so hopefully you guys have gone ahead and implemented those um, today what we'll be looking into is now let me switch to Trello. okay so for this week we'll be focusing on how to actually now make the character move um, with the commands, right? So the left, right, the jump, etc. And then uh, 
first we'll make it move through our script we'll write code for that and then after once the character is is moving we'll look into how we can actually um, build a full level um, around this character and so that the actual movement makes sense um, and finish the level so the goal for today is to get a, a playable level working it won't be a fun level like mario but it will have all the basic pieces and then you can spend um, some time on it to actually add in all the different types of elements on top right so first we'll get started with the actual movement and then we'll jump into creating the full level all right cool so i'll switch back to unity so if you remember we looked into this uh fake sort of a platform we just stretched it out got it working quickly so typically in games you'll always do this you'll not go for the uh best solution this is just something that quickly let, let us test the physics and the movement and the animation etc so we got this set up quick and dirty and and up and it's up and running right so now we'll start working on the actual uh movement logic so on the player if you remember if i click on the player we have our custom script right so our player controller script i'm just going to double click and open the script all right cool so here we were debugging some issue that we were getting in the last class and if you remember we had this update function which allowed us to do all the animation right so now what we'll do is we use the same uh information some of it same some will add more in order to make the uh, player move so in order for the player to move first we need to define how fast the player moves so we'll just create a public float speed variable uh, with creating it public so that we can actually uh, change its value directly in the inspector play around with it we don't have to uh, come back into the code every time to actually make a, uh, uh, increase or decrease the speed right so this just gets us that easy control of of keeping the player uh, of like moving the player's speed up and down kind of thing all right uh, so what we'll do is Oh, okay, we have another speed variable local here. So instead, I'll change this speed to, since this is a local variable only, I'll just change this here to horizontal. Uh, and horizontal. All right. So this way, it doesn't conflict with this speed variable. Mm -hmm. Actually, I'll have to change it here as well. Horizontal, let me just quickly change this as well yeah so here we are referring to only the horizontal so so this is basically for playing the animation right so what we'll do is we'll remove this just to keep our code a little bit clean so we'll select all the code we'll say extract method and all it is doing is just removing the entire lines of code and remove uh, and making a new function for it just so that our code is cleaner and not everything is clubbed into one function itself so we'll uh, rename this function to be uh, play horizontal or rather instead of horizontal uh, we'll say play movement animation so this function is only dealing with the animation part right remember so play on play movement animation so this will take care of checking for the speed and doing this and we didn't implement this last time this was more like the side assignment for you guys to implement so hopefully you have tried experimenting with it as well on how to make the character actually jump as well um, so that will be part of the jump animation right so now we have this horizontal value what we will do is we'll use the same horizontal value um, whether i'm pressing the right button or the d button right and i'll use the same horizontal value to make the character move as well right so we use it for actually uh, uh, detecting if my animation needs to happen in a similar way we will uh, do the same similar thing in order to make the character so move character i'll create a new function and i'll pass in the same horizontal value that we read and i'll say it void move character and take in this float horizontal all right 
Okay, so now, now in this function, we'll actually make the character move, right? So what we will do is we'll, based on this horizontal value, remember what was, was this horizontal value? It was a value between plus one and minus one. So if I'm pressing right, uh, it will give me plus one. If I'm not pressing anything, zero. And if I'm pressing left, it will give me minus one, right? So based on that, I know that whether my, whether my uh, player wants to move uh, the character to the right or to the left, okay? So we'll use the same thing and you know everything uh, for related to position uh, and speed is controlled through this component called transform, right? The same transform component that we talked about pretty much in every class so far. So if you look at it, there is an element called position on it, right? So last time what we did, we used the scale uh, in order to flip the character left, uh, left and right, right? So we used a part of transform, which was scale. Today, we'll use position, right? So this lets us set the position of the character. And when I'm pressing right, I want to move the characters slightly. Oh, sorry. Uh, like this. All right. So when I um, uh, press right, I want to move the character every frame a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. So when I keep pressing the right button, it actually looks as if I'm actually moving the character over time, right? So what I want to do is, I want to say transform, but uh, first I'll create a local variable. Now, um, I'll just explain. Um, are you guys familiar with what a vector three is? Or rather just a generally what a vector is? Yes, no. Anyone? Okay, so I'm guessing you're not. So basically, if you remember, right, like since we are building uh, a 2D game in this case, all we are concerned is with the vertical axis, which is the y axis, and the horizontal axis, which is the x axis. But if you were working with a 3D game, there will be a vertical, a horizontal, and then a depth axis as well, which is the Z axis, right? So <laughs> essentially what we're doing is anytime, if you think about even the 3D world, right? Like uh, anytime you track a position um, of a particular point in our entire world, it will be given, if you're working with a 2D game, it will be given by the X and Y coordinates. If we are uh, working with a 3D game, it will be given by X, Y, and Z coordinates, right? Uh, so if we are working with 2D, there is something called as um, vector two, right? Which basically is nothing but uh, Z value set to zero in a vector three. So vector three will have X, Y, and Z. If I ignore the Z or maybe set it to zero, then, all I'm working with is the X and the Y value. Only those two values are changing. So in 2D games, you'll see a lot of vector two getting used. In 3D games, you'll see a vector three getting used. Vector three is nothing but, uh, if you, you know, uh, from basic math, if you remember, we express coordinates values like this, right? So a vector three is nothing but just a data structure that puts all of these together and, and lets us track like a position of a certain thing. Okay, so don't worry too much about it. It's just literally nothing else more than that. So if even if I want to show you quickly, right? So if I do position dot, you can see there's like an X component. Uh, similarly, there is a Y value and uh, there is a Z value, right? So we get all these different values uh, directly from that particular vector, okay? So now in this case, since we're talking about the horizontal value, right? What we want to do is we want to change the x value. Uh, if I'm pressing right, I don't want to move the character up and down. I just want to move left to right, right? So what we will do is we'll do position x. So whatever is my current position, I just want to move it a little bit based on whatever speed I have defined, okay? So what I'll do is I'll do position x. So I'll take the current value of position x. I'll add some small value every frame. So if my game is running 30 frames per second and I press the right button for one frame, uh, for one second, that means this piece of code will run 30 times, remember? It's within the update function. 
So it will run 30 times. So what will happen is we'll move the player just a little bit, little bit, little bit. So if I want my player to move this much in say one second, then I want him to move one by 30 of that in every frame, right? So what we'll do is we'll do transform position dot x plus um, horizontal into speed into time dot delta time. I'll just tell you what this time dot delta time is. So uh, don't worry too much about it. And then we'll do transform dot position is equal to position. Okay, so what here I've done is I said um, whatever is the current whatever is the current position of x, right? Add some number to it based on my current speed, based on the horizontal value that I am getting from the input, and some time. Okay. Now after I have calculated this. I assign the same thing to this uh, position dot x. So take the previous value, add some small number to it, and that is the updated position value on the x. Okay, and now apply this value, which is like a local variable. The vector three position is nothing but local variable that I created. Apply this value to the actual transform. This is the game object position, right? So through this, I have updated the value. Now, what I was just explaining regarding one by 30, right? This time dot delta time lets us do that. This time dot delta times value is nothing but how much time has passed between the last frame and the current frame, okay? So if my game is running at 30 frames per second, then my time dot delta time will be nothing but one by 30, right? So if I'm defining my speed as five um, or 10 or 20, right? So, so let's say my speed is 20, 30, right? I define my speed as 30. That means I want my character to move 30 points of X in one second, right? So speed is nothing but distance over time, right? So I want my character to move 30 units of distance in one second. So how much would I move in one frame is basically divided by 30, right? Because we are saying that our game is running at 30 frames per second. So by applying this multiplication of time dot delta time, what we are essentially doing is making our speed constant. So in case my game is running faster, the updates are getting called faster, this value would be even smaller because this is time between two frames. So even if this concept takes a little bit time to understand, uh, just think about this. So if you have a faster computer and I have a slower computer, doesn't mean your character would run faster within one second and my character will run slower in one second, right? Just because your computer is faster, right? Or your phone on which you're playing is faster, right? So what we want is if irrespective of which hardware or what graphics card or what CPU we are playing on, if I press one second, if I press right for one second and you press right for one second, the character should run the same distance right, in the game. So essentially by multiplying by time dot delta time, we're ensuring that our movement is always independent of however better our system is hardware is. However fast our game is running on your machine, on my machine, the time value will always, like the movement value will always remain consistent, okay? So, so that's just like a logical way of thinking it. And then the other part that I just explained is the mathematical way of thinking it, right? So if I just wanted to write it like a comment, just so that you can understand it better, I'm just gonna write the speed into time dot delta time part and explain this here, right? So what we are saying is our speed, which is nothing but distance, divided by time, right? That's my speed, okay? And then I'm multiplying it by time dot delta time, which is nothing but one over 
frames per second right and if i'm saying my game is running at 30 frames per second right how many frames per second say my game is running at 30 frames per second or 60 frames per second here i'm just taking 30 as a convenient number so i'm just saying this divided by this and then uh, this is this since this is time this is nothing but a unit of seconds right and one over 30 frames per second so this is 30 per second right since it's in the denominator the unit of second will come back up in the numerator right and the second and second will get cancelled out and all you're left with is just distance right hopefully it, it, it can be a little bit confusing at first glance but if you go back to thinking about the logical uh, way i explained it right so that will hopefully make it clear cool all right um so what this does is it's just irrespective it ensures that my character will always move at this speed irrespective of however fast your system is or however better your system is etc right so it doesn't give any uh, added advantage to one player over the other just because they are on a better machine right cool so we're saying move the character horizontally and this will uh, take care of moving it right so typically every time we do something like this uh, take a value uh, basically have its original value add or subtract some component of it and put it in the original value a shorter way of writing it is basically just remove this part and since you're doing a plus operation we do a plus equal to so this is if i have to do basically a is equal to a plus b right i can write the same thing as a plus uh, equal to b which internally the compiler will treat it as um, a is equal to a plus b so this is just a shorter way of writing the same thing so if this was um, a minus b i would write it as uh, a minus is equal to b which is the same as writing a minus b oh, sorry. Uh, this is a minus b okay and b it multiply divide i do exactly the same thing so this is just a shorter hand You'll see a lot of people write code like this, which is just concise of how, how we want to write it. All right, cool. So let's put back, quickly switch back to Unity and actually just test the small function that we wrote and see if everything looks good. Okay, so now if I press right, you see the character is not moving. The reason? Because we defined the speed variable, but if you look here, its value is zero. So if I quickly switch back, since you're multiplying anything by zero, naturally we'll get a zero. So no new value is getting added to x. That means my player is not moving. It's speed is zero, right? So I'm just gonna set it to say four. And just now you see my character run and it goes off the platform. So naturally it falls. Uh, but you see, because I changed the speed, um, my character actually started to run, right? Um, so I'm gonna set it to, yeah, I just set it to four. For so, so now my speed is four. If I hit play, you'll see the character start running. I'm just gonna extend this platform so it just doesn't fall off immediately and it's easier for us to uh, test uh, our you know, logic. So I'm just gonna stretch it out a little bit. Let's just make sure that the collider is also stretched out. Yeah, all right, cool. So, uh, so since I was in the play mode, I was making changes unity doesn't save the changes you made in player mode so make sure you you're if you're making any changes to the game you're always making them in uh, when the game is not running uh, this just allows you to uh, allow that you're not accidentally made any changes during the game while the game is playing and those get saved accidentally okay so that's a super important thing cool so now our platform is this and now my character runs so same concept um, that we discussed last time based on the animation my character can run left my character can run right and now if i come in and play the player and say i increase the speed to say 50 something ridiculously higher than what i've been oh you see the character just run like crazy right 
So you can go in and play with this value, see what uh, feels right. Mm, 10, yeah, okay, close enough. So I'm just gonna set it to say roughly around eight because 10 is right a little too fast. So it depends on what kind of a game you're building. So you can play around with this value and defining it, it has a public variable here, uh, just lets us uh, chain those values while playing around without having to come and touch the code again every time, okay? So, cool. So after we have defined the speed value, all we have done is now added this uh, simple function that lets us control uh, the player uh, movement. Okay. Now, what we want to do is we want to add um, uh, jumping to the character. So hopefully you guys have implemented the jump uh, animation. Uh, do we have the jump animation? Yeah, we do have the jump animation. Uh, we did create it last time. So what's the trigger for this? Uh, it's just jump. So I'm just gonna quickly add in the jump animation as well so we can see it in action. So what we will do is uh, we will create a Float value, sorry, we create a float vertical. Okay, and then if I have space, um, so I want my character to jump when I press the uh, space button or when I press, uh, you know, the mouse, uh, the mouse button. So typically, what you can do is a quicker way of doing it is instead of typing in this we use so how we use remember horizontal there is a similar thing called jump as well which is predefined in unity and this gives us when the uh, when the left click of the mouse uh, is pressed typically uh, sorry not uh, left click the space left click on the mouse is usually associated with the fire uh, button right so that's typically how you you'd imagine how this works. So I'm going to say animator dot set. Uh, what did we define the jump as? It's a it's a bool. Okay, so it's a bool set bool, and I'm going to say its value is jump. So all I'm doing is exactly the same thing that we did for speed last time. In this case, today I'm doing it for. Um, this. So if my um, vertical value is higher than zero, that means I want my character to jump because when I press the button, jump button, then only this will give me some value. When I'm not pressing the button, then I don't um, have like, but then, then my basically my uh, user doesn't want the player to jump, right? So what we'll do is we'll just set the uh, animation uh, boolean value jump to jump when my vertical value is higher uh, than zero. Okay. So I'll, since it's a boolean, I'll pass in true. Okay. So I'll just put brackets around it so make it absolutely clear. All right. So and if it is not, then I want to change my animator. Uh, to false. Okay. Did you guys actually implement this piece uh, already? Yes or no? Okay, let me switch back. Okay, I'm guessing that's a no. Yeah, so now I press face and my character can actually, you can see uh, the character actually doing the jump animation, right? But the character is still standing there, right? We haven't actually, so, so far we have only made the character move on the X um, and uh, we haven't made the actual character uh, move up and down, right? So for that, we'll do something slightly different. So jumping is usually implemented through uh, applying physics okay so all I'm doing is pressing the space button which is associated with the jump and you see the character play the jump animation 
Okay. Cool. So I'm actually going to move this vertical piece very much similar to how we did this. So I'm going to put the so we are detecting the horizontal hair, vertical hair, and play movement animation. I'm going to pass the float vertical as well. Since this function was dealing with only the animation, so I want the animation to be here. And then I'm going to uh, pass in the vertical and the horizontal values to it. So my entire function here deals with everything animation related. Okay. So I'm just going to come here and quickly minimize this function because my work in this function is done. So I just want to close it out. So I only focus on looking at the rest of the code, right? Now my movement character, my, my character movement focuses on all the things movement related. So I'm going to do the same change. I'm going to re pass in the vertical value as well, because I want the character to move vertically when my uh, jump button is pressed, right? So I'm going to say uh, float vertical and I could have done pretty much all the code inside this function as well instead of creating these smaller functions but what this does is usually ends up making everything messy because you end up with like a function that's 200 lines of code and whenever you have to debug something in it or you're facing any issues it's super hard to figure out where it is so anytime you see a function going over like you know 20 to 30 lines Usually it's a good indicator that, hey, maybe this function is doing too many things at the same time. So let's split it into smaller, smaller functions. Even this function, right? I could have very well split it into two functions. One for uh, actual player movement along the x-axis, uh, which is like the horizontal movement. And then another for the vertical uh, animation. So not movement, but animation, right? So horizontal animation, vertical animation. but since this is fairly small, um, you know, 20, so if you look at it, it's just around 20, 25 lines, right? If I was adding any more code, I'll probably break it down, right? So if you build these habits now, it'll trust me, you'll, you'll be, you know, awesome devs in no time. Cool. So, um, all right. So what we want to do is now we want to move the character vertically. So for vertically, what we want to do is, uh, I'm just going to put some comment here, move character horizontally and copy that line and say move character uh, vertically okay so now if my uh, vertical value is uh, again greater than zero then I want my character to move a little bit up now in order for my character to move I need to do something else um, if you think um, you know, the logical way to think about it would have been like, hey, I'm actually, uh, in order to move my character along the x-axis, all I did was add something to its position or if, you know, if I'm pressing the left button, this horizontal value is between 0 and minus 1. So it's giving me a negative value, right? So the result of all this multiplication is a negative number. That's why my character goes back because I'm adding a negative number which means essentially i'm subtracting right so here what i'm doing is uh, either adding or subtracting based on whatever my horizontal value is right so you might think that if i want to move my character up and down we can do exactly the same code that instead of x we would do it for y the problem with that usually is that when I press the right button, I want my character to start moving right. When I release the right button, I stop the character there itself, right? But in jump, the difference is if I start my jump button, I want my character to jump a fixed height and then fall back down as well, right? So in that case, the behavior is slightly different. So I start pressing right, I want the character to move and the moment I stop pressing right button, I want the character to stop, right? And that character just stops there. But here I press jump, my character jumps and even if I release the jump button initially, it will jump and fall down. If I keep the jump button pressed for a little longer, it will jump and fall down, right? So 
doesn't matter when I release. My character doesn't just stop in midair if I release the jump button in midair, right? It doesn't just stick there. It has to fall back down as well. It has to do the full jump thing. So usually you'll see the horizontal thing uh, when the player wants to move horizontally, you'll be updating the position. But whenever you want the player to move vertically, you will be more likely using physics for it. You'll be applying a force on the character the moment somebody presses the jump button, you'll apply a force. The force will push the character up against gravity and then the gravity will make the character fall. So the behavior between the two movements is slightly different, okay? So what we'll do is we'll quickly, uh, in order for it to work with um, uh, physics, if you remember, we added a component called rigid body 2 ds last time, right? So what we will do is we'll create a local variable for rigid body 2D. Um, Unity internally has a pump like if I look into the mono behavior class, you'll find a, a rigid body uh, 2D there. So what we'll do is we'll just call it RB2D. Just a shorter, shorter name for it. Okay. Um, so what we want to do is inside our awake function. We want to do rb 2 d game object dot. I'll just explain what I'm typing here. Let me just finish the whole statement so you can understand what this is. Rigid body 2 d this. Okay, so what I'm doing is inside the away, the moment my object gets created, game object refers to the current game object that this player controller is attached on, which is my player, right? The player that I'm working with. That's the game object. This is like something that you don't need to define. This comes as part of a mono behavior because we have inherited from a mono behavior. Okay. So game object. And then on that, I have a function called get component. Now this get component uh, tries to find a rigid body 2D component that is attached to the current game object. Okay. So if I come back and show you the player object, you see it has this rigid body 2D that last time when, uh, when we were talking about physics and setting up our initial player, we attached this rigid body component. Now I want to access this rigid body and call functions on it. And this is typically how I, how I will do it, right? Um, other way you will see similar thing do, like if you remember last time what we did with the animator, we defined it as a public thing, right? We defined it as public and even though you see the animator is also on the same game object, we defined it as a public object here, and then we dragged the object inside it like this, right? So we click the same game object, dragged it here, and then it showed in the bracket animator, right? These are both the ways how you can access the all these different components, be it transform, be it the sprite renderer, be it this animator. There are these two different ways of how you can do um, the same thing. The difference is that one, you have to manually drag it in. Uh, every time you make a change, you have to manually sort of like drag it in here. And this is a, a, a coding way of defining it, right? As long as I know that this rigid body is on the same game object, on the same game object that my player controller is attached on, this defining it like private and actually doing it is like the easier way of doing it, right? So you don't have to manually drag it in. So it's important to understand that there are these two different ways of usually working uh, when you want to access other components, okay? If I wanted to access the sprite renderer, I'll do exactly the same way. I'll say game object dot get component and pass in this type. So I want a sprite renderer. So this will return me the sprite renderer object and I can create uh, a variable for it as well, right? Sprite renderer, uh, sprite, and now I have the sprite renderer uh, object, this one, uh, the one that's attached to this game object itself, and I can change the sprite on it, I can change the color on it, I can do a lot more things in code with it, okay? So if it's on the same game object, try to use this approach. If it's on a different game object or you think it might be created on a different game object, try to use the, this approach where you define it as a public um, you know, variable and then you drag in the game object into the right place. Okay, any, any questions so far on the two different approaches that we discussed?
um, just put down in chat. Just feel free to put down any question that come up, uh, or if anything that you know we're going over is is not clear or anything. Right? Okay. Cool. Um, sorry. Yeah. So we had created this rigid body two D. Now what? Like we were discussing about the jump thing, right? So what we'll do is we'll apply a small amount of force in the vertical direction that will make the character actually move. And this force, once the character reaches some height, it will fall down because it has gravity on it, right? Because it has this rigid body two D attached to it, the gravity will force it down. Okay. Cool. So when the player goes, uh, when I press the vertical button, that means vertical value is um, vertical value is uh, uh, something more than zero. Then I'm gonna say RP two D dot. If I say you know um, uh, add force, so you see there are these different force um, functions. But we're gonna use the most simplest one for now. The, uh, if you remember anything from the physics that you studied, right? Um, there's force, there's torque, there are different kind of things. When I want to make the wheel rotate inside uh, this thing, you'll use the torque kind of a function. Um, for now, we'll just use force because all we want is just a force in the vertical direction. Now, most of the time, you don't even need to remember uh, a lot of these functions. If you know, if you forget about these things, um, you'll remember once you start coding actively. But even if you press just dot, right? You'll see all this autocomplete show us show up, and and you just start typing something, and you say, okay, I want to apply something related to force. Uh, I've just typed the word force, and now it shows me all the force related functions. Then, oh, okay, yeah, I needed to use add force, right? So don't worry about that if you don't remember all these function names. Naturally, you'll remember them uh, as and more you keep practicing. But even if you vaguely remember something, just start typing, and the autocomplete will show you all the Helpful details about it. So, if you look here, there are two different add force functions. One just takes a vector two, right? In since we are working with two D, since we are working with two D game and we are using a rigid body two D, it only takes a force vector um, as vector two, not vector three, because you know, of course, we are working with two D. So, and the other one is called uh, the same function, takes the same vector two with force, but in this case, it takes an extra argument, which is force mode. And we'll just look into what this force mode is. So for now, we want to apply a force in the vertical direction. In that case, my X value will always be zero, okay? So I want to say new vector two, and X value I know is zero. I want to specify some y value, right? So in this case, I can do exactly the same thing. Like I defined speed here, I'm gonna define a float for jump as well, so that I can easily change how high my character jumps. Okay, I'm gonna pass in this jump value, and then I'm gonna do force. So if I remove this. You see the second argument unity is suggesting me to add is force mode, right? So I'm gonna click force mode dot. Now it's an impulse force, it's a regular force. So we'll right now go with impulse. What this means is that I want to apply a sudden force uh, to the character. I don't want to apply a force for a longer duration of time. I just want to apply a sudden force, okay? So, Let's do this. Now, I've defined a jump. So I said x value is zero. I don't want to apply a force on the x direction. I only want to apply a force in the vertical direction based on whatever my uh, jump is set up to be, okay? So I'm gonna quickly switch back to editor and hit play. Right now, my jump value is set to zero. So even if I keep pressing the space button, the animation plays but my character doesn't physically move up. All it is doing is, it's just animating, right? So if you look at the X value here and the Y value here, you'll see these won't change. Uh, so if I show you guys here, right? So you see the arrows, right? This uh, green and red ones, um, that indicates my character's position. 
you'll see that this position, the arrows won't go up and you can verify the same thing here. These numbers won't change, the actual position of the object won't change, but it's just doing the animation. So I'm gonna just change the jump value to some random number. I don't know how much this is gonna make it jump. And now press the jump button. And now you see the character just like jumped really high. So I'm gonna change this number to say something zero one. Okay, so now you see the arrows kind of just go up slightly. If I press the jump slightly and just release it quickly, right? The jump is smaller, but if I keep pressing it, it'll keep jumping. So there are ways you can even control these kind of things as well. Uh, for now, what we want is, um, we were applying that impulse force every time the vertical value is greater. So that's why it every frame, I keep pressing the space button, the character jumps higher. Right, so here I press, but you see this animation kind of ends before the even character falls, so it makes it look weird. So instead of impulse, we're just going to use the normal force. So that way, every oh, sorry, um, every frame that I'm pressing the force button, it's applying a constant amount of force, right. So now what I'll do is I'll hit play. Uh, I didn't change the value, so I'm just gonna change it to some dummy value one and see how this behaves. Okay, so here we see I'm pressing the space button and the character is jumping, but the position isn't changing that much, right? So I need to increase this value to something higher. We'll play again. So this is kind of the, the typical sort of an iterating process because you don't know what how much pen really means, right? So it just needs to feel right. So, okay, even now it is pretty small. So we'll increase it to say 100 and play. So you'll play multiple times and, and this, this is the same thing that designers do as well, right? So now the character is going too high. So 10 was very less, uh, 100 was too high. So we're just gonna iterate quickly and figure out what good balance is and then we'll leave it there. Okay, so yeah, this feels like, okay, this feels good, right? I press the jump button and my character goes higher. If I hold the jump button slightly high, oh, 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 uh, that seems odd. Oh, okay, so let me check what happened there. So, so that's the kind of, you know, the fun part of, of building games. Weird things like that happen. Even though we were applying always the force in the vertical direction, the character just tilted for some reason and then just fell over. So, uh, Let's see why that happened. So, uh, ah, okay. Um, so most likely what we can do here is if I come back to, uh, where is my options, info. So there is a way what we can do is that we don't want our character to tilt like this, right? We just want the character to go forward or jump, right? Like we don't want it to tilt. So what we can do is we can freeze the character to not rotate. Uh, so what we can do is inside our uh, rigid body, there is this constraints section, right? So what we want the character to freeze on position? No. We want the character to Y position to freeze? No. But we want the character to freeze on the uh, Z rotation, so it will now never rotate like this, right? So the Z axis is the depth axis, and we don't want the character to ever rotate like this. Cool, so we'll just pick this button, and now accidentally, because the physics and the gravity is pulling the character down, it will never sort of uh, rotate and fall like the way it happened right now, okay? So, so this is kind of like, an interesting way where you can define constraints like this. If I only only wanted my character to move in the X direction and never even wanted to move in the Y direction, I could even check this button and say that the character would never move in vertically. It will only move horizontally, right? So you can do this maybe if you're creating an enemy that just walks along the position and never jumps up and down or anything like that. You can just tick this so that even accidentally it never moves up and down, be it above, be it something. It's just the way to uh, make the player move 
safely. Okay, cool. So I've made a lot of changes. We added some new variables, etc. So after I've done that, uh, since our player is a prefab that we created last time, I'm gonna come in and here say apply all. So all my changes to the prefab are saved and I accidentally don't end up losing a lot, any of this uh, work that I've done so far, okay? Cool, so hopefully so far it's clear, we just created simple functions to make the character move left and right and added a basic jump. Okay, so we'll just quickly try one more thing, which is can we make the character jump and move at the same time, right? So there are two different things. So I press the jump button and I move. But there is this weird kind of thing where the character starts to jump and you know, you see this behavior where it's like it jumps and then transitions into the animation and starts walking or running like this, right? So you can look into blending animations. Those are kind of the things uh, as well. But what we will do is we will make the character quickly fall down when we release the button. So for that, I'm gonna increase the mass slightly so the character falls down. Right now, it's just like, it goes like really slow. Uh, oops, sorry. Uh, but we want it to be snappy, right? Like it just jumps and bam, jumps and bam, right? So you can play around with this mass variable, which is nothing but the weight of the object. So if its weight is higher, the character will fall faster kind of thing. So. But if you obviously change the mass, then you need to change the uh, force accordingly as well, right? In order to make the character go up. So keep playing around with this value, figure out what you feel is like a nice sort of a movement balance. So you'll see that, you know, um, typically uh, this is more of like an art than science where this feels right, this feels, uh, you know, good or this feels like my character is floating in midair so it depends on what kind of an experience you want right you have to figure out like what you're trying to achieve so maybe 10 is too much so so now you see the character kind of fall down faster but our animation is slower so so these are the kind of things that you have to uh, work around and figure out what are the best numbers to get the player to move the way you want it to so I'm just gonna set it to five, set it to 100 uh, for now and just uh, leave it at that because otherwise we'll literally spend hours figuring out these numbers and, and usually that's actually what happens even uh, when you're building any real product projects, right? Uh, all right, cool. So now we have added basic jump animation and we have added actual movement. So now we're gonna look into how to actually create a basic level right so we had this platform that we created last time i'm gonna just read off this window here so our scene view is bigger so we created this um, basic platform last time um, and we just trashed it because it's just one image uh, it looks super ugly you know so we just picked up like i don't remember which image we picked up last time uh, Let's see where is this. Yeah, okay, so this one. So we use this image, but we stretched it so it looks like really, really ugly. Um, so what we're gonna do is, today we're gonna look into a new feature that Unity added uh, uh, relatively recently uh, uh, called Tile Maps. Um, I haven't used this on any, uh, like a project with working with any company because it's relatively new features and usually companies, you know, um, don't use a lot of new features because obviously anything new get, that gets launched has bugs. So I've just played around with this. It looks good. So that's why, uh, you know, this batch, I'm actually including it, uh, this feature. Um, as well because I think going forward this will make your life a lot easier on creating 2D levels in the game. So first thing first, we'll remove this platform for now and we'll start working with a new platform, right? Uh, that we'll create with this new feature. So we'll go to Windows, uh, 2D and Tile Palette. So Unity created this 
Um, I want to dock this window here. So Unity created this new feature called tile maps. Um, tile maps, tile palette, tile sets, these are like different things. But essentially what it is, is at the end of the day is you have a bunch of these different images and you can put them together in the form of a grid, okay? And how, if you think about like, you know, MS Paint or anything like that, you pick up a brush and then you just go and paint the entire thing, right? So on a very similar line, Unity wants you to create levels using a very similar notation because it's very easy to just go in and paint simple blocks and, and working with 2D games, usually you have like the, the whole game is like a grid, right? An XYZ grid where you can define, okay, this is like a, a platform piece, then this is the gap, and then this is another platform piece, the player can fall through the gap, things like that, right? So, okay, so this tile set rock water blocker is something that was already as part of the, the 2D game kit project. I, Thought I deleted all of the existing ones, but probably it's around. But anyways, ignore this one. We'll look into creating something from scratch anyways. Okay, so the first thing what we want to do is in tile, uh, in tile maps, we want to define what are the different images that we'll use to paint our actual level, okay? So when you open this window on a new project, this will look empty. So ignore this particular one for now. Uh, so what we will do is we'll go in and we'll say, We'll click this button and say create new palette. Okay, so we'll say um, ground and call it ground palette. Okay, so we're going to say ground palette. Uh, we'll leave the grid to rectangle for now. Um, if you're working with like say a civilization kind of a game, if you see if you've seen right the grids of civilization and some of these other games are like hexagonal in shape so you can select the hexagonal uh, grid but for us we'll just keep the rectangle one and you can go in and play around with these other ones and the rest of the stuff we'll leave at default and we'll just create a new thing um, now unity is asking where in which folder we want to create this in so we have the art folder um, inside the art folder we're going to create a new folder called tile map create and inside tile map we'll create a new folder for uh, level or rather we'll call this as ground tiles something like that i choose this folder and now you say hey, before we had just this one now it has this and it tells us that we need to drag in the images so tiles sprites sprite texture these are nothing but um, different names for images um, and so we're going to go inside our uh, 2d game kit from where we are using all the assets art assets um, we're going to go into sprites environments and see which all so i'm going to just look at the inspector uh, click on something randomly and see which are the sprites. So you have all these different sprites as assets that you can use to decorate your level. But for now, I'm just looking at uh, assets that I can use to build a floor. Um, let's see which ones are those. Okay, these ones. So I have this wall tile, uh, wall tile end. And yeah, so I have these three images. So what I'll do is I'll switch back to this. Uh, window, I'm going to shift, click and select the three uh, tiles that I'm interested in and I'm just going to drag these in. Again, go to art, tile map, ground tiles and within this itself, I'm, I'm going to choose the same ground tiles folder and now Unity has created this uh, uh, three different tiles for me. Okay, so because we imported in these three different images, right? So you see tile one, tile two, tile three. Now I want to uh, create, um, so all, all I've done is right now I've defined that I want to use all these different images and, and use them to actually paint my level, okay? Uh, good. And use those to actually paint my level. So that's all I've done. I have not actually started painting my level, right? So what I do is here you can see uh, these different sort of uh, icons on top. 
um essentially these are like your you know your paint tools kind of thing so you can uh, erase things around uh, so, so if i wanted to erase this i would click on this and click on this i don't want to erase it right now but the idea is that you can if you've imported something that you don't want you can erase those things inside it etc etc right so in this case i just want to say select this style and start creating a floor at the bottom of my player's feet right so first what i'll do is inside my hierarchy i'll go to right click uh, create 2d and here you'll see tile map so if you created the hexagonal tile map you would say like the hexagonal one uh, we created a, a simple rectangular one so we're just going to select tile map and this will create a grid so now if you see my uh, scene view you see like this like small cells grid kind of show up right so here we have this grid and inside it unity created us a simple game object called tile map i'm going to rename it to the ground i'm going to call it ground tile map just to be clear that uh, whatever we place on this tile map object will all be related to the ground palette and nothing else okay so i'm going to just zoom in here and so when i select this paint button i can select this tile and all i need to do is i need to literally just click and drag and now i have my platform created right so if i switch to game view you see my platform here right so instead of actually taking a game object stretching the sprite on it this is like the easiest way you can actually get your um levels created but say if this is the edge of my level i click on this edge tile and i put that as a edge there uh, i think it might not be visible okay it's visible on the camera so here if my character keeps going to the left it will just fall off the right one looks like a beard straight line as if somebody cut it through a knife so it looks artificial uh, so in that case we want to actually put this as well but if i put it here like this uh you know it it's broken off edges on the other side so what we want to do is we usually want to rotate it around so uh normally what i'll do is i'll import this style again because if you think about it right this is an edge an edge which is facing uh towards the left right i could ask my artist to give me an image that is facing towards the right because i want it to be the right side edge of of this right like i want to place it here uh, where my mouse is right now instead of doing that i'm creating a duplicate art assets all i have to do is mirror this existing asset so it reduces my artist work and all i just need to change is the angle of it right so i'm going to import this tile map again just drag it in and put it here uh again the same thing so i'm going to select assets art folder tile map folder ground tiles folder uh i'm going to call it wall tile n2 or something because this is the second end of it right and now unity has created this for me so uh this is on this edge uh let's see if i can actually move this object uh yeah i was trying to move it but uh I'm not sure if unity lets us move the tiles or just puts them uh in whichever place i can anyways so the point was basically i want this edge to be uh to be flipped right i don't want it to be like the way it is right now so what i want to do is i want to change its rotation uh, let me just bring this window here so i can see both of them in parallel usually when you're working with like unity it's better if you're working on a monitor i am on a laptop so you can see you know everything looks squished together uh so i have this window and i want it to be uh rotated mm, let me see where does unity do so these are kind of like the minor things since i haven't used this specific tool to build any production games uh, i still need to figure out uh, where all the options are and i don't even see an option to actually make it rotate um 
So that's usually the kind of issues that you run into when you are uh, working with production games and companies don't really like. Um, oh, okay, so seems like this might be the way it is kind of weird. Thing. I have to select the act, like the the arrow tool, select the image, then it will show me this. So in this case, I want my type to be rotated on uh, on the y axis, right? Like we want it to be flipped like this. So yeah, so you see it update after such a long time. So in this case, I want my my image after I set its rotation to 180, it flipped, right? Cool. So here I want my x. But yeah, this doesn't let me still move my tile and actually move it here, right? Like I want it to be aligned like this. I just wanted to show you some uh, nice little thing. Uh, let's see if I can move the position to zero. I will move here and I'll move this to be minus two. Hopefully this will actually change it. No, it doesn't let me change it like that. Okay, let's see what this does. Hmm, okay, minus one doesn't do the trick. Minus two does the trick. Okay, and then on Y, I want it on plus two. Yeah, all right. So, so you see, like, since this is a relatively new tool, uh, it doesn't look like it has a simple drag and drop thing functionality yet. You have to manually play, play around with these values. So that's the kind of a drawback when you're working with something really new. Uh, cool, but, but hopefully you can uh, go ahead and play around with this and see, see how you can create it. Uh, quickly, if I wanted to show you, I can actually uh, erase certain pieces of the tiles as well and by just by selecting that erase button. And let's say, I'll just quickly erase all of them. All right, so I erase all of them. And I have this group functionality as well. So what I can do is, if I wanted this app, entire piece to show up exactly like this, right? So I can click the group thing and you see this vague outline show up next to it. I'm gonna use this and paint. Why is Unity not selecting this one? One second, let me see. Okay, I click paint. So Unity is not picking up the left tile for some reason but it's picking up the right one. So here is, you can see that I'm not pasting one tile at a time, but I'm pasting a group at a time, right? So if I wanted to always put these two together, okay, I could uh, select the, the, the group one, I can select these two, and now Unity is showing just one. So I have no idea how this tool freaking is built internally. But yeah, you can see the whole idea is that you can paint your level really quick. So I'm just gonna quickly go in, create a simple sort of a level so we can actually test our, our uh, core uh, uh, functionality. So I'm gonna build a vertical wall so my player cannot fall off behind this. And then a simple platform where my player can keep jumping around, maybe even uh, fall back down somewhere here and say, jump uh, something here, okay? And then let's say there is a vertical wall here and we want the level to end. So, so now I have this, um, I have this full sort of level that I created in literally no time. If you were doing this manually through game objects, this would take us forever to do, right? Um, at least like two hours, if not more. So what we've done is we've quickly created this basic level that we can actually now uh, move around, play, jump in. I'm gonna just put this back here so that I have more space on my screen. And then, yeah, so cool. So now that I have a basic level, I'm gonna do one thing. So you can do something very similar. Uh, if you looked at the uh, not the animation sprite, if you look at the environment sprites, right? Like you see, there's so many sprites. So what you can do is you can go in and create multiple layers. I'll show you how to create one layer. One second. 
So you see all these different assets for like props, objects, floating rocks, etc., etc. Right. So so let's say floating rocks. This is a good example that we can use. So I'm going to create a new palette for floating rocks. Floating rocks create again same art folder tile map and here I'm going to create a new folder called floating rocks instead because I want them to be separate from my ground uh, ground tiles right so I'm going to create a floating rocks folder I'm going to drag this asset in and again same art tile map and here select the floating rocks folder and choose that and now you'll see that Unity has created a bunch of floating rocks for us. But, ah, okay, I can't use the floating rocks thing because uh, the problem is that this asset is not configured correctly. Um, if I show you in the inspector, uh, is this set up to multiple? Yeah, it's set up to multiple correctly. So something's wrong with that particular asset. Clicking on the sprite editor, just quickly checking, don't worry about uh, this because here it's predominantly more like an artist's job to figure out if, you know, our uh, assets are set up correctly or not, more or less. But these are the kind of things that once you start playing around, you'll figure out. All I'm doing right now is checking if my images are correctly laid out that they're not overlapping because once we import it in the tile map, right, you saw how um how our tile map actually created them like like all these rocks are sort of overlapped right i want them to be separated and not overlapped so it looks kind of funky um but i'm just seeing if there is a different asset that we can use what i wanted to show you was that we can create um create these different things in the background and different layers um, that will work. So let me see if I can import rubble in and inside art, tile map, floating rocks, uh, choose. Let's see where is this? Yeah, this is all kind of grouped together as well. So it'll be hard to kind of uh, use this asset. Let me see if there are some other ones. But the idea was that what we can do is, I'll just show a demo of it and then we can figure out which asset it is. We can go to um, uh, grid, right click, create 2D, and we can create a new tile map inside it, okay? So we have the ground tile map. Now we can create, say, I want it like these rocks. Um, and I'm gonna call it like background rocks. So these are just for decoration, decorating the level. They, the player doesn't interact with them or anything like that, right? So I can create a separate layer for background rocks. And with this background rocks layer selected, you see the active tile map shows which layer I'm working on. So I can actually create something on the background rocks layer now. So if I select, say, um, I'm just gonna select the entire a uh, rock that we have here and paste that in as like a background item right like an item that just sits there in the background so i'm gonna uh, paste this here and paste this here paste this here paste this here but so so hopefully you get the idea paste it to me uh, that these are just like the artifacts if there's like trees things like that that you can put them in the background and now if you look at your game view, you have these things in the background that you can use for decorating the levels. And you can create, keep creating these um, different layers. Uh, if I go to the tile map renderer. So remember, renderer is nothing but that renders something onto the screen, that paints something onto the screen. So if you remember the player, we have a sprite renderer. On, um, on the tile map objects, we have tile map renderers, right? So these are nothing but take things that take care of rendering objects onto the screen. So what I can do is right now my ground and rocks look very strong. So it feels like those rocks are also part of my level, right? But instead I want them to be in the background. So I'll go to the background like uh, background rock game object. On the tile renderer, I'm gonna uh, change, 
how can I change the uh, visible bottom left? One second. Uh, is it on the tile map? Yeah, the color value is on the tile map. So inside the tile map, I can click on the color. Of course, I can change the color and you see the color of all the rocks and everything change because they're all part of the same layer. So I don't want to change the color. The color is good uh, as it is. What I want to change is this alpha value. Uh, changing this alpha value adds transparency. So if I'm uh, keeping this alpha value all the way to the full, um, all that means is that my object is not at all transparent. If I drop it to zero, it's like completely transparent. So I don't see. So I'm going to keep it something like slightly uh, faded. So it, it's, it doesn't look like that it's part of my actual platform, but it's like a thing in the distance. It's like a thing in the background, right? So you can create these multiple layers. I can have one for like the rocks, one for maybe the trees, and it will have a different, you know, alpha value. Then it like trees might look in the front, rocks are even further behind. So you can create these kind of things uh, you know, through these layers. Okay, cool. Uh, so far, so clear. So you can create these different layers. You can go and play around with the values. And what I'm going to do, one more thing is that I want the rocks in the back, right? So I'm going to change this order in layer to be minus one because my ground is layer zero. The rocks are behind it, so minus one. If there were like a tree or like a scenery behind it, I'd create a new layer for it and call it minus two. Right? Something like that. So anything that's in front of my player will basically be uh, actually if I can, I'll show you this quickly. Um, so if I zoom in and I paint a, a rock which overlaps. Uh, so here if you see the rock, uh, I'll switch to this. The new rock that I added is like this one which is behind uh, behind my wall, right? Because it's in the background. If I change its layer to be plus one, you see it came in the front, right? So this lets me control if I just change this back up quickly. So you can see the rock in the front, right? So changing the layer plus value means closer to the camera uh, or the view and minus value means further away, okay? So that way you can create these things. If I have a tree and the rock is behind it, so the tree and the tree is also behind the, uh, the player. Then my player is at layer zero. My tree is at minus one and the rock behind it at minus two. So that way you can keep creating these sort of layers of things. Okay, so I'm just going to quickly change this back to minus one, add in the alpha uh, a little bit so that they're like, they look like kind of faded. Uh, I'm going to change this, this color on the main. So this blue color that you see everywhere is nothing but the color of the main camera. So I can change this to something else. Just something slightly sober. The blue kind of looks very weird. Um, don't worry about this color. Anyways, we'll replace it with the entire uh, image in the background. So uh, this is just a temporary color for now. And now if I actually hit play, uh, I'll be able to actually move the character, jump around. Ah, we missed one thing. So we created the uh, the full uh, level, but we never added any colliders on it. Remember last time when we created this platform, we had to add a box collider in order to make the player collide with the platform and then stand on it, right? Just the sprite itself for showing the platform will not do, right? So we need to do the same thing for our uh, for our actual uh, this thing uh, uh, ground layer as well, right? We don't want the uh, the character to collide with the the rocks. These are just the artifacts, but we want the characters to collide with the different things, right? So now the best part is if you would have created these different individual game objects like we were discussing last time, uh, we would have to go in and create a collider on each of them manually resize it. But now with uh, time map, it lets us do, if I just search for collider 2D, you see these ones, right? Like last time we used box collider, we have a box collider on our player as well, but there is a specific collider for time map, right? So Unity has given us this functionality that on this particular layer, 
I can add a tile map collider and now you see those green boxes show up. So everywhere where I have painted a tile from that particular layer, there is a collider there. Right? So this way I can very quickly add a collider to all my platforms and now uh, you know, I don't have to go in and manually tweak this. I can just go in and check if everything looks good. So we have all the colliders here. We have all the colliders on these pieces. Just to verify visually that there isn't something off or missing. And then we can go ahead and hit play. And see, now my character stands on the level. Okay. So, oh, because of the gap, we didn't jump. It basically fell through the crack. Right. So I'm going to hit play again. And now I'm going to try jumping to the left. So here you see the character cannot, I, even if I'm pressing left, it cannot because it's colliding and the physics is stopping the collider. Uh, physics is stopping the player from going through because this is like a wall, right? So I can jump, I cannot this, but it does this kind of this weird flickering thing as well. So we'll, we'll try and fix that in a bit. So I'm going to try and jump. Oh, oh, oh. ah, shit. Fell down. So I'm gonna hit play again. Let's see if our jump is actually jumping, making the player jump high enough. Yeah. Oh, okay, maybe jump too high. So yeah, so we need once we play around with those jump values correctly, we'll have uh, you know uh, a better control over how high my character jumps and how fast it jumps it. Right now it just jumps in like because we need to play around and figure out what those values are okay so here and then jump jump and then move forward but now we have this weird problem that we have a level but our camera is fixed we need to actually take the camera along with the player right so what we will do is we can of course create a script um that makes the camera's position update so remember camera is also nothing but a game object right now that game object is looking at uh, it has a fixed position and it's looking at a fixed place so the moment my character goes to the right it just basically uh, doesn't follow it anymore right so one way is to create a script on the camera object let it know who the player is and every update the camera's position will update to be the player's position Right. So that's one way of doing it and, and maybe we'll look into it as well. But and there's another simpler solution for this. So you have a camera object and you have a player object. Anytime you want something to follow along with it, remember what we are doing when we are moving the player. Um, we're changing its transforms position. So if you look at this grid, right? Uh, this grid has a ground tile map and it has a background rocks map and it could have even more. But essentially what this is, is it's a complex game object. It has a parent game object, which is the grid. And then it has a child game object and it has another child game object, right? So what will happen if I change the position of the parent game object, right? So if I change the position of the parent game object, you see every, I have, I'm not changing the position of the ground tile map or the background rocks or anything like that. But because I've changed the position of the parent, everything is uh, under it. Its position is also changing. Okay. So that's, uh, that's an important distinction to understand. So changing the object of a parent will always change the uh, position of the child objects because child objects position is always with respect to the parent, where my parent is in the entire world, if my parent changes, even though I'm not changing the actual transform values on the child, but the parent has changed and my child is attached to my parent object, so everything changes with it, right? So if I change this value to 10, you see the entire world shift, right? right? So this is something very useful. If you create the hierarchy of game objects correctly, you will basically be able to change the position of one and then rest everything will change with it. Okay. So we'll use this functionality and we'll basically uh, go in and say we have the pair, player object and we have the main camera. We want the main camera to be a child of the player. Okay. 
So same concept, we had grids, we had layers under it. We're gonna take the player and we're gonna create the main camera under the player. So every time my player's position changes, my camera position changes with it, even though I'm manually not changing the camera position. I've set the position of the camera with respect to the player once. So if I want my player to be exactly in the center of the screen, I'm gonna do something like zero, zero, right? This is minus 10 on the Z value because my camera is looking along the Z axis, right? If I set the Z value to be zero as well, that means my camera is right on the player. It won't be able to see it, right? So I need to keep the camera away from the, my player. Same way, if you remember, right? Like, like if you take a selfie, you have to move the phone away from you, right? It's the same concept. I have to move the camera away from the player on the Z axis, the depth axis. And once I move it away, then I'll be able to look at the player. If my camera and my player are exactly at the same position, my camera cannot see the player. Right? So if I change it to zero, you see everything go blank. Why? Because now my camera and my uh, uh, player and the environment and everything is at the same Z value. So everything is like at the same place. So the camera cannot see it. If this is my camera, my camera needs to be slightly behind uh, in order to see everything. Right? So even minus one will work, minus 10 will work, minus 500 will work. The distance doesn't matter because we're working with 2D, everything will look the same, right? If it was 3D, then the distance will matter. But for now it's 2D, so even minus one is totally fine. But if you create more layers in front of the player, then remember that, that this value needs to be higher, right? Like we created the layers in the back. If we create layers in the front of the player for some reason, um, yeah, an object that the player can hide behind, things like that, then this layer, this value needs to be even further behind in order to see those layers as well. Hopefully, they think from that logical perspective, right? Like we try to visualize it and you'll, you'll get a hang of it. So here it's showing a plus sign right with next to the, uh, the object marker. Uh, why? Because we've created something new and changed the hierarchy of this. So again, I'm gonna go override and here it's saying that I've added this new game object under it, okay? I'm gonna just apply and save. So now my um, prefab is saved. So let's try playing again. And now in this case, my player should, uh, my camera should actually follow the player. So you see now the camera is actually moving along with the player. So if I jump, if I jump, the, the actual camera also moves with it, right? So if I jump higher, my camera is moving with it. But the weird thing is that we said that we wanted the player to be exactly in the middle of the screen, right? So if I just quickly go in now, oh, sorry, if I quickly go in, now my character is here. So normally, uh, if, I look, if you look at this camera view down here, right? The character is slightly up. That's because my player's center is not exactly uh, the same as, you know, the, uh, Sorry, this is fine too. My player's center is here, right? And the platform is here. So normally what we want to do is, we want the camera slightly lower. That way the character is in the middle of the screen. Here, if I look at the screen, I see a lot of this empty space at the bottom. Normally you don't see that kind of thing, right? Like you see the floor and the character, so you see the half, upper half, not the bottom half, right? Um, in most cases at least. So what we'll do is we'll just move the camera a little bit like this. That way my character is like somewhere roughly speaking in the center of the screen. So in this case, you can even switch to the game view and make this change. So you can adjust this value. So, so now it will look more like a platformer where there is a floor at the bottom and my character is there and I see like 70% the top of the screen and 30% the bottom of the screen, something like that, right? So you see, like, this is not an absolute value, it's like 1.4 or something, right? So, so you'll get, once you start playing around with these numbers, you, you'll get to see what, what feels right. Uh, cool, so let's just quickly hit play. And now see, now the character is running. I have a much, much better view of the character, but it still does that floaty falling thing. So you can play around with the rigid body values and actually, uh, you know, jump. But 
even now you see there's a weird um, um, like in this particular scenario where my camera is right now i don't know where my next level is right like is it like above me is it below me i don't see too far ahead right so these are kind of the things that you need to worry about when you're creating a really good game right like i can leave this as it is but my players will be like what the fuck is this right like like i don't know where i have to go it feels like if i jump here i'll just die because there's nothing here right so we want to create levels where we understand um that how these different things are right like what is my camera size so that at any point in time i can actually see uh, where my platforms are where my levels are otherwise my players would be like i don't even know whether i should jump or fall or what right so okay now i see it i see the one on the left so i can understand that i need to jump in order to go to that particular platform right but um but like when i'm looking down i don't know so those are the kind of things you need to keep in consideration when creating a level and that's what makes a level sort of differentiate from like a great level to a mediocre level all right cool so for now we we'll just go okay so now we have this thing but here i can keep going up keep going up and then just fall somewhere flat down right so we'll look into some fixes later on this particular thing um like the falling part as well um, but that's kind of like more of the uh design of how you can design things better um uh, coding wise everything is functional but is it a fun game probably not right like this weird animation kind of stops so you need to make sure that uh the jump animation has these two pieces right so there is like going up piece and then the falling down piece so you need to make sure um when we are tweaking this animation that these two should be two separate animations it shouldn't be one right now we created the full jump animation as one animation but if you want better control you should have them as two separate animation one is jump going up one is jump going down so if you change the value of just coming down you can make the animation coming down smaller and not have to worry about the animation going up so those are kind of like once you start getting into the polishing of games right like uh, how to make it ready for release and launch it like on an asset store or something like that right that's when you'll start thinking about a lot of these kind of details uh i could so one thing we discussed was like this weird jittery thing sometimes the player goes in the back sometimes it goes in the front let's see if we can address that aspect um are you guys hearing the the construction noise behind me uh, can you guys hear that okay sorry about that um sunday so office has some construction work going on um i don't think uh, okay it's good for right, cool um all right um we, yeah so what was the thing that you done ah yeah the layer thing oh, sorry so let's see how we can address this issue where the character just kind of flickers back and forth right so if i look here um you see there is a sorting layer uh, so my player is at zero layer and my ground if i click on the ground tile map is also on the zero layer so i want to make sure that my player is always in front my walls are still behind it so i can actually see the player um if i actually show this in the inspector if i take the player and quickly drag it around right like here it's going behind uh, in some cases it might come in front so in order to make it consistent i like very much how we controlled the layers between this two right like we said this to be minus 1 this to be 0 i can either keep the player at layer 0 change change this to be minus 1 change this to be minus 2 something like that but like a quicker thing is to change this to be plus 1 so this way my player will always be in front so now you see the player is in front of this because i it just increased its value to 1 so 
hopefully now that since both of them are not in the same layer right earlier the ground layer and the uh, the player layer uh, they were both on zero so if, if when the collision happens between the two since they are both on the same layer unity just has to arbitrarily decide which one it wants to show in the front and which one it wants to show in the back right so sometimes that arbitrary coin toss it's a 50-50 right so sometimes it will come in the front sometimes it will come in the back and you'll see this kind of weird flick flickering happening now you'll see that it's always um uh, on top right the character never goes back um same thing if you ever go somewhere else you'll never be sort of in the back right like here also if you see the character fall down forever and ever uh, but it will always remain in front so we fix that layering problem okay i think we can remove this platform we don't need this anymore all right cool so now we'll create a very simple script that lets us um, that lets us basically define that hey this is a level so now we're going to logically think about um, i'm not in intentionally covering a lot of like the polishing level details because i want you guys to kind of go in and play around and get comfortable with this and covering a lot of the things that usually like you know um, online tutorials that you find will not sort of explain it to you um, so i want to uh you know take you through those things essentially right like so we covered the tile map if you're running into any issues of course just use the discord channel um but also do like a quick google search because there's so many tutorials available on tile maps right so instead what i want to uh, spend a little bit time on is that now we have defined this level but what really makes it a level right um of course you you might add in some enemies etc and we'll look into adding those uh, details in the next class uh, some obstacles enemies things like that right um so what i want to say is that here where my player is that's the start of a level okay but here if i move uh, just i'm going to position the player here so once my player reaches here that means he's finished the level right but how do we even say like what does it mean that it is the player has finished the level and uh, what does it mean that the player has started the level how do we control these things how do we figure out when the level has started when the level has finished things like that right because next week our job would be to kind of go in and create um, sort of full on levels for this particular game okay so theoretically if you think about it right like if i have to define logically what it means to you know uh, uh, start a level and finish a level uh, for a 2d platformer game it just means that i've completed some objective and that objective could be reaching the end of the level or like picking all the items that like or collecting a key something like that right um, that's based on what my design is for us uh assume the goal is to that we want the player to reach at this particular point okay so now how will we track this information um uh that the player has reached this particular position and now this particular level is complete right any any thoughts or suggestions on how do you think we can go about defining or tracking what when does the player finish this level etc anything like that any suggestions thoughts i just feel free to unmute your uh, mic uh, if you have any questions to ask in between as well or if you have any any sort of uh, uh, suggestions so so yeah um, any thoughts on how we can based on all the tools that we have used so far how we can actually think about uh, saying that my player has reached this particular point in the level and now this level is over or it's like this level has finished okay yeah so so that's one way to think about when the player has collided with the wall but then remember like we are creating um pretty much everything with this particular wall itself right so while yes uh, you're on the right track thinking about it from a collision perspective uh, but maybe we don't want it to be a collision with a wall right because this is also a wall 
Uh, this is a floor, but using the same assets because obviously we don't want a lot of artwork, uh, which will make our increase size go increase. Uh, maybe a colliding with another game object, flag or a collision. Right. So something on those lines. Right. So you guys are correct. Um, so what we'll do is we'll define something, and once the player collides with it, that lets us uh, uh, say that okay, this level is complete. Okay. So what we'll do is we'll create an empty game object and we'll call this uh, level complete. Just for us to know that, you know, this is an object that deals with level completion, right? You can name it pretty much anything, but obviously. Okay, so we'll add in a box collider 2D. Don't need anything super fancy. And I'll move the player back uh, at the starting position. And I'm gonna say, Take this object and put it here. So this is like my um, this is like my finishing position, right? Like I would have a flag or something, an image uh, to show it's a flag. But for now, I'm just gonna mark it. I'm gonna just keep it as a box collider. And the important thing we'll do is, so far we've pretty much had every. If you look at every collision that we have, we do not use this is trigger thing, right? We I think we discussed this briefly in um the first class but i'll just quickly go over it again so basically um if we like the wall has a collider as well right but i my player cannot pass through the wall now this is an invisible thing i want my player to reach here but not just like randomly get collided with something in the middle of you know which is invisible and and get stuck there, right so it's like I don't want to create an invisible sort of a blocker for the player so I'm gonna mark this as is triggered so what this lets us do is it lets us detect all the collision but it lets other physics objects pass through it as well so it doesn't stop um, the player like a wall or a ground does but it still detects all the collisions so that's why it's called a trigger basically anything that comes in contact with it will generate a trigger condition um, like a collision condition uh, but it will not block other objects okay so this is important for pretty much anything uh, that you want to track okay so so let's say if i was showing like a, a um, i'm just trying to think so yeah so if you think about any game which if you are finishing a level and the level is long you Anytime the player dies, you don't want the player to just go all the way to the start, right? Like you have those checkpoints in the game, right? So you could have, uh, you would rename this object as a checkpoint. Uh, of course, you'll need to create some script on it as well and add some logic there. But logically, you could place these along the way um, and these would become your checkpoints, right? So if I uh, had one here, had one here, had one here, so so imagine if I had one here and the player is trying to jump, he falls down because he can't see the level or something, he has to make this jump. Then I can see that the player crossed this last trigger here, right? So maybe there, at the edge of every platform, there is a trigger placed, just for convenience. And that trigger acts as a checkpoint for us. So we know which checkpoint the last, uh, the player last crossed, right? And that way, us, we can track that if the player suddenly dies at this particular point, we don't want to take him all the way back and make him go through all the level again. We just take him back to the last checkpoint, right? So the same strategy we'll use for checkpoints or um, detecting any kind of, you know, uh, like invisible condition that we want to track, but the player shouldn't necessarily know about it. Some cases the player might know about it if the checkpoint is like a, like a flag that you're picking up, maybe there is an actual image of a flag there. So, so that way they know that, okay, I'm at this checkpoint. So if I die, I'll just respawn there. So it's up to what the game is. But the idea is that you'll track them through these invisible triggers. And that way you can track um, how my player is progressing through the levels, right? Any kind of game that you can think of, like a racing game, right? Like if you, uh, uh, racing games have like this track kind of a thing, right? If you're making the, the cut, correctly things like that so they'll have like an invisible trigger there and track with, did you uh, 
uh, when you're moving through it, did you touch this trigger or not? If you did touch this, that means you're taking the right line and they'll give you a boost. So any of the game that you've played, you think about uh, how did the game know that I did this, right? Or I went from here to here or I jumped at the right point, right? Anything that's invisible, right? They'd be using this kind of functionality. They'll have an uh, invisible trigger there that will let you control this. Okay. Cool. So what we'll do is um, we have this level complete and in the scripts folder, I'm going to create a new script now and we're going to call it a level controller. Okay. So this will let me control the flow of the level. Okay. And we'll add more functionality down the road to it. So I'm going to just delete this. Uh, code that Unity creates by default because I don't need them in every class. So now we have this level controller and what we'll do is um, uh, we'll define uh, uh, Do I want it? Uh, let me think how we want it. Okay, so we'll define uh, um, Actually, let's call it level over controller just to be exactly specific that this is related to level over and we look into um, another script next week for that this will be it's named much cleaner that way I know exactly what this is and so we're going to use exactly the same strategy that we used last time I know a level over controller will be on the game object that has that uh, trigger so I'm gonna uh, I don't even need this. So I'll basically just do void um, and the, I'm going to use a new unity function. So I remember if uh, uh, last time when we were debugging our player controller that why is it not colliding, we added this on collision enter function and we put in a deeper log to show us which object is my player colliding with, right? So this will get triggered when my object has a collision collider on it. And the is trigger flag is not set, right? It's set to false. But in this case, my is trigger is ticked, right? So I have to search for trigger related functions. So here you'll see that uh, on a very similar pattern, how we had um, three collision functions like enter, stay, and exit, we have exactly the same functions for. Uh, trigger the first three ones are related to 3d the second three ones are related to 2d so we'll use the on trigger enter 2d because as soon as my player enters that collision i want to make sure my level is complete okay so here i'm going to say if collision which is nothing but this object that unity is passing to me i'm going to say if collision dot game object now this is the game object that my current object has collided with. Okay, so I want to make sure that if there are enemies also walking on on it, then I don't trigger accidentally a level over condition if my enemy collided with it, right? Or if uh, if I shot a gun and that gun's uh, bullet collided with this, then I don't want to trigger accidentally that the level got over because something collided with this. I only want to trigger when my player collided with it. So I'm gonna first check what that, the collision that is happening right now, is it with the player or not, right? So normally uh, what you will see is, you'll see uh, people using something like, I don't know if you've seen any YouTube tutorial, etc., like this, but you'll see something play, people do this, where they'll say that, uh, actually I'm gonna uh, shorten it it further down if there will be a compare tag function right so collision which means the object that i'm colliding with it's game object and what if is it tag is it its tag is the player then i'm gonna say that my level is over because my player has reached the end of the level right so i'm gonna put in a quick debug log just to detect um level finished by the player okay so this is usually how you will see um, uh, programmers and other engineers do this and if you look at any youtube tutorials they'll do this but we'll not do this why because it's 
not the best way of doing things. So what I want you to do instead is, if you remember here, we were saying game object or get component rigid body 2D, right? Like we were getting uh, the rigid body 2D component and then using that rigid body 2D component, we were applying force on it, right? So now I know that my player has this script player controller attached to it, right? So instead of checking for a tag, I'm gonna actually check if it has a, similarly, if it has a game object, like a, the player script attached, because I can accidentally add a tag to something else as a player, but only my player will have the player controller. So exactly the same thing, I'm gonna call get component. And, but in this case, I'm gonna say player controller. Okay, so it's the same thing, game object or get component, player controller. I'm trying to see if the object that I'm colliding with, does it have a player controller script attached to it? If this is not equal to null, which means that yes, there is a component called player controller attached to the other game object, then I'm gonna uh, mark this level as done and I'm gonna use this message, okay? Uh, are you guys familiar with the tags? Did, did I cover that briefly or I think I did. Uh, just remind me in case I haven't. Did we talk about it? Yes, no? I think last time we did, right? But anyways, um, if you don't remember, so you can actually see that Unity has this inbuilt way where we can actually tag uh, any, any game object uh, with like any string, basically. So you can create your own tags. These are all the uh, custom tags that are set up in our thing. So we can tag things like this. We can tag them as a player, but nothing is really stopping another programmer on your team on going and saying grid and this grid is also tagged as a player. I mean, this could be done accidentally or intentionally. Either ways, it will cause a bug in the game, right? Because this is something that's hidden away, super small thing, right? Like something, somebody comes in accidentally creates this and tags it as respawn or tags it as player, right? So this usually leads to a lot of bugs. Um, and these bugs are very hard to find as well. So instead, what you want to do is, you want to be using foolproof condition. Foolproof condition for detecting a player is that it will have a player controller script attached to it, right? So all of these things that you see here are nothing but components like we discussed in the first class, right? So even my player controller is a component. So if I collide with an extra object at the end uh, here, then that object uh, is getting access to this player object that if the player has collided with it, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna attach that level over controller script here that we just created on this particular object, okay? Now, anytime my player comes in contact with this, Unity will give me a reference to the object that I'm colliding with. I'm gonna check if that particular thing has a player controller. That means the player has reached the end of the level. And I'm gonna put this, for now I'm just gonna put this log message, which says that the player has reached the end of the level and the level is over. Um, next class we'll look into creating multiple levels and then transitioning from this level into the next level once this level completes and things like that, right? Uh, today we wanted to define what exactly this, saying that this is the start of the level, this is the end of the level, what does that actually mean, right? All right, cool, so let's quickly test this out. I'm just gonna, just for the sake of testing, I'm gonna move my player closer to here. So every time you want to test something, it doesn't take us forever to reach the end of the level. Uh, and it just makes our life easier to test. Okay, so I'm gonna jump. I'm gonna land here. Uh, let me move this particular thing here so I can see both of them together. Let's see. So my level object is there. Here I can see the debug log message that's available in the controller. I'm just gonna clear this. And the moment I go right and touch that object, 
you'll see a message show up that says level finished by the player. Okay, so if I have another object um, that accidentally falls here or it's overlapping with this, since it will never have the player controller script on it, um, you know, there will be very less chances of causing bugs uh, that are hard to find. That's why we're using this and not using anything related to tags. Okay, cool. So, is any, any questions so far? Um, yes, no. Uh, just put that in the chat, please. Um, that was predominantly uh, what we wanted to cover today. Um, so, we looked at setting up a basic level through a tile map, of course. Uh, I've created an ugly as hell uh, level. Uh, hopefully, you guys will do a better job at creating a much better level that's actually fun. Um, and uh, also um, looked into uh, creating a basic jump animation as well as um, defining what a level start and end is. So, very similar to how we have a level complete, we could actually, you know, uh, duplicate this game object in, and let's say call it level start right so this is like level start and i'll remove the script because obviously we'll have to create a separate script for level start uh remove this component on it and say move it like here right so now then i'm in the next session when we look at how we can actually transition the player from one level to the next level we can look at how we can you know uh detect where the start of the level is, where the end of the level is, and things like that. Cool, all good so far. Um, let me just quickly switch back to Trello. Yeah, so we wanted to do actual movement. We added the left, right, jump. Um, left, right was through simple movement, jump was through physics. Then we looked at the tile map system, creating a simple platform, and uh, using the same flow, we created a, a complex hierarchy of objects, looked at different layers and then created an actual level that we can go around and play. Right now, of course, this level doesn't have any enemies and things like that, but for that, we'll have to add more animations, add more, um, you know, add more uh, uh, behaviors to enemy, enemies. Some enemies might be moving, some enemies might be static. So we'll look, start looking into those um, pieces in the next ongoing classes. Cool so far. So your task for this week is, of course, to re-implement all the functionality that we just looked at. Uh, start playing around with the tile map and actually create a much uh, smoother uh, jump slash uh, you know movement mechanic and make the character move through this and be able to detect that the player has reached the end of the level of things like that. Right. Um, one extra thing that we didn't cover is we briefly touched about the uh, the, the checkpoint thing, right? Similarly, what I want you to do is you detect a, a, a death condition, basically. Uh, so what that means is that remember when our character fell down through the platform, it would just keep falling infinitely, right? So what you want to do is you want to create a new game object and put a huge collider under it, say somewhere, you know, here, right, something like this, which is at the very bottom of the screen. That way, the moment player touches this collider, that means your player has fallen through the crack and will keep infinitely falling if we don't do anything about it. And now we want to re restart the full level because the player has fallen down, right? So, uh, similar to how we created the level complete condition you will use the level falling condition and go back to the first session where we looked at uh, how to uh, uh, how to load a scene since everything here is in the start scene so the moment you detect a collision with that particular layer you want to restart the full scene and and the player will again start at the, the starting of the screen and start playing again right so you want to detect that death condition and um, and restart the level on top of it so this is sort of like a, um, a bonus exercise which uses the concepts that we covered today as well as the concept that we have talked about before on how to uh, load a scene. In this case, all you're doing is loading the current scene again. 
So it basically kind of resets everything up instead of usually thinking about going from one level to the next level, um, going from one scene to the next scene. We're going to say we are going from this scene to the scene itself. So we are resetting the entire scene and loading it fresh. Okay. So this is kind of like a bonus for, for you know, you to apply the same concepts that we have learned, but in a new context. All right. Cool. So hopefully, um, it was an interesting, engaging thing. Um, I'll share the Trello board with you guys. Yeah, I haven't shared it yet. I'll go ahead and share this after the session. Okay, um, so I'll just switch to Trello. So today what we're gonna do is we're gonna basically focus on uh, building up on the game that we started last uh, couple of weeks that we've been working on, right? So what we'll do is we'll start adding new enemies, um, new items, things that the actual player can interact with, etc., etc., and we'll see how we can implement these into our game. So if we move back to Trello, okay, let's just check what's the first thing. So we have to add some items that the player can pick up to get some score. Okay. So let's switch back. So last time, if you remember, we implemented this basic level, right? So we have this. I'll uh, just need rename it to level and inside the level we'll move this level complete level start as two specific things we'll move it inside this so that it's easier for us to manage so now this is our full level if you move the level around the entire thing moves with it right so what we'll do today is we we'll basically uh, start with adding some items into this level that the player can pick up and we can give them um, some score for it, or if it's a negative, like a destructive item, then you know, decide what we want to do with it. So, first thing first, we want to figure out how. So, uh, remember last time how we discussed about the level complete and level start thing? So, we'll do something very similar where we will create items that will have colliders on them, uh, and when the player collides with them, um, we'll will let the player know that you have picked up this item, right? And then the player can do whatever they want with that item after that. It's, uh, and, and obviously we can remove that item uh, from the game. So, so let's look at some hard assets first. If we have uh, some assets or some interactable items that we can use, uh, let me check. Uh, so we have some enemies, key. What is this key? Okay, so there's some spinning key, I guess, in the game. So we can go in and create an animation for it, etc. For now, I'm just going to use a placeholder, which will basically uh, indicate this. Uh, much like how we create an animation for the player, you can create an animation for this as well. So I'm going to create an empty object. I'm going to call it a key. And if we have it to key, position it just to be at 0, 0, 0, so, and then we can hit a mobile now. Now, what we will do is we'll take the zeroth, this uh, first, oh, sorry, one sec, move my mouse. So we'll take this first um, image and we'll just, uh, not just drag it, we'll first attach a sprite render to it. And on the sprite render, we can actually drag this in. And now if I double click, the key shows up in the game, right? So, uh, let me move my player next to the key so I can even see it in the game view. Uh, yeah, so if I move the player here, here you see that the key is right next to my player. I'm just going to increase the key a little bit in size so it's clearly visible. And I'm going to just set it to double the uh, size for now, just for simplicity's sake. Okay, so now we have the key. If you wanted to add a quick animation on it, we can do the same process that we did for uh, this, but you can go in and create that um, yourself. That's not, should be familiar with uh, how to go in and create animations by now, because you've done the same thing for all the players as well, right? All right, cool. So, so now we have this key, but right now it just is, it looks like a key, it doesn't like interact with anything like so for that to happen, we will uh, go in and again search for a collider. And in this case, we just want a simple collider around it. So we just create a box collider. 
and make sure okay so now this box slider you can see is huge so we'll just go in and edit its size down a little bit just so that you can make sure that the player is colliding with the key itself and that should be good okay so so this is a basic key we'll turn this much like before into a prefab so i'm gonna create a new folder call it items so if you have keys doors locks whatnot so we can put all the prefab inside here and now this is an uh, we can reuse this in in other levels as well so i've created this key i've added it in and i'm gonna just move this key slightly further away from the player let's say here okay so now i have this key again i'm gonna do this i'm gonna move this key under the level so that now it's part of my level right so if i disable the level then that thing goes away along with the key as well right so so now i have my level and here's my key so what we will do is now what we want to do is basically detect when the player collides with this particular key okay so in this case what we will do is we will create so so think about this when a player collides with the key what do we want to have right we want the key to get disabled uh, because it's like um, the key is visible once the player picks it up it uh, gets removed and then um, uh, once it gets removed you know the player can either get a score for it or something uh, relevant can happen okay so first we'll create a, a new script we'll call it uh, key controller okay uh, since this represents the key so we'll call it key controller we'll remove everything from here now this key controller needs to have a um, a collision that needs to happen right so in this case what we will implement is on uh, collision enter so we want to detect as soon as a collision starts right so in this case what we will do is we'll do collision um, dot game object so we'll check uh, the game object and on that game object we'll say get component remember how we find components that are attached to a specific game object and in this case remember we are interested in colliding with the player right so you want to make sure that we are detecting um, a collision with the player itself and not with anybody else so if you have bullets flying around if you have enemies also walking across the same platform then you don't want your uh, you don't want your uh, uh, key to get picked up accidentally by the enemy you only want your player to pick it up right so now what we'll do is we'll say it's not equal to null that means that the object that we just collided with that object basically has uh, uh, a player controller uh, component on it so in that case um, if it has a player controller that means it's a player right so now i can actually uh, go in and do my uh, logic to make sure that uh, you know whatever needs to happen after i pick up the key is is now within this if block right so here what we will do is we will basically say um, sorry not collision we will basically get the reference of the player controller so we'll say player controller player controller uh, is equal to same thing again collision uh, so we know it's not null that means there is a player controller attached to that particular thing sorry uh, get component and player controller now once we get this player controller on this player controller we're going to call a special function so since this is about uh, pick up uh, key so so now here you can see that we're trying to call a function on the player it says pick up key right and uh, the compiler or visual studio here tells us that this function does not exist so what we'll do is we'll quickly say generate this method because we want to implement this method in our player controller so now you see that thing disappeared i'm going to just use command b 
sorry, that command B as a shortcut, but if I just press the command, or on your case, it will be, um, if it's a Windows machine, then it will be control. Uh, and then you see that it has implemented this function, right? Um, don't worry about internal. Basically, you can just change it to public for now. Okay. Cool. So uh, now, what do we want inside the player? When we pick up a key, we want the player to get some score, right? So here, I'm just gonna for now put a debug log message. Say, player picked up the key, and inside here, I'm gonna go back. I'm gonna say player controller. Uh, pick up the key and then I'm gonna uh, destroy myself because basically uh, all it is doing is say, saying like hey the key has been picked up it shouldn't get picked up multiple times so once it's picked up we just destroy the, the key itself okay so destroy game object now remember here what we want to do is here we got the player controller from the, so if this is the key, this is the player, um, the collision dot game object gives me this object, right? Just saying game object inside a more media, it gives me my own game object. So we want to destroy myself, but we want to pass a message uh, by calling this function pickup key to the player saying that, hey, you just picked up this key, okay? Cool. So what we'll do is, um, yeah, we'll just test this first, make sure everything looks good. Um, so if I go to key, I have to attach the key controller script onto it. And now if I'm just going to move the key here so that it's like at the edge of this platform, just hit play uh, and let's make sure that everything's working. So now I have my player, I start running, and the key disappears. I get two messages, uh, so one message, player picked up the key. And now I can see that the key has disappeared because I uh, disabled the key, right? Or rather, I destroyed the key, not disabled it. Okay, cool. So, so this is how we'll typically uh, implement any kind of interactable objects. So you'll always check that you're colliding with uh, an object, and uh, when you're colliding with that object, that object, that object has a certain thing attached to it, which identifies it as a specific thing. So, if an enemy, if this was like say a gun, right? An enemy can also pick a gun. A player can also pick a gun. In that case, you'll be checking for uh, get component player controller or get component enemy controller, and if either of those two is not null, then you basically do the corresponding behavior function for it. So this is how typically how the, uh, how this particular flow will work, all right? Okay, so now let's quickly switch back to Trello and see. So we added an item that we can uh, pick, but now we want to show a score for it, right? So, so say these, each of these keys is supposed to increment uh, it's supposed to give a player score, like if they're like gems or keys or whatever, right? All right, so for that to happen, what we would do is we'll, so now we're talking about uh, if showing the score as well on the UI. So first we'll click go to UI and we'll say Text Mesh Pro. Uh, so Text Mesh Pro is nothing but a better version of text that uh, Unity provides. So always use kind of Text Mesh Pro, all right? Uh, just don't use the default Unity text version. It's just pretty bad in general. So I'm going to rename this uh, text object to um, score. Okay. So right now it says this uh, new text. I'm going to change this to say score zero. Now what I want to do is I I'm just going to talk to here. I'm going to zoom out. And as you can see, this is like a huge thing. And actually, down here is the actual, uh, if you look at the player and all, the actual level is all here. But like my canvas, which shows the entire screen, is here. So there are two different things. One's just UI, one's the actual game. They don't obstruct each other, don't uh, collide with each other or anything. So uh, don't worry if they're like typically located in different places and look like one is huge, one is small. Uh, it doesn't matter because. Um, your UI is being looked at by the canvas, as we have discussed before, 
and uh, your player and level are being looked by the camera uh, and they need to be of relatively the same size right so in this case now i want my score to always be at the center of the screen at the very top right so i'm gonna go back up here and i'm gonna align my uh, uh, thing to be here okay so now using this option i always have the score uh, centered aligned with respect to the top so if i switch to my game view you'll see the score out there i'm going to just change the color a little bit as well to make it not look ugly so i'm going to have it as black text for now okay so what we want is now this score should basically be updated every time i pick up a key right okay so how will we make that happen so first we'll implement a uh, another script which will basically be managing this score so we'll say create new script and now we'll call it score controller okay so the score object will basically have will basically attach the scroll controller here directly so now you have the scroll controller attached to the uh, object on which we have the uh, we have the score object right so we'll just double click open the score controller and now here we'll implement a couple of functions so first of all we want to make sure that uh, text mesh uh, Sorry, what's this particular text mesh pro UGUI, right? So I think we need to import a uh, uh, different namespace, uh, TM pro, yeah, and then we will have text mesh pro UGUI, right? So this is my score text. So this is the private, uh, so this is the component that's available on the, uh, on the score, right? So what we will do is now, inside my awake as you have done before you will make sure that we are finding this particular thing um, so again get a component and text mesh provo you go this is the component that we attached right and this component has this if i switch back to it and show you um, so on the score object you see this uh, i'll minimize this sense so you have this text mesh pro you um, uh, component that unity has built for us right like it's also a script see so it says script here which means it's actually a script very much like how we are creating these scripts just that the script is something that unity has created for us right so it has this extra thing called text so whatever text you put in here that's the text that this component will show on the screen so by default we want to start it with zero and after that we keep adding value to it right no, sorry okay so this is one and then we'll implement add in another thing called uh, private int score so this will be the actual value of score okay so we'll say uh, when the game starts we want obviously the score to be zero and now we'll implement a function where we'll say public uh, void increase uh, score and take in a integer value as to how much uh, score we want to increase it with, right? Uh, increment. Okay, so what this will do is every time we call this function, we will add, uh, we'll add a score uh, will increment the value of the score with this new number that we want, right? So if a key, uh, a specific key gives us 10 score, um, then I'll call this function with 10. If another key gives me 20, then I'll call this function with 20, right? So, so now what we will do is we'll basically say score plus equal to increment. And then um, I want to update uh, score on the UI as well, right? So uh, we'll call refresh, uh, UI and this will basically be a new function. Okay, so I'm just going to use a shortcut and just say create this method for me because I want to implement this new method. Now, this score text that we created above, or rather, it is another component that we found. Um, if I 
press start, you'll see there is a property called text. Now this text is nothing but a string and the string is exactly what you see here, right? This, this is the text, right? So you can access these other properties, alignment, spacing, etc. But for now, we'll just change the text and you can go in and change these. You can make the text bold, change the style, etc. You can do a lot of those things as well. So if I make this bold, bold italics, you can do everything uh, that you want. You can make it small, things like that. I can make the entire thing capitalized as well. So all of these things you can control through uh, your score text object as well, all right? But for now, I'm just gonna change. Uh, I'm just gonna change the actual score value, okay? So now my entire thing up there on, on the text field says score, colon, the actual value of score. So in this case, I'm gonna say score, colon, and actual value of uh, score, which is basically nothing but stored in this local variable called score, right? So every time my score increases, I call this function, which nothing does one line, which is basically just uh, refreshes the UI. So it just updates the new value of score on the screen. So when the game starts, or whether, uh, not when it starts, but rather when the object gets created, I want to make sure that there is no old score value or anything like that. So I'm just going to call it refresh UI. Uh, the very first time the object gets visible on the screen, in that case, the score will always be zero. And in that case, I'll always make sure that I'm showing score is equal to zero. So if I'm restarting the level, I don't accidentally see some old score value, which is incorrect. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. All right, cool. So what we'll do next is basically once we have the score variable, um, sorry, once we have the score controller, um, inside my player object, uh, I want my player to increment the score. So in this case, I'll create a, uh, sorry, I'll create a public uh, score controller, score controller object. And now uh, I'm gonna, whenever a key gets picked up, I'm gonna call a function on score controller, which will say increase score. And let's say this key gives us a score of 10. So I'm gonna do 10 and then um, um, this will basically take care of rest of okay? So now what we will do is inside my player, now, because I created an, another public variable, now you see this score called controller show up here, which basically right now says none because I haven't given it what, uh, where is the score controller, right? So typically, if you have seen in other places, uh, we did this get component on the game object, right? Uh, because we knew that it's currently attached to the current game object. But in this case, we don't know which game object the score controller is attached to. So in this case, that's why you have to manually drag it in because this could be on another game object, etc. So we don't know yet, right? So we're gonna apply the changes to the prefab. And now if I hit play, uh, and when I pick the key up, you'll see the score go up. So you see the awake function getting called. Now if I go right, 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 and there you go. So you got the message, player picked up the key. Uh, so the key told the player that, hey, this key was picked up. The player told the score that, hey, I just picked up a key, so increase my score, right? All right, cool. So, so hopefully this connects all the, all the things. Now, if even I created, say, um, so inside the level, I have my key, right? So imagine if I just readjust my level a little bit, so I have my key here. I'm gonna create a duplicate. So the shortcut for duplicate is Control D, and it just creates whatever is the object that you have selected, creates a duplicate copy of it. So I'm gonna have two keys now, one on the left, one on the right, just to see that actually my entire logic works irrespective of how many keys I have, okay? So I'm gonna hit play. And so when I move to the right, my score is going to increase to 10 and bam, bam, right? I picked up and now the key is gone. And here also you can see that we had a key object because we're destroying the object. 
the, the key object itself is not. And now we have just this key object, which is the one on the left that you see. And the moment I hit it, uh, so you got the message player picked up the key. You'll get another message saying player picked up the key. And now uh, even that key object is gone because we've destroyed it. But you can see that the score value has increased to 20. Okay, so hopefully that's clear. So now we've added score. Um, similarly, now we're gonna quickly add in a basic enemy as well. So very similar to how we added uh, a, a you know a key and a key can interact uh, with the player uh, in a very similar fashion. We'll create a enemy that interacts with the player. So first we'll create a. So in this case, I'm just gonna. Delete first this delete um, because I didn't need that. I just have one key. I'm going to create an empty game object and I'm going to call it enemy. Okay. All right. So now my object is an enemy. I'm going to just position it onto the next platform and I'm going to check which enemy I want to create. So I'll look into my assets folder uh, under sprites. This is VFX, animated sprites, enemies. So we have a bunch of enemies. Um, so we have a chomper, a gunner, a spitter. We're just gonna pick the first one, chomper. And in the idle, we have the first one. Let's see how chomper looks. All right, eh, it looks like a cute alien. All right, cool. So what we'll do is we'll basically quickly go and create an enemy. I'm not gonna create a... a animations for these you guys can go ahead and create that on your own because pretty much the process of creating these animations is very same as what we did uh, for the plan so i'm just going to create an image uh, sorry not image sprite i'm going to create an sprite printer again i'm going to take the jumper i'm going to drop it in now i have my jumper kit so since the chomper is like floating in the air, I want him to be on the ground and not in the air. All right, cool. So I'm just gonna close this out. And here I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna add in again a glider to the box glider to the end. In this case, I'm gonna make sure, okay, so it looks huge. Uh, so I'm gonna edit it. I can hold the... And let me undo one sec. I can hold the Alt key. Uh, get rid of this. Okay, I'm just gonna edit this so that my collider fits the size of this. Very much how we did for the key as well, right? So I'm just gonna edit this quickly, and I'm gonna touch it to the body. It's like not this kind of uh, top. Uh, so it's just enough for the body, okay? I'm gonna turn, do it like this. All right, cool. So now we have an enemy. I'm gonna again create a prefab out of it. So I'm gonna create a new folder. Uh, folder enemies. Since you have multiple enemies, I'm just gonna call it enemies and I'm gonna create this here. So now we have a prefab for enemy. Now what we'll do is uh, I think on the key, yeah, we attached this. So we'll just save the key prefab as well. And now for the enemy also, we'll create a new script. In this case, as you might have guessed, it, I'm gonna call it enemy controller. Uh, we're gonna attach this enemy controller onto our enemy object. So we're just gonna do this, minimize this, and drag in the enemy controller script. So now we have the basic enemy. Script, save the enemy prefab and double click to open the script. All right, so we have our enemy controller, very similar process. Uh, we want to detect when a collision happens with this particular thing. So I'm just going to quickly, uh, in the interest of time, quickly copy a similar piece of code from the key as well. So I'm just going to copy this base function switch over to enemy controller, paste it in. Because again, even for the enemy, we are trying to detect um, that the enemy collided with not another enemy, uh, but an actual player, right? So they use the same, sorry, they use the same logic uh, in the way we used, uh, the way we did for the key. 
But in this case, of course, I don't want to call this pickup key function. I'm going to say um, uh, kill enemy or kill player. I'm going to create a new function uh, on the player and say kill player if my enemy collided with the player. Right? I in this case, I don't want my enemy to be destroyed. Right? Um, then I pick up a key. I want nobody else to pick that key up and it should not be visible on the screen. So I was destroying that object. But here, I don't want the enemy to get destroyed. I want the player to get destroyed, right? So in this case, what we will do is we'll remove that destroy function. And instead, we'll basically add in the new uh, function called kill player. So in this case, my enemy will let the player know, hey, you just hit an enemy. I have to uh, basically die. Okay? So in this case, I'm going to add in again a a uh, quick first debug clock to make sure that all my functions are getting called uh, player killed by enemy. Okay, so now what will I do is in this case I want my player to get destroyed, right? So I'm gonna say destroy object. In this, we are talking about right now we are doing, adding this to the player control. So, uh, so when I say game object, right now it's referring to the player game object, right? Again, uh, internal is, don't worry about it, just change it to public. For now, it's the same as public, um, but restricts it as slightly to a lower scope. Okay, so now we have this basic enemy that's sitting around on this level. Uh, if we run this, it will do exactly the same thing that we expect. It will basically uh, destroy the player. So let's just make sure we test it out quickly. So I go in and I jump. Oh, sorry, but now uh, let me play again. This time I'll try to jump higher. Yeah, so here what happened is that uh, my player got destroyed, but the issue now is that because my camera was attached to the player, the camera also got destroyed, right? So here, if you see, the player object got destroyed and there's no camera in the game. And that's why you see, um, if you, this was running on an actual device, you'll see a black screen, right? Here, uh, Unity tells us that there is no camera that is uh, looking at the screen, so it doesn't know what to show on the screen. So it's giving us this helpful information. So we gotta fix this. So we have this player and we have this main camera, but it was under, the particular player, right? So we don't want the camera to get destroyed. Uh, we only want the player to uh, player to die, basically, right? So in this case, what we will do is instead of directly calling destroy, either we remove the camera from here, right? That's one solution. Either we remove the camera from here, or we call uh, we do something else so that it's not getting destroyed. So a uh, Ideally, we don't ever do this kind of a behavior where we directly destroy the player, but it's more like we will play uh, the death animation, right? So remember, in, when we are looking at all the different animations, assets, art assets that we have. So if I look at 2D uh, game kit, I'm gonna manage this. I'm gonna see Alan animations. There should be a death animation as well. Yeah. So here's this death animation, right? And if we check this, you'll see the character kind of jump and then fall to the ground kind of thing, right? So ideally we'll play this animation and not really destroy the player. And that that's typically how usually, uh, how, how games typically flow, right? Player never ideally gets destroyed. More or less you do some sort of animations um, and, and then accordingly uh, decide what to do next. So I'll first play the death animation and then after I'm gonna, so this is a bonus exercise for you guys to implement in the actual death animation. So you should have already implemented the uh, basic animations for all of them, uh, all of the states for the player. So you should start playing that death animation similar to how we were playing these animations before, right? And, uh, and after the animation is complete, you want to show a, a UI message that's saying player died or something, right? So in this case, uh, uh, 
we want the entire level to restart. So we'll just come back to what needs to happen when this player uh, dies, right? So we'll implement that as a level over condition. So let me just quickly check Trello again. So uh, we've done the score part. We added the enemy on touching it will kill the player. So whenever uh, the player dies, so we want to um, we want to restart the game over, right? The score should reset along with the score, and I'm just going to change this to say explicitly the score and the level should reset. Not just the score, but the full level should reset. So what we will do is that after we play the death animation, we will say reset the entire level. Okay. So we'll create a separate function, uh, which we'll call is uh, reload level. Okay, so I'm gonna create this new method. Sorry. All right, so what we want to do is, if you remember in the first class, we talked about the scene manager, right? Uh, the scene manager uh, basically lets us. Um, uh, so uh, I started typing scene manager because I know that's the name of the class, but here it shows an error, right? Why? Because uh, we haven't imported the correct uh, namespace where the scene manager lives, right? So I'm going to hit Alt Enter, and now Unity shows me that you are missing this particular. Uh, uh, you're missing this particular namespace where the scene manager class is, so you should add it in. So when I click this, uh, you know, the, the namespace Unity adds it in, and now this particular thing is highlighted in green, which means Unity is able, or uh, Visual Studio is able to detect that this particular scene manager is a class, right? So I'm gonna say scene manager dot uh, load scene. I want my entire scene to load again. Uh, scene and i'm gonna say so here basically you have a scene build index right now we only have one scene so i'm gonna just use zero because zero is the first index uh, in the list of all the scenes so right now we are working with only one scene right we just have this one scene in the game so we're just gonna load that scene again and when we load this thing again everything will reset right so if i want to quickly show you we'll go to file build settings and here if you see okay so right now we don't have any scenes um, what we will do is we'll say scene start i'm just going to drag it in okay so so now we have what are these deleted scenes somehow like unity is showing a bunch of deleted scenes ah these might be the original scenes that you might see so I'm going to select scenes.chart. This is the only, remember, this is the only scene that we have created so far. And this is this, uh, when we add this into this window, it says what all scenes we want into our game uh, to be present, right? Uh, and here you can see zero. This zero is nothing but the index. Um, I'm just dragged it to the top so it's easier. Uh, let me see, I'm not able to clear these out for some reason. Anyways, so the point is that um, uh, this index is zero. If we had another scene and dragged it in, it would have an index one. So for now, we're just working with uh, index zero, right? So now if I hit play, I'll touch the enemy. The enemy will ideally supposed to call the death stuff, but here it will basically see the entire thing kind of reloads. So if I want to show you, Actually, let's add a quick debug message as well uh, to make sure that we have. Right, so here I'm gonna say debug.log reloading scene zero. Okay, so I'm gonna say reloading scene zero. Clear this existing messages out. And then we do play. play. So now we'll see that every time my. Uh, so here the important thing to remember is that the entire scene 
reloads, all these objects are destroyed and recreated, right? So remember how we said that awake and start gets pulled only once. So here we have this awake function getting called, right? I'm going to disable this columns as well. So we have this awake getting called. I pick up the key, I jump and go towards the enemy. Uh, jumping higher now. It wanted to change. Did it change anything? Uh, no, I don't think so, right? Uh, I'm gonna just increase this jump to be higher so it jumps a little faster. Hmm. So it's easier for us to test it. So it Okay, now it jumps too high. Uh, right, so I'm gonna jump, and then when I fall down, when I hit the enemy, the entire thing reloads. And now, important thing to note here is see, you see the first awake message getting called? After reloading screen, the awake gets called again because all the objects have been destroyed, and even the uh, key that was initially destroyed is now back again. Why? Because we reloaded the entire scene altogether. And my score also got reset to zero, right? So if I pick up the key again, my score is 10, my key object is destroyed. But if I jump again and land on the enemy, now my uh, uh, score gets reset. I again see my reloading scene and make it. Right? So, so this is typically how you'll have uh, different types of enemies in the game where you can detect. Now imagine if you added a, a simple logic to this particular enemy, which made it move left and right across the screen, right? So you can very easily have an enemy that's moving across, and now uh, this particular enemy could be like, uh, like a patrolling enemy, right? Like that's walking along a path, turning left and right, etc. And then uh, once this enemy sort of switches, uh, you know, uh, uh, touches the player, the same thing happens. So now the player needs to intelligently avoid. Uh, so these can be just like enemies. You can have an enemy just walking always to the left. You can always have an enemy that's walking to the edge and then coming back. Things like that you can add. And all that behavior will go as part of the enemy control. Okay, good. So, so we said on player death, we want to uh, reset the entire thing. So, um, which means uh, reload the scene. Okay, so so now that we have done this basic, you know, uh, basic setup for having score, uh, showing a key. Uh, ideally, the key should be animated, right? So, so I'm just gonna make sure that you guys don't miss out. Uh, make the enemies and the keys animated because we have assets for them. They should be able to create basic animations for these very easily, right? Using the same process that we use for that. So now what we'll move on to is basically, uh, on that we need to implement a better flow, right? Like, like right now it just completely resets the entire thing and it, it isn't the best thing. So what we'll do is on the canvas, we'll implement a, uh, Empty game object. Uh, actually, that's not implement an empty game object. We'll implement a message which basically clearly tells us that our game is over. Okay. So we'll say create new uh, UI. We'll add an image, and this image, as you can see, is just like a black, uh, a white box, right? But if I search here. I think we have some assets for game over. Yeah, so we have this like fancy uh, image that says game over. Uh, there are three of them apparently. Uh, so we'll just use one of them for now. Uh, game over, game over, game over. Okay, I think these might be animating as well because you see subtle changes. So you can actually have uh, the text also animate using the same kind of thing. So, so we'll call this uh, sorry, not duplicate. I wanted to rename it, and we want to call it game over. 
right so here i'm just going to drag it in but you can do the same animation that we did for the character here as well right so i'm going to call it game over and i'm going to uh, set preserve aspect ratio because if you see closely right now this image uh, looks stretched vertically right and if you see it in the game over here also it looks vertically so you're gonna on this image uh, we're gonna tick this preserve aspect ratio so it will maintain the aspect ratio irrespective of where the entire uh, object is all right so i'm just gonna double click this now I want my game over to be at the top, um, top, right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna again position it at the top, but I'm gonna bring it down a little bit. At the very top, it looks weird. If we check, more or less. And with, so while I set up this UI, I'm just gonna disable my level, so I get a better picture of how I'm creating my uh, UI. Uh, and I want this to be even like slightly bigger right now, it's just too small. So I'm gonna set its width and height to be 200. Hmm, too weak, maybe. So 150, let's try that. Yeah, that looks good actually. So we have this game over text, which could be animating. And once I have that, I'm gonna. Uh, so for now, I'm just gonna enable like show this and add a button into it which says play again so inside i'll uh, i'll right click on game over and i'm gonna say uh ui and i'm gonna add a button okay just move this button slightly down and this button is gonna be basically a replay button or a restart button button uh, restart. So what I want to do is I want to restart the game whenever uh, I see this game over screen and I uh, replay my entire uh, uh, my entire game, right? So button restart. I'm gonna change the text to stay uh, restart. Okay. Let me check if there is an actual card assets for it. Uh, we don't have restart, replay. No. Okay, so we don't have an asset for uh, game over. Yeah, it doesn't look like we have an asset for that specifically. So we're just going to create this button. Uh, it looks a little ugly, but uh, it will first implement the functionality and then uh, see how we can actually move it. All right, so I'm going to make this button slightly because it's too small right now. Okay, so that uh, looks fine. I'm gonna go in into the text and I'm gonna change the size of the text a little bit as well. So say 20, 24, all right, restart. So that should do for now. Okay, so what I want to do is whenever somebody clicks on this button, I want to reload the entire game, right? So here, what we will do is we'll actually create a new. Uh, do we have a script already for it? Enemy controller level over controller. So we already have this level over controller, right? It's part of the uh, player level. Where is this level complete, right? So this is the level complete uh, controller, and I think level complete is where, yeah, so we were using the level over controller. Uh, so we'll create a separate script, we'll call it uh, game over controller, uh, create C sharp, uh, game over controller. We should probably rename our level over controller to the level complete controller because that's only for when the player completes that level. This is actually the game over controller, right? So the naming is slightly. Uh, incorrect there, so you should probably go in and in that. So inside my game over controller, I want my whenever my uh, player dies, I want my game over controller to be visible, right? So I'll create a public void uh, player died function, and what I'll do is inside this player died function, I'm just gonna set game object, which is the current object on which my uh, uh, 
player is set uh, or rather on which my game over controller is uh, is you know attached and i'm going to say game object dot set active and i'm going to set it to true because whenever the player dies that's when i die. that that's the time when i want to show this particular uh, show this particular thing right um, so in my player now i want to know about this game over controller as well so i'll create very similar to how i was uh, connecting it to the player i'm going to say uh, game over controller game over controller right and instead of reloading the level here i'm going to reload it inside my game over controller right so whenever the player gets killed and the bonus animation oh, sorry the death animation finishes i'm going to instead of calling reset uh, level directly i'm going to say uh, game over controller game over controller dot um, what did we name the function player died so player died okay so the player has died uh, and now we want to show the game over screen so, so do we have a level so we have a game over and then we have a button under it okay cool so we have this game over and now we say player died um, we're not going to call this reload level directly here we want to call this reload level when uh, when my uh, uh, user actually presses that button right so i'm going to paste that function here again the scene manager is missing the reference so we'll just import it here and in this case i'm going to create a public button and call this uh, uh, restart button restart okay so i'm going to again import the ui namespace and and on awake i want is whenever uh, my object gets started um, i want to say button dot restart um, I want now whenever somebody clicks this button, right? I want to uh, restart my entire game. So in this particular case, uh, I'm gonna say on click. So same way how we were in the very first couple of classes, we were adding functionality to buttons, right? So I'm gonna say button on click add listener, and then inside this, I'm gonna call reload level. So whenever somebody clicks this button, this reload level function will be called, right? Okay, so so now we have this inside my uh, whenever the player gets killed instead of directly calling uh, destroy the player or directly uh, doing something with it, we we'll basically want my game over stuff to be shown, right? Okay, so now inside my player again I have this new uh, entry for game over controller, so I'm gonna attach drag that in. It's not dragging in Y because we don't have a game over controller attached to it. So I'm gonna search for the game over controller. Now this game over controller needs a button as well. So I'm gonna drag in the button object. Now this game over controller is good. I go over to the player. And now because I have this controller script attached to it, now I can drag it in, right? So I'm gonna save these changes to the prefab and re-enable my level, uh, which I had disabled for testing. And now I have this. So I'm just quickly, in order to make my things easier, I'm gonna just uh, uh, move the key to the left and move my enemy closer so I can test it just faster um, because I need to do this test again and again. So it's always good to just make level something so that we can test all the interaction and the pieces correctly and things work. So if we play, uh, what will happen is you'll see is basically, okay, so first thing is that we see this restart button um, by default here, right? So if I hit restart, uh, it will reload the level, 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 right? And keep doing that. So what we want it to do is by default, this game over should be disabled. It shouldn't show up 
the moment the game starts, it should only show up in the uh, player dash, right? So we want to make sure that that object is disabled. And because the button is under it, naturally when we disable the game over, uh, the button also gets disabled. Cool. So, so now I'll basically pick up the key and I have a score of 10. Now when I die, you'll see this game over object come up, right? But if you look, like I can keep interacting with the background again and the player keeps dying again. I don't want this to happen, right? So one part is correct that we are implementing this, but now my, my you know, um, I am still able to play the game essentially. So we need to fix that. When I click restart, my level resets correctly and it's the way I expect it to be. So at least that part is good, right? So now what we are going to do is we want to make sure that the player is not able to interact with things, etc., etc. Now for that to happen, what we want to do is we want to uh, do two things. One, we want to basically make my, uh, so remember how does the player interact? We basically interact through this player controller screen, right? So what do we do? a quicker way to kind of disabling control is just disable this player controller, right? But of course, we'll do it through code. Uh, but the idea is that we keep the player on the screen. So if the player has the death animation and it falls to the ground, it's still fallen there and you can see the player fallen there. One way is to just disable, not disable that, but disable the player controller script on it. That way the player is no longer, uh, or the user is no longer able to interact with the, uh, with the player, uh, with the actual character on screen, right? But we don't even want the entire uh, uh, game to be visible that's in the background, right? So what we will do is we'll again enable this game object, this game over screen. We'll put up a sort of a dummy screen to block everything off. Okay. So what we will do is we have this game over object. Now in this image, this game over object already has this image, right? So what we want to do is we want to create another image which is under it, but it's over the button, right? Uh, because this is the first image uh, that will be on the screen. So if I'm the player and looking at this screen, this image will be on top of it. And then this image will be again on top of that, right? So part of this image will get blocked with this. So what I want to do is I want to uh, have a background which is full black so the entire thing goes black when my player dies then I want to put my uh, game over on top and then button on top right so I'm gonna uh, so a quick sort of shortcut for that is I'm gonna just remove this component from here so that image does not exist anymore uh, since I already have this game over here right I'm just gonna say uh, copy component and right click here, paste component as new. So now I have this new game object, just that its size is different, right? So this is the uh, title image. So it, this doesn't have any behavior or any logic, but it's just the title image. So I'm gonna change its height to be 150, 150, much like before. So it's in the same place. And then I'm gonna, uh, uh, change this entire game over thing. If I look at here, right, I switch to this. You see this particular thing is only covering this part of the screen. So first I want to remove um, anything. So it's none, so it's just a pale white thing. And right now it's only covering this. So what I want to do is I want it to cover the entire screen. So I'll basically again use this option, okay? So I'm gonna say change it to cover the entire screen. Of course, we don't want it to look white. So we'll just change the color to be something slightly pleasant. That looks fine. And now we'll have this title image. We want the title image to be at the top. So we'll position it like this. Uh, we'll move it slightly down. And then we have the button. We want the button to be positioned at the very center, but slightly down with respect to the center. Not exactly at center. Okay. So this way, this will now block out my entire screen. So if I switch to even the game view, you don't see anything on the level, right? You don't 
uh, visually see the player because everything is hidden behind this thing. So when I disable this, the player and all everything is there, right? Because first the camera uh, shows whatever is, and then the UI shows on top. So that way, uh, if I have an image that's covering the entire screen, then uh, basically it will not show whatever is on the key of the camera. A quick way to test it is that you know if you have this uh, full screen image, you can reduce the you can increase the transparency. If I increase the transparency, you see the uh, what's in the background. You can see it. So you can reduce the transparency when you want to test something or position something correctly, etc., etc. And then once you're done testing, you can just increase the transparency that way. Okay. Cool. So what we want to do is by default we want this particular thing to be disabled. And now when I uh, play, okay, we need to do one more thing. We need to disable the access to the player controller because now, uh, even though uh, even though the uh, player is no longer behind, but it will still keep moving around, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right. So here, what we want to do is once this is done, we want to say this dot enabled. Sorry, this dot enabled is equal to false. Basically, we want to disable the player uh, controller. We don't want to destroy the object because then the camera will get destroyed, etc. We want to just disable this script uh, which is attached to this particular player and we'll see that in action right now. So you'll see this particular thing get unticked and it will be disabled and your player won't move anymore. So I pick up the key, score is 10 and then I die. Now I get the message that player picked up the key, player killed by the enemy and I have the screen. If I switch to see you, uh, I double click on the player. You see the player is still there, it's animating, etc. But if I do any actions, it won't do anything because the script is disabled, right? So if I keep pressing right and left, I'm right now pressing right and left, etc. Jump, nothing is happening because the script is disabled, so it's not taking any more action on it. Okay. All right, so let's go back here. All right, so I'm gonna say restart, and this should uh, restart the full thing. Yeah, okay, so there you go. So basically reset my entire level, and now again I can do the same. Okay, I can hit uh, restart again, and it will reload the entire level. I can skip the key and then die again, right? So I can keep doing this and testing it and making sure all the cases and scenarios are working correctly. All right, cool. So let's switch back to Trello. Yeah, so we have this game over. Um, now we will quickly add in one small more thing where we will basically create a new um, scene for the player to start. Uh, right now, whenever we just uh, hit play, um, when you hit play or start the game, like we see the player, right? But what we want to do is we want to create a new scene now. So let's say create a new scene and will say lobby. This is typically where each game starts, right? Like no game really starts directly with the player as such. So in this particular scene, uh, we just want a UI. So we will remove the main camera. We don't need the main camera for showing the UI. And now we'll say UI create uh, text, which is text mesh pro. I'm gonna position it again at 000. So it's exactly at the center of the screen. Um, Unity shows this warning message uh, whenever you're uh, you don't have a camera in the scene i'm just gonna disable this so you can on the game view you can go here on the options and just say disable this one if no camera is rendering because i know this particular entire scene is just the lobby where you just see the ui settings things like that right uh, so here we'll just want to say uh, uh, so let's name this game. What is this game called? Um, platformer. So we'll just call it game title. And in the text, we'll call it awesome platformer. Okay. So if I go to scene view, double click this object. Now you see it's like kind of going in two lines. So I don't want that to happen. So I'll just stretch it out. And now what we'll do is we'll basically center align the text. So we'll center align and we will move this object 
to the again very similar to the same flow we'll move it to the top center right and here i want my object to be um, centered right so let me just so i'm going to change my width to be 400 so now my object is center and i'm going to just drag it down just a little bit so i see awesome platform and then i'm gonna add in a new button by very much like how we did the other button so in this case this button is basically button play basically start the game right so uh you'll call this play and so you see how this is why i suggested not to use text because here you see this like button looks a little blurry um and here since we're using text mesh pro this awesome platformer text looks very crisp Right, so that's why you, like Unity is pretty hard at doing its own uh, text stuff. So that's why I try and avoid this. Uh, whenever you click button, whenever you add a default button, Unity comes with its own text. But I'll just remove this and add in a text mesh pro text UI. Okay, and I'm gonna call this uh, play. So you see how crispy this text looks, right? So I'm gonna reposition this. Uh, and I'm just gonna switch to see view to see that it looks correct. Now I'm gonna change the setting so that it's always anchored to the four edges. But here the text is too big. Uh, so A, I want it to be center lined, and then I want the size to be smaller. So say 24, maybe. 20 okay and i want it vertically also i want it to be in the center and because the button is white i don't want the text to be white as well so i'm going to change the color to be black okay uh, now i'm going to change this is the game title the canvas and yeah this should be fine for now so i'm going to just move this further down just to be and the blue looks cleaner Awesome platformer and increase the button size of the button. Okay, cool. So now we've created a new this thing, uh, lobby, and here we'll basically create a new script because now what we want to do is we want to start play. Uh, so here I'm gonna say new script, I'm gonna say uh, lobby controller. And on the uh, canvas, in this case, since my canvas is the highest level thing, right? I'm gonna attach my lobby controller to be the canvas because right now I just have one play button, but tomorrow I'm gonna add the settings button, the sound button, the store purchase button, a lot of these other buttons as well that do a lot of other things, right? So I want the lobby controller to be at the highest thing and that way, I can keep adding other functionality to it as well, and I can connect other buttons uh, to the same thing. So I'm gonna say public uh, button, uh, button play, right? So this is the button that basically helps us uh, get into the game or start the game, right? Again, in awake, I'm gonna say uh, button play dot on click dot add listener. I'm gonna say play. Game, right I want the play game function to get caught but here we haven't defined what this play game function is right so we do studio complaints so I'm gonna hit alt enter and I'm gonna quickly generate a method so I don't have to do this entire thing every time okay so that's just how you can become slightly more efficient at doing things all right so now when we want to do play game we want to say uh, scene manager again we want to remember now we've created a new scene right so we want to say scene manager dot load scene and I want to say scene one. I'll tell you why. So we'll quickly switch back to Unity. <coughs> we'll attach the button here. Now if I go back to file settings, build settings, here right now we have only one scene which has the index zero. This is the actual game scene where my game is right. So now I want 
I want to attach this lobby scene as well. So I'm going to drag it in, but I'm going to drag it in at the top. So now, before the start scene, because I want my game whenever Unity starts, uh, whenever you you know load the app, say on your phone, it will always Unity will by default always load whichever is the scene which is the first in the list, whichever has the scene that has zero index that will by default. Be. After that, you can decide whether you want to load scene with index ten first or whether you want to load scene with index one. It's up to you. But the very first time Unity starts, it will load always the scene that's zero. Okay, I mean on the phone or if or, you know you're making a console game on the actual device, right? So uh, that's why we set it to zero lobby, and then in the lobby when you click the play button, the it, the all the scenes that you keep adding will have uh, incrementing the the index will keep incrementing by one, and in this case obviously the the other scene that their actual game is uh, is by the index uh, one. So that's why if you see here, you're saying load scene with index one. Okay, all right, cool. So so now this is if you hit play, uh, we'll start with this particular scene. So you have this lobby screen that shows up, and I click play. Now we go into the level. I die. It says restart, and when I say restart, you see you like. Okay, so. Let's look at what we did in restart first. So when we said re reload the level, we had the original index as zero, right? So now zero is the lobby scene. So it's loading the lobby scene and not the uh, actual game scene, right? So we want to say change this number to one. So we want the game to start again, not go back all the way to the lobby, right? Uh, so if you could please switch back and hit play. Play, we start, we pick up the key, we get killed, we restart, and now we restart over again. Okay, keep doing that, we can keep repeating this in that So so now without doing any more extra work, we are able to break our game into smaller scenes, and each scene can be reloaded, started again, etc. etc. And the player can keep playing it again and again and multiple times, right? Okay, cool. So hopefully things are uh, starting to make sense how the entire game kind of connects together. So that's predominantly the core pieces that we wanted to cover today. So now there are some bonus assignments uh, that I want you guys to cover. So what um, uh, these are is basically we have implemented one enemy. Now you'll implement another enemy which basically moves along. So we saw that the game, we already have assets for uh, other enemies, right? So we'll make sure that we pick up another enemy, create a uh, duplicate of it, replace it with the right assets. And then uh, what you want to do is you want to add some uh, logic to it, right? So the logic we want to add is you want to make the enemy move along the path. So similarly, how we detected the uh, level start and the level end through triggers, right? Sorry, one sec. Uh, sorry, so how we were detecting the level over condition and the le level complete condition and the level start conditions through those invisible triggers, right? So you'll have invisible triggers uh, attached to the player, right? As different game object attached to the player. And when my enemy starts in the middle, it starts walking towards the left, it hits the trigger. Whenever it hits the left trigger, it turns, it flips 180 degrees and starts walking in that direction. When it hits this trigger, it turns 180 degrees and starts walking in the reverse direction. So you are, you will, it's a bonus assignment for you guys to implement this uh, unique enemy behavior. And for this enemy, since we already have assets for different animations, make sure that we are actually animating and just moving it uh, similar to how we did it. For the okay. All right. Cool. So that's part one. Right now, we implemented the behavior where we wanted uh, the moment the player touches the enemy, it just dies. Now we want to implement three or uh, five or some kind of you know system where you have these hearts right so similar to the score you'll show lives and a number and every time a player hits an enemy you decrease that life number by one every time it hits again decrease it by one and when the number goes down to zero that's when the player dies so you'll add this uh, concept of lives and we can change it we can change it to be three lives we can change it to be five lives so that should be a variable uh, 
but the idea is that the player should have these hearts or lives which are visible on the UI much like how we have scored, right? And using the same flow, you'll be able to implement multiple lives for players. And when the player will die, then you basically have all this. And then for the enemies, obviously enemies and the keys, make sure that they're all animated. Right? Cool. So that's predominantly all the core topics that we want to cover today. Next time we'll actually create multiple levels and start uh, focusing on building a full game and start showing inside the lobbies different levels and have like a level selection screen, etc. as well. So we'll start adding a lot more pieces and turning it into a full fledged game as well. Right? <clears throat> cool. And if you guys have any questions, uh, just feel free to ping me on Discord uh, within the channel and uh, uh, I'll be there. All right? Cool, awesome. So, all right, so I'm gonna, yeah, and next time we'll actually create multiple levels and start uh, focusing on building a full game and start showing inside the lobbies different levels and have like a level selection screen, etc. as well. So, we'll start adding a lot more pieces and turning it into a full fledged game as well. All right. <clears throat> cool. And if you guys have any questions, uh, just feel free to ping me on Discord uh, within the channel and uh, uh, I'll be there. All right. Cool. Awesome. So, all right. So, I'm going to yeah, end the session now. So, we're going to cover a very important topic called Singleton. It's the it's basically a design pattern and we're just we're going to do some of the details for this pattern and uh, uh, build some components using that, all right? So after that, we're gonna set up a simple lobby, which last time we had a basic setup, but now what we want to do is we want to go ahead and create a, uh, last time when we click play, it was directly taking us into the, uh, into the actual game scene directly, right? So now once we hit play, we want to make sure that we're showing a different number of levels to the user. And then uh, based on which level the user selects, we basically take them into that level, okay? So each level should basically show what kind of progress it is, whether it's completed, failed, um, whether it's maybe locked, like if you've not gotten to that level, things like that, right? So, so today the focus will be on this system that we'll build for detecting uh, the, you know different levels so and also actually have some different levels to play with okay so we'll go around creating this uh, system today all right cool so let's jump in so if you remember from previous time we created a basic lobby which looks like this and it just has a play button right and then we have start which is our actual uh, dummy setup for the actual level, right? So if I double click here, so as you can see, that's my actual level, right? So what I want to do is, I want to first, let's rename this start. Since we want to create multiple levels, we'll just call it level one. Okay. Just to be clear, and I'm just gonna put it inside a new folder and call it levels, uh, just to separate it and put it in here. Levels. All right, cool. So to quickly get started, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna um, in the uh, top part just to give you guys some when we actually load these levels in, right? Like. Uh, it'll be important for us to figure out uh, which level we are in. So I'm gonna just add in a new text object. Uh, now this text object is gonna be at the uh, top of the screen. Uh, so I'm gonna position it at the top. And I'm gonna position it at the top left corner so that it doesn't overlap with this core aspect here. And I'm gonna call it the object is the level. I'm gonna move it up and here I'm gonna say level one. This just tells me that when I jump into the scene that hey, now we are in level one, right? Okay, uh, 
good. So let me just change the color. And yeah, I'm gonna move it slightly to the right. So you see it clearly. And then you have the game over screen, which is the same pretty much. All right, so now we have this level one fully set up. So what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna right click and duplicate this particular um, scene. What you do is it will give me a duplicate scene with the same kind of setup already working. And then I can just uh, quickly go ahead and uh, you know create multiple scenes out of it that will act as multiple levels. So I'm gonna press Control D. I'm gonna create level two. Double click, make sure I'm in level two. Inside my canvas, I'm gonna click on this level object and put the text as level two. So now if I jump into level one, as you can see here, it says level one. When I jump into level two, it says level two, right? So I'm gonna just quickly create a couple of these scenes and this will give us at least multiple scenes that we can transition into and see that our game looks a little bit unique. Even, you know, I mean, you can go ahead and make changes like you can, uh, you know, even like say the key, um, I don't want the key to be here. I want the key to be after my player has cleared the enemy and say my enemies behind the player, right? Just to give it some, some different feel so that we can actually, not just through the text, we can identify which level we are in. Here also, I'm gonna, mm, I'm gonna just disable the enemy for now, just to give it some flavor. And then I'm gonna move the object, uh, Bam, I think that's good. So this is level four, and then to make it show on the level as well, I'm gonna do level four here. All right, so now we have a player, we have levels, we have a bunch of these levels. So first thing first, we'll open build settings, and we're gonna say, so you see scene, like the build setting shows our lobby scene and our level one scene. We're gonna shift, click all of the scenes, and drag them in. Now all of these scenes are also in part of the build and through our scripts, the way we have been switching levels, we can switch uh, levels. So we'll go back to the lobby. So now we want is uh, uh, something that shows us a level selection, uh, level selection setup. Okay, so we don't want the level selection to be directly visible here. So when I click play, instead of directly taking me into the scene, I want some, uh, UI to show up, which will basically tell me that it's a level selection, uh, like a pop-up, right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create an empty game object, which will act as like a pop-up for me, and I'm gonna call it uh, level selection, okay? So I'll switch to scene view, and double click level selection. So right now level selection is nothing but just an empty object. So I'm gonna change it to be in the corners. So that way it takes up the entire screen, right? All right, so now I have the level selection scene. I'm gonna add in a button under it. So we'll say button. Um, now this button is um, basically supposed to be like, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, individual button to select which level you want to play, right? So I'm gonna say, um, so this is like a button level, right? Um, so if I switch back to game view, right now this button overlaps with the other button. So what we're gonna do is, we're gonna add an image to the background to have it like completely block the background. Um, but since we want it to look like a pop-up, uh, what we'll do is we'll give it a little bit of space from each side. So we'll just say that shift it in 100 from the left side and 100 from pretty much all sides. So now it looks like a pop-up rather than a, a full screen uh, UI, right? So if I have my game title shifted slightly up, you can see the game title in the back. Right? Okay. 
cool so so now i have this uh thing i'm gonna just tone down the color a little bit so that it doesn't too bright and i have this button which lets me play the level i'm gonna change this button to be 100 cross 100 because all we need to do is show a level on it right so in this case i'm gonna say uh this button is how many levels did we create we created four levels right level one level two level three level four so what we're going to do is we're going to duplicate this button four times okay so you're going to say do, 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 do. so now we have level, these buttons but they're all on top of each other so you can't see them right so you can only see one of them so one way is i can actually manually position them left right and make sure that they're aligned but that's very cumbersome to do so what unity provides us is with something called as a layout group okay so if i search for add component layout you'll see a lot of these different elements where it has a layout element it has a grid layout group so if i want these buttons to show up in a grid i have horizontal layout group i have vertical layout group if i want these to be so right now i just want these buttons to be laid out horizontally so i'm going to select horizontal layout group and now you see unity has aligned all of them together uh, with equal spacing in between and of course, these there are there's uh, once I added this, you can actually control how the how they are spaced out, what is the spacing, things like that. You can you can change a lot of these things. So one thing we'll do is instead of if you check this button and click the square thing, right? So you can see that they are uh, right now aligned towards the top left corner of the screen, right? So in that that looks very odd i want them to be in the center so i'm going to say middle center and unity is going to shift everything to the middle center and now everything is equally aligned right now the best part is that tomorrow if we added another button right so if i just go in and duplicate this now everything readjusts so i don't have to worry about uh spacing them out correctly and if i went in and deleted this as well right everything just readjusts based on uh since it's on the edges of this particular background of the level selection that we have it shifts everything in between and, and aligns it with respect to it okay cool you can change padding from the left like how much space you want uh, so if i don't want any padding i'm going to say minus 10 everything just shifts left right if i said i want uh, uh, because everything is zero unity finds the best way to fit it so that everything is equally spaced from right left up down everything but say I want it towards, not towards the center, but slightly towards the bottom, right? Or something like that. Then, then you can go ahead and play around with these numbers and you'll see how, how they behave, right? So I can set the bottom value to be 50 and now the buttons will shift slightly up because that's 50 space from the bottom of this particular uh, edge of this, right? So, so you'll see it kind of keeps moving up. Okay, I'm gonna undo and just reset. So for now, we'll just leave them in the middle uh, because it looks fine. So uh, what we'll do is we'll put all of these buttons um, like under another dummy object that has a horizontal layout group because I want a text here as well that says select a level, right? Just so that it's clear to the player that what they're supposed to do. Uh, so I'm going to what i'm going to do is so now we have this level selection part i'm going to create another object that's a parent of this object so i'm going to say create empty and this is basically a uh, level selection uh, i'm just going to call it a pop-up right because it's something that pops up onto the screen and i'm going to move this uh, let me first set the anchors correctly so they're all uh, towards the corners again i'm going to set it to be 100 100 not i don't need it on the depth axis because we're working with 2d and the 100 100 as well right now this i'm gonna move inside it so what i'm doing is basically saying that uh my entire canvas has this game object called level selection pop-up which is nothing but it's just a dummy object that defines how big my pop-up is then under it i have the actual level selection part right and this is which gives me that uh, look and feel of where my buttons are currently laid out okay 
So I'm gonna uh, do is I'm gonna move this image that we see right on top of this one, and you'll see why that I'm doing this. So I'm gonna say I'm gonna remove this image from here. So the move component, and now my image is on the parent object. So I'm just gonna tone down the color. All right. So now I'm gonna create the actual UI that I wanted. So I'm gonna add in a text. I'm gonna align it to the top center, uh, move it slightly down, and then I'm gonna say, select a level, right? That's the text I wanted to show, right? So I'm gonna hide 50, it's fine. So I'm gonna increase the width a little bit so that it fits uh, in the center of the screen. Uh, horizontally, so I'm going to change it to be center line. So now everything looks center lined, but the text I want it to be black. All right, so now you've seen this is nothing but a level <coughs> heading, level selection. This is nothing but the heading itself, right? It, it's not interactable or anything. I'm going to move it to the top because it's on the top, and then you have the actual button. What if we have, we're following the initial setup, right? If I move this object inside, I would have created it. Like it would, Unity will try to space all of these things together because this object has the horizontal layout of anything that's a child of it. Unity will try to align it horizontally because they're part of the script. Okay. That's why we had to create another object on top and just have the buttons under it. Okay. So I have to redo this particular part where I have to align it because when it was inside the horizontal group, Unity tried to force its alignment to the right side. Uh, okay, so now this is done. So let's uh, do this where we go in and change the text of this. So we'll say level one. Uh, similarly, we're gonna set the text on other objects and say, level two and say level three and level four. All right, so now we have four, um, now we have four buttons for individual levels, okay? So what we're gonna do is first we're gonna, uh, we'll have to basically define how when somebody clicks on play how this pop-up shows up and then after this pop-up shows up and somebody clicks on each of these levels how do they go back into that particular level right or how do they go into that level so first let's define a, a so we have a player lobby controller let's look at what the lobby controller is so remember what we were doing is when we were hitting play game uh, when we were calling this function play game, we were directly loading scene one, which it was nothing but level one, right? So in order to make our lives a little bit easy, what we'll do is we'll create a new folder for, and we'll call it uh, level. So we're gonna rename it level. So all our level related scripts can stay inside here. So I'm gonna create a new class now this new class is, as you can see, I'm not created it as a new mono behavior because I don't wanna, uh, uh, I don't want it to be a mono behavior. I just want it to be um, a simple class, right? So I'm gonna rename it to be levels, sorry, levels S. And here I just wanna maintain all the names of the levels. So I don't want, um, if you remember from here, right, in the level, uh, in the lobby controller, we had this hard-coded value of one. Now for each button, we have to jump to a specific uh, level. So what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna just uh, define some strings. So I'm gonna say public static string, and I'm gonna say, uh, level one and now come back and just check what is the exact name we gave it level one level two level three level four right so we're going to call it level one and i'm just going to copy paste this 
so that we can just quickly reuse it and now rename it to two, rename it to three, rename it to four, and I'm gonna do the same for here. Rename it to two, rename it to three, rename it to four. So now what this is doing is basically, uh, it's letting us quickly put all the uh, names of the level in one place. That way, anytime if my scene name has changed, I just need to come and change here, and the rest of the game just uses this uh, uh, variable name uh, to refer to what this level they need to go. Okay, so now what we'll do is we'll create a, another script, and this time we'll create a mono behavior, and we're gonna call it a level loader. I'm gonna say level loader. Right. So now um, I just remove all of this and I'm going to say level loader. Now this is a mono behavior. What I want to do is I want to say that it has a button on top. Okay. So I'm going to add in a button. I'm going to say button. Now on awake, I want to find first this button. So I'm going to say button is equal to get component very much like all the time how we find components on it and it's a button so every on each of those buttons that we created for the levels right we'll basically attach the script and provide it what it needs to load when this particular button gets clicked okay so here i'm gonna say uh, public um, string level Level name. Let's just give it a level name for now. All right. So, um, so now we want to know, like now we're sure that every time somebody clicks this button, they basically are on top of this particular thing. Sorry about that. Um, so. What we want to do is basically um, we're gonna uh, use something that Unity provides that makes us sure that whenever we are attaching a level loader script to something, it has a button. So what there is, what you can do is you can do something like uh, require component. So what this does is when you put it on top of a mono behavior. Um, you're saying that this mono behavior can only be attached to a game object that has a component of this particular type attached on it. Okay, so what this is doing is that it is saying that if I go and create a game object that does not have a button, I cannot attach a level loader to it. Why? Because a level loader only works when there is a button next to it, right? So I'm gonna say button dot add on click dot add listener and I'm gonna say um, on click I'm gonna create this function generate this method uh, using the shortcuts and then now when this particular thing gets loaded I'm gonna say scene manager uh, this is not gonna be imported by default I'm gonna use scene management scene management dot load scene and now I'm gonna transition into that scene Okay, so last time we were using this uh, load scene, but passing it an integer. But if you look at the tooltip, right, there is another uh, way where we can pass in the string name of the scene itself. We don't need to always need the uh, number that we saw in the build index, but we can actually use the name. So this is where we really define the level uh, name is gonna come in handy for that. Okay, so, so now we have this level names and we're passing this level. So with this, what's happening is that every time I say get component, but because I specified that it needs to have a require component of the type button attached to the same game object, this guarantees that this button will always be there, right? So at runtime, when my game is running, it won't happen that this button ends up not being there and I run into an error, okay? So that's the basic idea behind require component. 
All right, cool. So I'm gonna switch uh, to Unity. And so on this button object, so you see this as the button object. So I'm gonna say level loader. So I'm gonna attach the level loader and give it the name level one. Similarly here, I'm gonna attach level loader and give it the name level two. Same for here, level three. And now level four. All right, so now I have buttons and this way what I had to do is basically I had to create a variable which takes in a level name and now with a single script, I can attach it to as many buttons as I want, as many levels as I have in the game. Yeah, I don't need to create duplicate scripts for it. I'm just gonna remove some of these that are not needed. So now that's all uh, my level load script. Now I want something to actually load this particular thing, right? So if I have my canvas, by default, my lobby will look like this. Uh, so, to be in view. so it's gonna look like this. When I hit this play, I want this particular thing to show up. That will say select a level. And now when somebody clicks on one of these levels, they basically transition into the actual level. So for this, what we will do is that, uh, where did we attach our lobby script on the canvas? Yeah, so we have a lobby controller on the canvas, right? So here we were taking a button, but now we'll take in a game object as well along with it and we'll call it um, uh, level selection. So when somebody clicks play, instead of directly taking them into the scene, I'm gonna say level selection, sorry, uh, level selection. Because it's a game object, I can directly call set active on it and set it to true. So what this will do is, by default, if my object is disabled, it will actually enable it now, okay? So I don't need any of these. I remove the scene management stuff. So now uh, let's go back to Unity. Now before we can hit play, what we want to do is now we have this level selection and it takes a game object, right? So we need to tell it where is this game object that has the level selection stuff on it, right? So this is the level selection pop-up. So inside my uh, lobby controller, I'm gonna drag in the object on top here and I'm gonna by default disable it so that I don't want the level selection screen to be enabled when my game starts, right? So I'm gonna hit play, I'm gonna uh, wait. Okay, so now we are in the game. Now when I click play, my level selection screen shows up. This object is enabled and now I can actually jump into any of these levels. So if I hit level four, so you see we are now in level four, right? Um, so let's, so now that's the basic setup for jumping and transitioning into different levels. So I pick up the key. Let's see if I can die and get a game over screen. Did we not add in the game over logic on death? Ah, okay, we didn't add it on the bottom. We only added it on when you hit an enemy, right? Okay, so let's play again and just check it out. Um, so this time I'm gonna go into level one and I'm gonna die with the enemy, right? And now I'm gonna hit restart and I'm in level one and I'm gonna die again, hit restart. But now there is no back, no way to go back to the full lobby, right? So what we will do is on this game over screen, instead of restart, we'll have another button that lets me go back to the lobby in case I wanna to switch to a different level, okay? So on this, uh, Uh, first, let me pause the game. All right, so I am in level one. Game over. Okay, so now you see one problem. Uh, I, what I want to do is I want to be able to put a button in this game over section. But the issue is that I have four scenes now. And as this game grows, I can keep adding more scenes on top of it, right? 
So if I add one button here, um, so let me just quickly do that. So there is a button restart, and then let's say I duplicate this button, move it at slightly lower, and button instead of restart, I'm gonna call it button lobby so that it indicates that I, it takes me back to the lobby. And here on the text, I'm gonna change the text to say lobby. All right, so now the problem is that I have, um, I have this particular game object in pretty much every scene, right? So the issue becomes that I've added it to this particular object, but now I need to go in and if I say, uh, this is level one, so if I look at level two, and inside level two also, you'll see that there is this game over, and I click play, uh, oh, sorry, I click enable it to see what's happening. There is no um, button here, right? So I need to go in and duplicate and set it up again, etc. I need to do all of this logic again and again, right? So now the, that's the sort of a core issue um, uh, that if I have 20 levels, I have to go in and replicate this work um, 20 times, right? Okay. So instead, how we remember created a prefab for the player, we'll create a prefab for the game mode as well. So what we'll do is we'll go back to level one. Uh, we added this button called lobby. We're gonna make some changes. So this button restart lets me restart the current level, right? Um, let's look at the game over, which is handling the logic for this particular. So game over says um, load scene. Uh, whenever the uh, player dies, we uh, you know enable the game over part, and then when we do a reload, um, we basically have uh, uh, you know the current scene getting reloaded. So we'll have to change this logic as well. So first, what we'll do is we'll basically add in the logic for the new button as well. Um, so we'll say a public button uh, instead of actually having it here. Since we just created a level loader screen, we'll simplify our process a little bit. So we just want this game over screen to show up when the player dies. So we're gonna remove this logic on button restart from here. Um, actually, do we need to remove it? Um, so we want our game to restart the current scene, right? So let's see how we can do that. So if you have scene manager, um, load scene, or do we have something which says the current scene? Uh, does it have something? Active scene, anything of that nature that tells us that, hey, we are currently uh, Active scene changed, get scene add, get all scenes, get active scene, right? So we have a function that within the scene manager gives us the currently active scene. Okay, so this works perfectly. So now what we're gonna do is, we're gonna, instead of hard coding this one, because we want this game over controller to be in all the scenes that we have, instead of hard coding this, what we will do is, we will say, uh, We'll change this to be just reloading scene. Dot, dot, dot. Uh, we'll uncomment this out because we want to keep this for now. Uh, and sorry, and uncomment this. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to say scene manager dot get active get active scene. Right. So this is going to return us us. So what does this return us? This returns us the scene object. Oops, sorry, this returns us a scene object. Okay, so now we'll say scene manager. Scene manager dot load scene. And we're going to check if it takes a scene object directly. Is there some function which takes a scene object? 
no it doesn't so we're gonna say scene dot build index or name we can use either we know it takes in a build index so through this so what we did here is instead of hard coding a value of one we said uh, hey scene manager give me my current active scene right so whether i'm in level one level two level three it doesn't matter um, whatever is the currently active scene give me that and from that scene i got its index right and we've seen how we can load them through index we could always do uh, name as well but index is a faster way of doing it because it's an exact number right so when you say name unity takes that string and then goes and sees through the entire list of scenes and matches one string to the other string right and it's usually a less likely slow process and if you have a lot of scenes it'll be much slower but index just tells it that within that array of all the scenes at index x go in and load the scene right so it'll be much faster so in general well, let's use this okay so so now we've made a little change to our game over controller where it has a reset button let's look at the game over controller so we have this reset button now anytime i hit this reset button irrespective of whichever scene i might be in it will just reload that scene okay i don't need to hard code that one there um all right and now in this button that takes me back to the lobby i could have added another button lobby here and coded it but we already created a level loader screen right um so we're gonna just use that level loader screen uh and instead here i can pass in the name of the lobby level so i'm gonna pass in lobby because if you remember even though we're calling this as a level loader probably a better name is a scene loader because all it does is it takes a button and when that button gets clicked it loads a certain scene that has this name right so here i've reused the same script and i said hey whenever this button gets clicked take me back to the log okay all right cool so now what we're going to do is we're going to first save this particular thing as a prefab so we have enemy prefab item prefab player prefab i'm going to create a new folder and say views views are nothing but just like different game object uis that i can uh, reuse other places right so i'm going to drag it in here and now this becomes my game over uh, game over scene sorry not game over scene game over prefab all right so now i'm going to switch quickly to level two here i'm gonna delete this particular object take the game over object and put it here and now i have the entire same thing there right and i'm gonna simply just do the same thing quickly for others as well i'm gonna say uh, delete and put in game over object here and same for level four uh, canvas game object delete game over all right so now i have this particular system working where in each uh, level if you see i have this particular uh, uh, prefab that it looks consistent all right so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna um but if you look closely we made a big mistake so let me just show you what so i hit play all right so i'm gonna hit this say level three we forgot to disable the game object uh with the game over thing so by default uh even though my game is running my game over object is enabled everywhere so in every scene we have the game over object enabled now the best part is because we know it's a prefab all we need to do is we're going to open this particular prefab and actually by default just disable it now the same uh, uh change will apply to every scene right so if i quickly switch to level one you see the game over screen disabled game over screen disabled game over screen disabled and if we hit play um, play level two and now we actually have this 
right? So even though we made one mistake there, we would have to go in. If there were not a prefab, we had to go in and change it everywhere. Now with just one uh, change in one common prefab, I need I, I can just you know uh, apply the same thing to all my entire game wherever that prefab is used. So so that's where typically prefabs come in really really handy, right? So anything that you have to reuse over and over again, just create like a prefab out of it so that it's easier for you to uh, make any future changes to it as well. All right, cool. So let's quickly switch back to Trello and see what uh, is pending. So we created some scenes which are duplicates uh, so that it's easy. You can actually go in and you know actually create full-fledged custom levels. And I'm not going to do the whole thing in the class, but um, since they're individual scenes, you can just open them, edit them, modify the level however you may like. On the level, when the level gets complete uh, or you finish the thing, uh, basically uh, we implemented this replay one, right? Like we should be able to replay it and we should be able to go back to the log, right? Uh, we added this level selection screen with the level info and such, uh, uh, you know, for each of these levels. Uh, we set up a new scene for the main lobby part and uh, what else is pending fill in the level selection ah so we need to now track which levels are completed which levels are uh, not finished unlocked etc etc right all right so in order to do that we need to understand two important concepts so we're going to basically say that sorry uh, let me switch to back again to community hit play okay so now we have this level selection screen that tells me to select one of these four levels right um so in order to uh, in order to make my uh, uh level um uh, track progress I need to save that information somewhere, right? So uh, what I want to do is that uh, whenever a player finishes a level, um, I want to uh, mark that level completed. Whenever my player is, uh, you know, uh, unlocked a new level, I want to mark it unlocked, uh, things like that, right? So for that to happen, first what we'll do is, sorry. So first what we'll do is we'll basically have to create a few more uh, scripts for it. So we'll come back to this level. Actually, we didn't use this, so uh, I'm just gonna remove it for now. Instead, what we're gonna say, uh, we're gonna rename the script and call it level status. So what this will be, we'll use as enum. And I'll just explain what enums are. Uh, level locked, uh, unlocked, and completed. Okay, so basically all I'm doing is I'm defining an enum. An enum is nothing but internally, it's just a, a human readable way of defining uh, status or like you know something that's uh, normally if you are saying uh, is player jumping right like you would say is jumping is equal to is, is like a boolean that is it true or false right uh, true or false is nothing but zero or one and that zero or one could have been if you write it as is jumping zero is jumping one it's likely unreadable Right, especially if you have more values like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I don't know what these 4, 5 are, right? Um, so as your project grows, these become harder to uh, understand what these individual values mean, right? So enums are used like for us as humans to make this information readable, but internally the computer still treats them as numbers, right? So internally for the computer, uh, locked, still represents a zero, uh, unlocked represents a one, and uh, completed represents a two. So internally, how this is how the computer will treat it. But when I say 
um, level status is equal to locked, I can understand it that it means that this level is locked. If level status is unlocked, then I can understand that this level is unlocked, right? But if I said level status is equal to one, is equal to two, I need to go back and think and understand what is this one, what is this two, what is this three, okay? So uh, this is a more human readable way of defining uh, like this individual uh, states of something and, and you know, it makes your code a lot more readable. All right, so now we have this. Um, we have to somewhere define this data, right? So we have to say that um, when a player finishes a level, then we uh, mark its status as complete um, and obviously uh, mark the next level as unlocked, right? So the way it will behave is that when you start the game the very first time, you basically have only level one available, the rest are locked. Uh, when you have uh, finished level one, level two gets unlocked. When you have finished level two, level three gets unlocked, level finished level three, level four gets unlocked. That way. Okay, cool. So the way we're gonna do it is we need a few pieces of core information. So we define level status. Um, we have a level controller. So we have a level over controller and we have a game over controller. So level over controller tells us this level complete condition and game over controller tells us this um, player dead condition, right? When the player basically dies and fails the level. So we have these two levels. I'm gonna move the level over controller inside this level folder just because all the level information is sort of in one place. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is I'm gonna uh, uh, on the lobby we have individual uh, buttons for individual levels, right? So here in my level loader, um, actually, do I want to keep it inside my level loader uh, because it has level name, right? So let's use the same script so for now, so it's easier for us to manage uh, the number of scripts. So what we're gonna do is, this tells me a level name and we're gonna use something which internal Unity provides us to, uh, uh, to understand that whether this particular level is uh, loaded, unloaded, et cetera, et cetera. So here, if you look at Trello, uh, sorry, back to so Trello, we were making something as a UI manager and a level manager. So for now, we don't need a UI manager. What we'll do is we'll just create a level manager first. So this level manager will tell us that whether a level is complete, whether a level is uh, incomplete, etc. etc. So what we'll do is we'll add in a new uh, one of behavior. And rename it and call it level manager. Okay, so I'm gonna remove some of this. Okay, so first, before we implement this uh, level manager, there's something uh, we need to understand, which is basically what is a singleton. Uh, so singletons basically give us the core functionality. Um, by its name, basically it's a design pattern which tells us that uh, if something is a singleton, only one object of that type can exist in the entire uh, game, right? Or in the entire software or whatever you're building, right? So uh, this is not something game specific, it's used in literally every uh, type of programming language slash uh, software system slash anything that you can think of. It's it's a concept. So when we say something is a singleton, we mean that only one uh, object of that particular uh, type can exist in the system, right? No other object can exist. So for that uh, to happen, we have to do something like this. So um, 
So we have to create a static uh, level manager. So as you might know, that static is something that can be used uh, anywhere in the entire game, right? If something is declared as static, it can be used anywhere in the entire game. And you can do level manager. So if you have a normal class, you have to create an object of a class and call, uh, uh, call a function on it, right? But if something is static, you can directly access it through the class name itself, right? So I don't need an object of a level manager to access this instance. I can just say level manager dot instance and it will get me that instance because it's static that means all the objects of this particular class will share this one common uh, you know one common uh, uh, but not not an object but one common property or one common thing inside it okay so if i have a color property uh, and my market as static within a, say an apple class irrespective of how many apples i have it will always share that same color value, changing the color value in one place will change it in every place, right? So, so as you can logically think, uh, in, like Singleton says that I can only have one instance, that means whatever the instance I'm creating is basically going to be static because that one instance is shared by everybody. Okay, so I'm going to create an instance, I'm going to mark it as private, and inside my awake, remember awake is the first thing that reality calls on any object, right? So inside my this thing, I'm going to check if instance is equal to null. That means nobody has created an object of this particular type before. Then I'm going to say instance is equal to this. That means that I'm setting my level manager to be the current instance of the game object that's, uh, that Unity has called awake on. Right? And then I'm going to use a Unity specific function which will say don't destroy on load and pass it this dot game object now you can just say game object as well because inside a mono behavior a game object reference to the current game object that we are uh, attached to right so what this is doing is basically it is saying that the very first time this object uh, game object comes into existence when awake gets called its instance will be null because nobody has set any value to this this instance uh, that we have defined here. In that case, the very first time I want to set this value to be the current object. And what this does is that whenever we do one, whenever we go from one scene to the next scene, Unity destroys all the objects from the previous scene. Okay? But now we want that Unity should not destroy my level manager because this level manager is going to be uh, consistent throughout my entire, uh, entire uh, game. Okay, good. So else, which means that uh, somebody has already created an instance and this is like a duplicate version of it. Else, we're gonna say destroy game object. That means uh, we want to currently whatever game object we are on, we just want to destroy it because this is a duplicate copy of the uh, level manager. And by its very nature, an instance or a singleton can only have one object. Okay, cool. So as you can see, you might have noticed that this instance, we defined it as private because here we are setting its value and we don't want anybody outside this to change its value. Okay, so what we'll do is, sorry uh, what we'll do is we'll define a public property which will again be static level manager and give it a capital i instance because anything that's public usually starts with a capital letter anything that's private usually starts with a small letter and here we'll just say get so whenever somebody calls this capital i instance they'll get whatever is the value of this small instance so i want my small instance to be private specifically so that nobody outside my game outside my level manager can change it and i if somebody wants to access this level manager and call a function on it etc then they basically can use this capital i instance to access that same object but they will only be able to read it they'll never be able to type it because i've only defined a property as a get 
So they can only get its value, but never set its value. Okay. All right, cool. So, so now we have a level manager. So what we're going to do is we're going to define some basic functions and say public void uh, level get level status. Okay. So we're going to pass in a string level and we're going to pass in get a status. And similarly, we'll define another matching function. We'll say set level status and say string level and now we're going to use that enum that we created as level status one thing we'll change here is since you're saying get level status we're going to return a level status enum instead okay so as you can see these two are two matching functions it says one gives us a level status and one that so first let's implement the setting part and then we'll see how we use this. So here we'll use something that again ULD provides us as another class which lets us save information locally. Okay. So remember now we're playing a game and if I kill the game and, and come back two days later, I still want to make sure that if my level one was complete, it shows as level one complete, right? So we want to save this information. We can't uh, like this object and everything will get destroyed. So it needs to be saved to the hard disk, right? So for this, Unity provides us uh, something called as player prefs. So this player prefs, if you can see, you know, in the tooltip, basically it lets us store player preferences. It's short for player preferences, and uh, it's a, a nice way for us to quickly store and retrieve simple values. So here, Unity gives us uh, three basic. Uh, you know, uh, types that we can store. So we can store integer values, we can store float values, and we can store string values. Okay, cool. So what we're going to do is we're going to say in this case, we're going to use set in. We want to store it as an integer value and it takes a key value. So a key is nothing but for us, it's basically a uh, uh, key is always like string, is of the type string. And for us, the key is the level. So whether it's level one, level two, level three, and um, the value part is the level status. Now, if you notice, right, like level status is nothing, it's an enum, right? But we are saying set int. So now Unity needs to, uh, Unity is complaining that I don't understand what this is, right? It cannot convert this level status into an integer. But as we discussed when we were looking at uh, level status, these are internally stored as integers, right? Uh, even though for our readability, these are marked as uh, sort of like strings internally, like lock, unlock, complete. But when it actually compiles, right, it basically stores them as numbers, 0, 1, 2, 3, etc. So now what we'll do is we'll just put an int in front of it. So this will let Unity know that we explicitly want to convert this level status enum into an integer. Okay, so this way we basically are converting it into an integer and setting that value. Okay, so if you are setting the level status to locked, then by default we'll say locked and naturally everything gets a, a status value of zero. Right? But we don't need to keep in our mind that, oh, zero means locked, one means unlocked, two means complete, three means finished with five stars, whatever it is, right? So the moment we see locked, we know, okay, get off is not locked. All right, so, so this is basically just every time a level gets completed, we'll call this function, we'll pass its status, and then you know that, okay, now level status is set to uh, uh, complete or unlock or whatever. All right, so now uh, we will basically, uh, what we'll do is we'll say get level status. Uh, here we want to use again the same player preps and say get. Now we are using the get function and we'll say get int. Now this int is going to be the level. But the very first time if you think about it, 
which we very first time when we are running the game nothing is uh, nothing would be set uh, right so in that case we want the default value to be zero right and zero corresponds to uh, locked so if we have never specified a status for anything for this particular level it's a locked level okay so we'll catch this return value and we'll say level status level status is equal to this right but here again the same thing is happening where it will complain that this get integer returns an integer value but we're trying to save it as a level status but we know that this is an enum that can convert back and forth between uh, integer and an enum so we'll again do a reverse type cast where we'll say it uh, as level status so here we did, we wanted to save it as an integer value. So we casted it into an integer. And here we're doing a reverse cast where we're taking the integer value and type casting it back into uh, the actual status. And then we can return this level status. Okay, so two simple functions that lets us store a level status and that lets us get a level status. All right, cool. So now we have this particular level manager. We'll go into the level loader. We have the level name here. And on the level loader, what we want to do is we want to say that uh, let's do this. So first on click, first we're gonna do is uh, we'll check what the level status is. Whenever somebody clicks, uh, level will check its status so now remember the level manager that we just created so we're going to use that level manager to read this so we're going to say level manager level manager dot instance now we have this instance property on it we need the instance property on it uh, and Remember now we're accessing it through the capital I, not the small I. If I try, like it won't let me access the small I, right? So I want to do is I want to do level manager dot instance dot. Now within this dot, I'll be able to uh, do is basically, uh, give me one second. Hey, ah, sure, sure, good. If you want that, you can take that. So here what we'll do is, we'll do level manager dot instance dot first we want to say get level status pass in that level name that we have and now this will return us the status okay so now what we want to do is we want to check what the status is so i'm going to use a switch case for this so that it's uh, you don't have to write too many uh, if and else so i'm going to say case level status dot so i have three cases whether my level is locked and break so if you've used a switch case before basically it's nothing but when you have a lot of if and else cases that you want to write you can uh, easily write it write them as a switch case where you're specifying what these individual uh, values are right so here i'm gonna say that locked uh, Unlocked and complete. Okay, so what I'm doing is that my level status value can only be since it's a enum, I know its value can only be locked, unlocked, or complete. It cannot be any other value, right? So here also, if you hover right, you can see that. We never define that lock is zero just because when we are creating the enums, we just said lock is at the top. So internally, the compiler gives it the value zero. Uh, you know, uh, uh, second is unlocked, so it gets a value one. Third is locked complete, it gets a value two. So when the level is locked, for now let's just put a debug dot lock message that says uh, can't play this level till you unlock it okay and when the level is unlocked and somebody tries to hit 
play on it. We just want it to load that particular level and let the player play. Even when their level is actually complete, we want them to actually be able to play it again. Maybe they want to play to collect some extra stars, bonuses, etc., etc. So we always want our players to play the levels that have been unlocked, irrespective of whether they are unlocked or complete. So, so now we have the status, and let's go and set this up inside my game. So if you switch back, so here, remember, we have a lobby controller. We don't have a, a level service. So we're going to create an empty object. It doesn't matter since this will just have an object, a, a script attached to it. It doesn't have any UI. So we'll just call it level manager and attach a level manager object on okay so this is basically like an invisible object it doesn't have anything to show on the ui so position and all those things don't matter and we don't need anything more on top okay so now we have this level manager that we had created and now we have uh, this particular uh, setup all right so let's hit play let's see what happens so we hit play. Now think about it, what will happen? So if I click on any of these buttons, do you think we'll be able to load the level? No. Why? Because if you remember, we said that we are not, if we don't find a status for any of the levels, uh, then we assume that that level is locked. So if I click level one, can't play level because it's locked. Level two, uh, level two, can't play level because it's can't play this level till you unlock it. Same with level three, same with level four. And I can keep repeating this as many times you do. So I, right now I can't play anything, right? So we need to add that first piece of information that says that very first time when the game starts, I want my level one status to always be unlocked so that at least my player can start playing the game, right? So what we'll do is we'll go to the level manager and we'll implement this inside our start function. So here, what I want to say is that for level one, right, the very first level in the game. So I want to get that level status, level status for level one uh, let's create this as a variable so that it's very clear i'm going to say provided string level one uh, i'm going to put it from inside the inspector so tomorrow if i want to change it i don't have to worry about uh, so i'm going to get the status of the level what i'm going to say is if the status of level one equals level status dot locked right if the status is locked that means i've just installed the game and this is the very first time i'm playing it right in that case i want to set its level status to be unlocked okay so level one i want its status to say level status dot unlocked so now my level one will always be unlocked if i can mark it so once i finish this level i kill the game and restart it next time what will happen is it will again run this code inside start and the game starts right it will say is the status locked no because we would have by then updated the status to be complete right so then it won't change it to lock then it will always stay complete Cool. So what we will do is that now if we hit play, we'll basically come back here, hit play, and now if I click two, it will say locked, 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 level one. Ah, okay. Uh, we missed one. So inside the level manager, we didn't 
put in the value for what this level one is. Level one. This should be level one, right? Uh, whatever is the name of this scene, basically. All right, so play. Play. Again, level two, level three, I cannot play, but level one has to be. All right. Uh, saying some scripts are missing. Level complete. Ah, uh, because we changed the we changed the folder where the script is. So that's why. So let me just quickly fix this. We moved all the scripts inside the level folder. So you see now Unity doesn't recognize that we removed this particular script. So level complete, we're gonna remove this component and we're gonna search for level. Where did we make this level complete script? So we called it level over controller. Uh, yeah, it's a level over controller, right? So level over control. Yeah. So basically, let me just test that this thing is working correctly. Play level now. My level over. Yeah, so it's here. Level complete. And when I go into level over, it will say my player has finished the level. All right, cool. So so now this works. Um, we are able to track the status of the levels. We are able to. Um, uh, unlock levels. So now we've got to actually add in behavior for where we can uh, unlock these levels as well, right? Uh, so when my level gets complete, so here we have this level over controller, right? Which says that, hey, this level is over. This particular level is over. So now we need some way to say that the this level is over, but the next level is unlocked. Right. So what we'll do is here we'll say level manager again dot instance dot set level status and here we basically need the string name for the level. Right. So we're going to use the C manager. Instead of hard coding the names everywhere, we're gonna use the scene manager. We're gonna say get scene. Actually, let's ah, because uh, you don't have the namespace. So we're gonna use the namespace uh, dot get active scene. So this will return us a scene object, and from that scene object, we're gonna find its name. Okay. So we found the name of the scene, and now we're gonna say set level status. So we use the scene manager, find the currently active scene, we got its name, and we said that for this particular level, we want the status to be complete. Okay, so we just have a, uh, we'll put a debug log message here as well, just to know which level uh, status we are updating. So setting level setting level level status level status. So all this is doing is it's saying that I'm gonna set a level setting the level which is this the current level and its status to this. So I'm just doing string concatenation. I'm adding a bunch of strings together with this plus sign and put in this debug block. So it puts everything together in one string and it'll show up. Uh, I'm gonna say for getting, I don't really need it for getting because I have relevant message here, but for setting, yeah, we can use this one. All right, so inside my uh, level over controller, I said that, hey, level manager, set the current level status to complete because I've reached the end of the level, right? 
So let's make sure that this is working. So once we finish a specific level, we have to mark the next level. Uh, we have to mark the next level to be unlocked, right? So what we will do is we'll we'll create this outside. So so instead of directly now we can simplify a little bit here. So since we want our level unlocking and locking logic to be all inside the level manager, level manager is supposed to do manage all the levels, right? So here we'll say is public void mark, we'll create a special function which says mark level complete. So whenever this level gets completed, we basically say uh, string level, okay? So we say this mark level complete. Now in this level, we'll, whatever level is this, we'll say uh, set level status to complete and unlock the next level. So we don't want everybody else to do these two steps. So we'll put one function inside our level manager so that anybody can call this from anywhere, right? So we'll even simplify this further. Like okay? mark current level complete. Okay, so we don't even need to pass in the string. Let the level manager figure out whatever is my current level and mark that as complete. So here um, in my uh, level over controller, instead of calling this entire thing here, we'll just say level manager. Level manager dot instance dot mark current level complete because the level is completed let the level manager figure out what it needs to do when the level is complete all right so i'm gonna i just remove that line and what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna put this line here because that's essentially what we need right so we need the scene manager give us the current scene give it a name uh give get the name from it and mark the status to complete okay so i'm gonna move this particular piece outside because i need this in two places so i'm just gonna cut it out uh paste it here and i'm gonna create a scene object so scene is internal to unity unity basically when you say get active scene returns a scene object and on the scene object i can call its name now i want to unlock the next level right so for that to happen um what we will do is using this current scene object scene dot build index so we have this build index okay we're going to add plus one to that build index because we want the next level so if we set up our build indexes to be correct in in the profile so level one then level two level three are in sequence then i can use a plus one uh, that will naturally give me the next scene and based on that index i can get um, uh, using this index, the next scene index. So in uh, next scene index is nothing but the current scene index plus one, right? Now I'm gonna use scene manager dot get scene at. So this will give me at a specific index. So next scene index, again, it will be the scene object, which is called next scene. I'm just calling it next scene. This is the, uh, we can actually even rename this to be current scene. All right, so now we're saying that this is the current scene. I'm gonna take its name, I'm gonna add plus one to it. I'm gonna get the next scene and I'm gonna store that uh, so I'm going to mark the status of the next scene to be unlocked. So I'm going to say level manager here. Now I'm going to say instead of current scene, I'm going to say next scene dot name and set its status to be unlocked. Okay. 
Now here, if you see Unity is kind of like uh, Visual Studio showing us this as faded, like the scene is like dark green, like like bright green, but this is faded. Because we are inside the level manager, we don't need to uh, like call its name itself, right? We don't need to do that. We can directly do, uh, we can even get rid of this and directly call the function that we want because it's currently within the same class. So here, what we're doing is whenever a scene gets completed, we are marking its current scene's status to complete, and we are setting the next scene status to unlocked. That way, I can go to the lobby and hit play, and it'll be uh, it'll it let me play the scene. So let's see this in action. Right. Uh, let me just play. So let's see. All right, so now I have play. Remember, we are playing this for the very first time. So if I click on level two, nothing happens, can't play this level till you unlock it, All right? So let's play level one. Uh, let's make a little bit of a change to level one so it's easier for us to test it. So right now my level gets completed when uh, I hit this end part, right? So I'm just going to move the player to the uh, last platform so that my player just spawns here. I walk right and quickly test it. So I'm just going to save this, go back to lobby, hit, sorry, not save. I want to say, and hit play, play, level two doesn't let me play, level three doesn't let me play, now level one. And if I start walking to the right, my level will get complete. So my level is complete. Uh, scene index two is out of range. So we are getting some error. But here you can see that I got a message that level has level finished by the player. Setting this setting level level one status to complete. So we got that message. But scene index two is out of range. So let's see. Uh, did we not set up the build settings correctly? So we have seen index two, we have seen index three, we have seen index four. Okay. Uh, let's try this once again. Play level two, level one. I finished this level index out of range exception so let's see what is happening so it's saying level complete has level over controller has seen index out of exception so my current build index is something i do plus one uh, get scene add okay so get scene add gives me a scene that's actually i think loaded uh, so let's see what this gets the scene at index in the scene managers list of loaded scenes. So that's a problem. Right now we don't have a scene loaded by that name. So instead we'll use this other function which says get scene by build index, right? So get the scene structure from the build index and instead from the, so if you have a loaded scene, then you can use this, but here we'll say get seen by build index. So this will return us the correct uh, scene object and we'll be able to run this. So if we had a scene already loaded, then that would have worked. All right, so hit play. Let me stop this. All right, let's hit play. Play, level one. Now, if I mark this as complete, so here you see uh, level status is marked complete, and uh, the status. Why is it not showing a string? See dot name. So we're not getting the name of this particular scene. Hmm, that's odd. So here, if you see, right, like we got level one, we got this level one 
uh, and marked as complete. But here we didn't get the level one part out of it. So somewhere this particular thing is not returning us the name of that particular scene. So let's try and see why is that. So if you look at get scene by build index, this should return us the data structure. A reference to the scene if valid. If not valid, scene. If not, an invalid scene is returned. Okay. So let's quickly look at if there are some other attributes inside the scene class that we can use. Uh, let's see, is loaded, build index, is dirty, root, no, 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 get root object, get key object. Um, hmm. That is odd. It should have this build index as well as a name property. Yeah, it has this name property, so it should uh, give us the name, returns the name of the scene that is currently active in the game or the app. Hmm. For some reason, it's not returning us the name. Okay, that's... Hmm. We'll have to probably default to managing our own names list. Uh, but yeah, this is something that we can look into, but ideally what's supposed to happen is that you basically get the next scene and through the next scene's name, you're basically able to get that name and pass it into the set level status function. And we're going to mark it as, uh, mark it as basically uh, copy. Are there any issues with level two? Um, I think there might be that level script missing. Yeah, so, but we didn't even try to load this level, right? So it might be some other issue. Uh, so we have this level over controller. Uh, and yeah, here also you see, right? Like level over uh, script, since we moved it into the folder, you really couldn't recognize it. So now you have to go and make this change manually to all the levels. It was better if this was set up as a feedback, right? So remote component, uh, level over control. Okay, so let's see what happens if I just play again. I think it might return us the level name, which is currently already loaded. So we haven't loaded uh, level two. So if I just go to the right, I finish the level. Yeah, so I think it might return us the name of the level that have been loaded already. But it is, so it's returning us level one, but it's not returning us level two, right? So I think that might be the issue. Uh, scene manager gets seen by build index. Uh, we have, we're getting the current scene. Let's see if there is some other API or a function. Uh, active scene change, get scene, get all scenes, deprecated, get scene at, get the scene at index inside the scene manager for stuff. This is loaded scenes from the build index, scene with a given name, scene with a given path, merge scenes, reference, scene count and build settings. Seen loaded, unloaded, set active, unload. Hmm. So that seems like the most appropriate function gets seen by build index, and this should have returned us the scene name, right? So let's look at if we can figure out some other properties on this that we can use. Next scene dot build index is dirty, is loaded, is subscene, is valid. Whether there is a valid scene, a scene may be invalid. If, for example, we try to open a scene that does not exist. And in this case, the scene returns on this returns false. 
let's see what this is valid returns just to debug it uh, next scene is valid and let's see what the value is coming out to be is valid all right so I think so we just want to mark it as a string. Let's say it is valid. And general convert type. But uh, this is a method. Sorry, I thought it's a property. And let's see. So this is the return as is valid. Let's quickly test this out and see what's happening. All right, now play level one, we go to the end. Okay, so it's returning false. That's probably why. So it's not able to see that the scene is valid. That's the reason why we're not getting the name out of it as well. Okay, so what we can do is, we can obviously use the build index as well. Um, so we don't really need to rely on uh, names as such, so we can use build index uh, instead of names, but we'll have to change too many things up uh, for that to happen. So I think what might be better is that instead of relying on Unity Scene Manager to give us all the information, we just set up uh, this information ourselves, right? So we already have our, uh, uh, so we'll just define basically public uh string array of levels okay so and instead of this having this level one we'll just say levels zero basically the zeroth index of this array and we'll just use that all right so this is not needed we'll define all the levels that we have in this particular array and that way we can trigger uh, using that so this we know works we have the currency we have the name uh, we are able to directly uh, get the value from this it basically gives us this value where uh, we get the name from here and we use to find the next scene uh, from this particular array cool uh, so now what we want to do is instead of this logic let's just uh, comment this out for now. We want to do is we want to find the uh, next scene, right? So we want to find uh, the index where the current scene name is. So we're going to use a function called array dot find. So this is an internal uh, C sharp defined function inside the system package. So we're going to pass in the array. Our password the array is called levels, and we're going to find a a specific level where uh, this level is equal to the current scene dot name okay so all we're doing is we are loop instead of creating a loop for loop and checking each memory all we're saying is hey array dot find function uh, we're passing in the data structure of levels um, and within this data structure, we're saying for each level inside this levels array, check if this name matches this name, right? So since this levels array defines nothing but the name of all the levels, we find where this particular uh, thing exists. Um, so actually we need the index, right? So we don't need where this is, we're gonna find, we use the same thing, but we call a formula different function index because we wanna find where the current index is and then add one to it and, and that will give us the next index, right? So uh, this will say, uh, actually we don't even need to do this, right? Like we have the index already, but this is the build index, so there might be a survey. Yeah, let's just keep it this way. So, um, current scene index is equal to this. And this is nothing but 
an integer number only so int next scene index is equal to current scene index plus one and if levels dot uh, length is equal to hey Take us just walk around uh, could you give me like 10 15 minutes okay oh, thank you so what we're going to do is we're going to do is uh, levels dot length uh, what we want to make sure is that when we hit the last level we are not unlocking a level that does not exist right so when you complete level four we don't end up unlocking level five thinking level five exists so we're going to check is that if the next uh, next scene index is less than the length of the level then only we're gonna say is set level status to sorry levels excuse me sorry uh, levels next seen index uh, to level status dot unlocked so if you don't even have a level five then there's no point saying that unlock the level that's five right so i'm just going to remove this so hopefully this gives you a good idea of how how this work so let's test this out and make sure that this is working so we're in the lobby screen, we hit play. Index was outside the bounds of the array where, uh, ah, so we didn't, uh, in the level manager, we have this array, but we didn't define any data in it, right? So here we want to have four elements and each element is level one, level two, level three, and level four. Okay, cool. So now we have this. Oops, sorry, I pressed save accidentally. Play. We resize it a little bit so that it doesn't look like overlap. Okay, so hit play. Now we have level one. We complete level one. And now we have level two unlocked. Okay, so now why are we not when we get this level complete why are we not seeing the uh the game over screen right we should basically see that game over screen uh to show up so this game over screen is currently marked where did we set it up uh, I think it was in the level start, level complete, key, enemy, level, it was in level over, right? Uh, level market as complete, and oh, we were only showing it when the game is over, not when this is over, right? So when game is over, we were setting uh, this particular thing to true, right? Then the player was dying. Now we want to show it when the uh, when we want to show a similar screen, which basically, uh, you know, uh, shows us level complete instead of game over. So this can be done as like a bonus assignment. So let's try and uh, do that. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll keep that as another bonus where you can go in and create a new level uh, complete screen, similar to how we have a game over screen and show that when the level is completed okay so it's very similar to how we do the uh, uh, how we do the game over screen flow right so same way you go in and create a new screen the mark is complete and and that's it all right cool so uh, so hopefully i know we're, today we covered a lot of in-depth coding so it might take you a while to understand and get a hang of all of these things so uh, feel free to watch the video again. I'll upload it later uh, today as well. So uh, get a full hang of it, and and you know uh, that way you can. Uh, if anything is again not clear, just feel free to pull it up in in, 
in Discord and we can take the discussion from there, all right? Cool. So this has already been shared with everyone so you guys can have access to it. Uh, make sure um, that you're able to implement this. If you're facing any issues, we'll be there to help you out. And yeah, cool, all right, awesome. Today will be the last session that we focus on the Guli project. Next week we'll be starting a 3D project, but before we can do that, there are a few key things that we need to still implement in our game. Uh, so uh, today, two sort of main things that we'll be looking at is uh, mainly the sound system and how we'll implement something like that. And then uh, a little bit about the particle sets. Um, so those are the kind of two main things. <clears throat> so let's just jump right in. So the first thing we'll do is basically we'll implement, uh, uh, we'll get a basic understanding of what uh, uh, sounds are, how they work in Unity, and uh, how we can set them up. And then uh, we'll start implementing some of these common sounds that you need throughout the game. So the first thing we'll implement is, we'll just create a new folder to keep our scripts organized. We call it sound. And here I'm going to implement a sound manager class. Uh, sound manager. And let's switch to coding first. So the whole idea here is that you have a lot of these common sounds, more or less that things that you need to play uh, throughout your game, right? So if you remember from last session, we discussed something about simultaneous, right? So we'll implement a very similar strategy uh, where we have a sound manager that's a single team, and then we'll consistently use the same sound manager throughout our, uh, throughout our game and anywhere we can easily refer to uh, the different sounds that we want to play, okay? So there are basically, uh, Two things that you should know about Unity's uh, sound uh, setup. So if I switch back to Unity and quickly show you, so if I'm, I'm just going to create a new, so I'm just going to quickly create a new MP game object. I'm going to rename it to uh, Sound Manager and attach the Sound Manager script on it. All right, so that's a basic setup, right? But there are a few more things that we need in order to make sure that we can actually play sounds. So for that, if you search for sound, uh, if you search for audio, so the word is actually audio, not sound for Unity's inbuilt uh, components. So there you see something called an audio source. Uh, so this is where you will actually be able to uh, play a certain audio, right? So as you can see, there are a bunch of these different settings on top. So we'll look a little bit into once we start playing something, don't worry about that. But the main thing to note is that there is something called as an audio source. And this is uh, attached to a game object, uh, much like any other component, like rigid bodies and rigid collisions and whatnot we have seen so far, right? So uh, this component lets us play a certain uh, audio clip, okay, and what is an audio clip? An audio clip is the actual file. So if you want to play, say, like a, a, a shotgun sound, right, when you find a shotgun, right, so that .mp3 file or whichever format uh, you're using, that file is a, basically a clip, right? Uh, the audio source is the object on which you tell uh, that audio source that, hey, play this clip. Right, and there are different ways that you can play it. So uh, we can have one audio source, but we can continue playing a lot of clips on it, uh, as you will see shortly as well. So uh, a standard sort of you know uh, strategy that a lot of the games use. So if you think about you know any any popular game, you will have like a, a background music that's always playing, right? But then you have these special effects like you know, shooting, jumping, dying, uh, these sounds that only play when some event happens in the game, right? 
So, um, what games would usually do is uh, they'll create <coughs> they create different game objects. So here, this would be like the sound uh, BG. So if you have like a background music, right? Uh, just to be here, let me go back and BG music, and you will have an audio source on it, right? So instead of directly having an audio source on the uh, sound manager itself, you can create dedicated uh, uh, sound sources that have responsibility for playing a specific type of a sound. So when you have a constant music playing, you can put it, uh, the clip for that, you can put it inside the audio source on this sound uh, background music. And then if you have like uh, uh, player related sounds that always need to play, right? So you can do this similar process. I'm just quickly uh, going to duplicate this object. And this would become your say sound S effect, which is special effects, right? So anytime you have this shoot sound, jump sound, that is sound, right? Like these special effects that happen only at a certain point in the game, right? So if I remove this from here, um, so yeah. So now you have these two different objects that can play sound, uh, but for special things. So now I can have a music playing while I'll have another, uh, uh, you know, uh, these special effects come on top, right? We have explosion effects, things like that, right? So, so typically this is how uh, you will create a hierarchy of objects and you will uh, be able to play a lot of different sounds at the same time as well. Cool. So, so that's a basic kind of a setup that you should know about. So two main uh, things are the audio sources and the audio clips. So if I just click on the audio clips, as you can see, since we imported the, uh, the sample thing, right? Like the, we use the assets from this uh, project that Unity provides. So it comes with a bunch of these different sounds. As you can see, there's sounds for the character footsteps. Um, there is uh, attack animation related sounds. Um, and, and I mean, when you select them in the, so if I search here, you can actually, uh, so let's say this is Chomper, it's the character that we added, right? So you can actually uh, use this to actually play in the game. So you might not be able to hear it because I don't know if it's an iPhone, but basically you can play it and get a feel of how the sound will actually play out, how long it is, etc., etc. You can get a sense of it before you even play it before you even set it up in the game, right? Okay, cool. So first thing first, we need to uh, play, let's see if there is some music related sound. So we have some music. Uh, so we have music for gameplay. So we'll use this one for actually playing as background music. Uh, and we'll set up, we'll set it up in a way where we can even change it. Um, so, so as you can see, there's, uh, when the player dies, they have a different, different type of a music. And during that normal gameplay, we have a different kind of music. Um, during an actual fight, I'm guessing this might be for say like a boss fight or something, right? That might have a custom music for it. So um, this background music will will change it through code uh, based on what's happening in the game, right? And then the effects can also be like, you can do the same thing when you want to have a special thing for like, like enemy effects and player effects. There's a lot of sounds and you can even have two different uh, duplicate objects, one just for playing enemy sounds and one just for playing say player sounds, right? So things like that. <coughs> Sorry. Um, all right, cool. So let's jump into code and see how we can get this out. Um, so first thing first, um, we'll do a very, uh, basic sound for uh, when you click any kind of a button in the game, right? So buttons can be on multiple screens everywhere uh, within the game. So we'll do a simple uh, functionality where we are able to play one specific sound um, whenever a button gets clicked. So for that to happen, what we'll do is uh, we'll define an enum and this is called sounds and <clears throat> this will let us 
uh, easily figure out uh, from which sort of uh, uh, for which sound type is the corresponding clip. So, so for now, like I'm just gonna call it button kick. <clears throat> so you can define these again. The enums are our, our custom user defined, so you don't have to. Um, you know you can name them pretty much anything so what we'll do is we'll define something so, so say like um, player move player uh, death enemy death so these are like you know uh, certain events or certain things then these things happen you want to play their respective sounds so first let me just move over uh, some of the code uh, from uh, the level manager. So the basic uh, functionality for implementing a singleton, right? Uh, it's just gonna cop copy over because that remains pretty much common in all the classes, right? Uh, so yeah, so this is good. Instance, and you guys to change the sound manager and do the same here. We don't need these levels, we need instead something else. So what we'll do is we'll define another class here. Sorry. Uh, so we'll define another class here, which will basically say sound uh, type. So what this class does is for each, uh, in a type, right? So our sounds, this sounds that you've defined, uh, sound type, and corresponding audio clip, uh, we just call it sound clip, okay? So what we're doing is we're creating a small class that just holds this data that says for a specific sound type enum that we have defined, this is the corresponding clip. Uh, this is the corresponding audio clip to audio clip, okay? And we'll look at, so what we'll do, have to do is, we'll have to define something called as uh, serializable. So this is something uh, uh, how Unity internally treats it. So if I don't put the serializable tag, this uh, particular class won't show up in the inspector. And I want that from the inspector, I should be able to, customize that for which particular sound I want to play what kind of music, right? So here I'm going to define an array of sound type. And this is basically an array and I'm just going to call it sounds. Um, right? So what this is, is basically an array of, uh, of objects of this type. And each object will let me define uh, that for a specific sound, like a button click, this is the corresponding sound. The player move, this is the corresponding sound. And I don't need to do this in code. I can do it inside the inspector and I can change it, right? So the logic for actually playing the sound remains the same, but I don't need to worry about it. I'm just gonna minimize this out of the way. Okay, cool. So hopefully uh, that's clear that we've created this array and this array is nothing but a uh, objects of this class thing. Okay, so now what we want to do is we want to <clears throat> we want to define a play function. So void play and this play function will take a um, sound type argument, right? So we want from anywhere in the game, we don't want the game to pass in different clips and things like that. If there is a button in the lobby, all that button cares about is when that button gets clicked, then it calls this play function and it passes in this button click <coughs> sound type and naturally the button click sound gets played. Okay, so first we need to find what is the corresponding clip for this and then play that back. Okay, so first things we'll have to find the clip. So first, <coughs> sorry, um, so we'll say audio audio clip, clip is equal to get sound clip. So this is a new function that we are defining 
and we'll pass in this sound uh, to it. Um, so we'll just use uh, sorry, chapter eight work. So basically, we want to create this new function. Uh, what we'll do is we'll say uh, normally. Or, yeah, this shortcut is what I was trying to do. But anyways, um, so what we here we did was we created a new function that returns us an audio clip. All this function will do is is search through this array and figure out where this particular um, where this particular audio clip exists within that array. Okay, so for this we'll use a, a different function. So we can. Typically, what you'll do is you'll create a for loop. You start from index zero and go all the way to the length of the array uh, or the number of the count of elements in the array. But the quicker way is to use this inbuilt function in the array class, uh, which is array dot find. Okay, and the first thing we pass in is basically the actual array through from where we want to find something, and then the condition that uh, says that this is the this is the object that we want. So we'll say clip. Uh, the format is pretty uh, sort of no, not the clip. Sorry, an item. And just bear with me. I'll just quickly explain what this particular uh, uh, you know statement means. So we'll say sound type is equal to sound, and this is what we will return. Okay. Yeah. So what this is saying is that basically I'm you know, I've done a, a shorter version of writing a pop book, uh, and it's much more efficient as well. So what here it is doing is that it's taking the sounds array that we defined up here, and it's picking up each item in that array, which is nothing but an object of this class sound type. Now this item is of if I hover over it, you see that it's basically of the sound type, uh, which is this, right? And within this, we have two members, right? One is the actual sound type value, the enum, and then the actual clip that corresponds to it, right? So we're trying to find the sound that matches the sound type. So uh, when we find that particular object, we uh, so if you hover over it, this is basically returning me the sound type object, right? So I can't directly return this. I want to return an audio clip. So my bad there. Um, so this will return me a sound type, and this will be sound. Now, uh, why is there an error? Cannot be applied to the sounds and sound type. Uh, sounds. Sound type is basically this. Ah, okay. So sorry, duplicate name. So I'm just gonna call it item. Um, the name was conflicting, so that's why there. Okay. So what this is is it's giving me a sound type. Now what I'll do is I'll if item is uh, not equal to null, I'll simply return item dot clip. Remember what we were doing was we were finding the clip. Uh, if we don't find it, we just return null, right? So we all we're doing here is we're iterating through the array and returning once we find something out of it. Okay. So if we have found the clip, so if clip is not equal to null, then we basically need to play that clip, right? So here we need to play that clip. So for playing that clip, remember we need that sound source. So we'll come back up again here and define our sound source. Sorry, not sound source, audio source. Unity's internal thing is called audio source. So audio source. And now this we are talking about the special effect source. This is not for the background music, right? So we'll say um, sound effect. Similarly, we'll define another one for audio source, sound, music. Okay, so 
Cool. So what we're doing here is we're playing a special sound and all we say is sound effect dot. So this will have a play function. So you have play. So here you can see right there are a lot of different versions of play. So you have the standard play function, you have a play delayed, uh, which means played after a certain delay. Play one shot means basically you give it a clip and it will play only once. Uh, and similarly, you can do a schedule, you can schedule it for some time in the future, things like that. So there are a lot of these different functions that you can play around with. So for now, we're going to use, since we are treating, uh, since you are playing these special effects, right? So for special effects, we'll basically use this function called play one shot. So whenever a player dies, you don't keep want to keep playing the death sound over and over again, right? You just want to play it at that particular time in one shot. And once the sound ends, it ends, right? So these, the effects for playing out these kind of effects, you will typically use something like the play one shot uh, uh, function. So here we'll pass in the clip and that's it. Uh, else, we'll just put an helpful else message. Uh, obviously this is not needed, but we'll, this is good for knowing when we weren't able to find, remember the cells will get played when the clip is equal to null, right? So if it is not null, we play the cell, but if it didn't find a clip, right, then it means that there is a, probably there's an error while setting up our game. So, uh, clip not found for sound type sound. So all we're doing is we're giving a helpful message, uh, to whoever is currently playing the game saying, hey, uh, it seems like there's some error here, right? Uh, so let's now connect this particular sound for our lobby buttons. So in our lobby, if you remember, right, we basically uh, implemented that any time I click the play button, I can simply uh, open the level selection screen so here, I just want to say sound manager dot instance. Remember, since it's an singleton, we have this flexibility of just, uh, you know, uh, directly calling dot instance and the function on it. So we don't need to find which game object it is, etc. And here I just say play the button click sound. Now, similarly in my level, uh, whenever I am selecting a specific level, that's also a button, right? So similarly, I'll just go to my uh, level where have we created the level loader. Yeah, so on the level loader, uh, we basically can, so here, like, you know, uh, we can have a different uh, sound uh, for a error click, right? Like you're trying to click a button that you can't, right? In this case, like when the level is locked, um, we can play a different kind of sound. So in this case, for now, we'll just connect this first one. So we'll say again, sound manager, sound manager dot instance dot play and sounds dot button click. Okay. And same thing we'll do. So with just one line of code in other places, we are able to play the right type of sound without doing much of effort because all the logic for our actual sound piece is hidden away nicely inside this one class. All right, so now let's switch back to Unity. Okay, local parameter item cannot be declared in the same scope. Ah, okay, so item name is same because this is also item, this is also item. So I'm gonna just change this to I for now because it's any a temporary variable. All right, so let's switch back. Okay, yeah, then it's gone. Cool. So now what we want to do is, if you look at the sound manager, remember we defined this array. And uh, here we have to drag in the right element. So for background music, this is the audio source. For sound effects, this is the audio source. Uh, one thing I'll do is I'll just rearrange some of the things here. Um, so I'll move this sound object. Since it's a list, right? It'll, take up a lot of space in the inspector, I'll just move it at the bottom. 
So it shows at the bottom and when I expand it, the other attributes don't get hidden. Okay, so for now we're just playing one sound. Uh, so I'm just gonna set it up to two. What I'll say is for button click, the audio, let's see, find if there is a button sound. Yeah, so there is, you see here are these different button sounds, right? Um, button start, button click. So I'll just assign a simple button one. And for the second one, I'm gonna say, hey, this is a, uh, okay, we didn't define a enum for music, right? So we'll create a separate enum. Um, so we'll come back to this uh, for now, but first let's test that whenever I say button, play the button click sound, am I able to play the uh, menu button sound or not? All right, uh, let's, which level are we in? Are we in the lobby? Yes, we are in the lobby. All right, so let's hit play. Uh, there are no audio listeners. All right, cool. So one more problem that we found out, since this particular uh, scene doesn't remember, it's just pure UI, so we remove the camera. So whenever you create a new scene, you uh, have a default camera that comes with it, right? So by default in Unity, the camera also contains a uh, audio listener. So if I show you here, main camera, uh, so you see this here, so there's an audio listener. So right now we are in level one where you have the player and the levels of the camera is there. But in our main scene, there is no uh, audio listener. So that's why, uh, you know, uh, Unity started complaining that there is no audio listener. So you need this uh, listener to actually be able to render the uh, music because if you don't have a listener, it's as good as you know everything is on mute basically. So what we will do is we will switch to Unity. We'll attach a audio listener directly to this object, uh, our sound manager. So that our sound manager is a singleton. Every time we switch a scene, um, the listener would still exist because um, sound manager says don't destroy on board, right? It is basically what we covered last time. So uh, once this object has been created, it will never be destroyed. So whatever is attached to this object will also never be destroyed, right? Ah, cool. So now if I hit play, you'll see that uh, uh, that we don't get that listener uh, thing basically, right? Uh, okay, so if I hit play, okay. So I think you will not be able to hear this, but because of my headphones, I will try. Uh, again. Okay, I'm not sure if you're getting this on the voice on the thing as well. Yeah, sir, we are getting this. We are able to hear the clips. All right, cool, perfect. So yeah, so as you can see, like anytime I click, I simply get that same, uh, uh, you know, uh, audio clip play. So. But what we can see now is that we're getting a new error. There are two audio listeners. That's because if you look here under don't destroy and load, so we have two simple things. One, basically a level manager and the other sound manager. Uh, we attach the sound manager uh, audio listener, but by default all our levels have a player and that player has a camera, right? So you'll have an audio listener on this particular thing. So now it's up to you how you want to structure it. More or less, ideally, the, the best way to do it is that you have one audio listener that remains consistent throughout your game. So in this case, you'll just switch to the level and you'll quickly go into the main camera and just remove this uh, component from there. So you don't need to do anything else. Um, since this change is on a prefab, you can simply apply and now this will apply to all the, uh, all the other, uh, you know, Scenes as well. Uh, let's make sure. Yeah. Sir, we just need only one audio listener uh, in our complete project, or uh, every uh, scene view have uh, a personal audio listener. No, you can have only one. The whole idea is that there is something listening to that audio. So um, typically, you would have multiple sources playing, but only one listener. Uh, Right now we are working on 2D, right? So you can, you could implement multiple uh, audio listeners, but it won't serve too much purpose. 
uh, typically where you will have multiple audio listeners is um, in like a 3D game, right? So what will happen is that uh, the reason why Unity attaches uh, um, the audio listener to the camera is imagine if you have, uh, you know, a, like a PUBG kind of a game, right? So if you have your character somewhere on the screen and you have another character, uh, you know, in the distance who's your teammate, and if you have like some kind of ability where you can switch from one character to another character, right? Something like that. So if a gunshot is fired right next to you when you're character one, you'll hear it really close. But the moment you switch to another character, now your camera is also on that character. If that gunshot is fired and this character is far away, you should hear it slower, right? So typically you'll use uh, a combination of 3D sounds and uh, audio listeners for those kind of scenarios. But for the context of a 2D game, you more or less for intermediate complexity kind of projects, there aren't kind of use cases where you need multiple audio listeners. Cool. Okay. Uh, then uh, the audio listener in that 2D game can be attached anywhere or in any scene or like on the main scene. So wherever you need the audio, you need to attach it there. So if you have an audio with, so like we added audio in the very first uh, scene, then there's a button click. So you need an audio listener there. If it's only available at level one, then you can keep clicking buttons. You will never hear any sound till you reach level one. So wherever is the point you need to listen to an audio or play an audio that needs to be that the player needs to listen to, you need to have an audio listener from that scene, basically. Okay, I get that. All right. Cool. So so now you get able to play that particular audio. So similarly, we'll do something for uh are basically background music so we'll create uh, a title for music and here we'll basically get this clip um, so for background music since it's a special thing like it has its own uh, object so usually a simpler thing is to play uh, to create a separate function just to keep the sound effects and uh, music onto separate, uh, you know, two separate entities. So, uh, so we'll have sounds, sounds. So it will look similar to how we implemented the the normal play function, uh, where more or less you're doing the same thing. You're first trying to find where within this uh, array of things is my uh, music, and then you'll just say play. Uh, but here, you what you want to do is you want to uh, actually let's not do that in code. I'll I'll show you how to set it up there. Uh, the music will keep playing sort of forever, right? Uh, so instead of sound effects, we want to play it on the sound music uh, source. Remember, we defined two two sources up here. One was the effect source, and one was the music source, right? So for background music, whenever the music changes. We want to play it on the uh, play it on the directly music source. So what we will do is whenever the game starts directly, uh, we have the start function that will get called by Unity, and at the start function itself, we will directly play the uh, the specific clip. Uh, why is clip showing an error? Play. Okay, so one second. Sound music dot clip. You say clip and then play. So here the uh, when you say play one shot, you basically pass in the uh, clip as an argument. But when you say normal play, you basically just do uh, you assign the value on the music. Uh, dot clip property and I'll show you what this property is in the inspector right now. Um, and here, whenever we hit play and the game starts, we just want the music to start. So we'll simply call it play music and we'll pass in sounds dot music. Uh, we don't need this global flag. Okay. Why are you? Ah, okay, because it's outside. The enum is outside. Uh, 
but this should still I this is because the sounds and this sounds have the same name. All right, so let's undo this. We gave the same name, that's why Unity is asking us to name it with uh, this global flag, which means that I'm not referring to the uh, sounds uh, array, but I'm referring to this sounds enum that's defined outside. Okay, so if you've named it something else, you would not need this global flag. All right, so let's switch to here. Now inside the sound manager, if you remember, we have uh, our enums, right? So we didn't define anything for the second one. So we'll pick up music, we'll search the music for regular gameplay and we'll hit this here and that should do it. So we already have a reference for all of this. So the clip part that we assigned was basically uh, here. So as you can see, um, this one has, for some reason, by default, uh, LN range attack three, for some reason, but we'll just set it to none, reset it basically. And this is that audio clip property that we just set it over here. So uh, whenever we found the clip, we basically set it on the sound music, right? And then hit play. So when we call that, line you'll see the audio clip show up, the right clip show up here so if i hit play now the music will start playing the moment we hit play so here you can see the music gameplay audio clip showed up are you guys able to hear the music with my headphones all right let me stop because the music volume is too loud i can hear what you get yeah, did you guys able to hear the music or no? Right, I'm guessing you didn't, but just for purposes, I'll just unhook my headphones and now you guys should be able to hear the music. All right, so that's basically the music. Now, if you notice, uh, right now, the FX has no audio clip on it, right? But the music has this music game over here. Uh, sorry, audio clip. So the moment I hit play, you'll see like an audio clip show up there. So now you can hear these and it just plays them in like a single shot. Alright, uh, so the other things that you can play around with is, so we, on the code side, we've kept the entire setup to be very simple. And now this lets us control how we want. So when the player dies, so let's say when the game over happens, right? Um, uh, the player basically has, has been killed, right? So in that case, you could come in and say, uh, if he had a new um, uh, sound manager dot instance, dot play music and give it another, um, you know, enemy, in this case, player death, right? We haven't defined what player death is. And if you try to call this right now, um, the game will throw an error because obviously uh, we need to first assign what player death music is. So if we quickly do that as well, let's do this to three because now we want another element and say player death and on that what audio file do we have do we have some audio file so we have gunner death boss death music death so we have some music for death uh, which we'll just play here and for now let's just use this gunner death for player death as well so just to showcase what happens right so now whenever the player dies we show the game over screen and we switch the music to play that. So let's go to level one and set up. So it's easier for us to test this scenario. Uh, so we'll move our player closer to our enemy and save, switch back to lobby, hit play. Now, whenever, let me see, make sure you guys are able to get it. So now we hit play. Now you can see here both the sounds and whenever you 
you know, there's this different kind of uh, music that kicks in the moment uh, the player dies. So if I switch here to background music, here you see there's the kind of death audio clip instead of the regular music, right? Uh, now I could do that, then I go back to lobby, you know. Uh, okay, I think we didn't hook it up correctly. Can't play this level until you unlock it. Uh, so whenever we restart the scene, whenever we hit play again, or whenever we go back to the lobby, we can program it again to start playing the normal music and not the death music, right? So, so you can go ahead and create those things up. But that's basically how the basic system set up. So now we'll just quickly look at, uh, you know, the different sort of things that we have available at our, uh, you know, disposal uh, on how to, uh, what are sort of configurations that we can achieve. So uh, most common use case is the, the volume, right? So if there is a, um, you know, you have a strong music playing in the background, so you might have the music at full volume, but you want the special effects in certain places to be toned down, right? Like you just want the, the band from a, a shotgun to be slightly lower. So you'll just turn this value to be uh, save half, right? Uh, in this way, the intensity of the music or the volume of the music is half of what it is. So, so you can play around with all of these kind of values and, and you can set up a lot more details into it, but that sort of is in a nutshell how you go about setting up a basic um, setup for music. So Unity recently introduced, well not recently, a few years back, but introduced this something called as an audio mixer. So what this lets you do is basically create your own custom sounds within Unity itself. Um, and this is something that, that usually a dedicated sound designer or an artist would do, uh, more or less. But something that if, if you are interested into, you know, creating unique sounds for your game, you can actually have a complex combination of sounds. So I have a player death music that I wanted to fluctuate and then I have this uh, death special effect sound on top and then another special effect and I can layer these things in and create a complex hierarchy. So it's almost like a, a mini uh, uh, kind of mini sort of what, uh, uh, sound mixing. If I don't know if you've uh, used these uh, or heard of these tools like uh, Audacity uh, and such, which lets you kind of create and compose music, right? So here you're not really composing music, but you're more like blending music together uh, from different tracks and creating like a complex, uh, you know, a complex system of, uh, of different sounds. So, so you can assign an audio mixer that lets you control a lot of these things. So if I wanted to show you, I think I need to create a new asset for it. Uh, I've personally never created a new audio mixer myself. Like I said, right? like it's uh, uh, something that usually an artist would go in and create uh, for you or like a dedicated sound designer, things like that. So, so you can define a specific sound mixer and it has like a, these different volumes and, and whatnot. And you can actually like, you know, uh, I can move this window here. All right, so here you can see, you can create, uh, you know, levels for how high, how low you want. You have different groups to create subgroups inside it. So, so you can keep increasing in complexity in terms of how you want uh, things to be visible or uh, heard, not visible, sorry, heard in this case, right? So, so you can keep creating, it's like a mini system in itself. So fairly complex, but nothing that you should worry about, but just something good to know that, hey, something as complex as this also exists where you can create your own custom blend using different audio clips that your uh, sound design is made up of. All right, cool. So that's a basic setup for sounds. Um, so what, let me switch back to Trello. So we created this singleton sound manager that we can consistently use in all our scenes. Um, we have animate sounds for uh, button clicks and similarly you can create sounds for uh, player movement. One thing I quickly can show you as well, the most common functionality is um, say like a mute 
kind of functionality. How do you mute music? So typically you have settings and you can uh, mute certain sounds, right? So normally what you would do is you would uh, define something like uh, public void mute and pass it a pool status, which basically says that uh, do you want to mute the music? So if you say mute and pass it true, that means uh, the player wants to mute and same with mute passing false means they, un they don't want to mute, right? So typically you'll define a property here which says public bool is, is mute and by default you want the music to play so it will be set to false. So that means my game is currently not on mute, right? And is, so whenever I change my settings to uh, mute, is mute is equal to, sorry, not false, status. So basically I'm updating my settings to be true or false, okay? Now, what will happen is whenever you want to call a function, say play, right? Uh, before you actually play, first you want to check whether something is on mute or not, right? So typically what you'll do is you'll put if is mute, that means that my game is currently on mute, I'll just simply return, right? I don't want to play any music while my game is on mute, right? So, and you'll do the same thing when you want to play a uh, sound effect as well. So you just simply return, you'll not worry about finding the clip, you'll not worry about playing it, etc., etc. And you'll simply return whenever uh, the game says that you're correctly on mute. And that's the simplest way you can, uh, you can mute a set a specific thing, right? Um, same thing you can do for uh, changing the, the volume of the music as well, right? So if, now in this case, if you notice, mute is a true or a false kind of a thing, right? But uh, volume is not just a true or a false, it's a number. So typically the volume will range from zero all the way to one. Zero means essentially it's a mute, but uh, one means like full volume, right? So, so you'll define it as volume and by default you want it to be uh, one, right? Max volume. So we'll set it to one. Of course, you can change these default values depending on the design of your game. Okay, cool. Uh, so same way, what you will do is whenever you're changing the volume, you'll simply go in and say, um, if I have another function for it, what public void uh, volume and pass in the new uh, volume value, right? Like whatever is the volume my game wants it to set it to, right? So we'll just say uh, volume. Here I'm gonna set call it set volume because we have the local the variable defined as volume as well, so we can't give it the same name. So we'll just say uh, volume is equal to volume, and on both the sources, right? So sound effects and sound music will apply this new volume. So we'll say sound effect dot volume is equal to this new volume value. Sorry, not volume. volume. And sound music dot volume. So the moment I change the volume value, naturally my volume will immediately get applied to both my sound sources. You could define where you have, again, like how we have separate functions for play music and play uh, sound effects. You can have very separate for set volume sound effects, set volume music. So that way you have independent control over uh, what uh, volume you want to set. So uh, let's say at the start of the game, I want to set the uh, volume to be half, right? Or something like that. So in that case, you can just directly control this behavior through the script as well by saying uh, play. Before you call play music, you can directly say play, oh, sorry, set volume, not play. Set volume and pass in a value of 0.5 F, right? Because it takes a throw. So that way your uh, audio clips, sorry, audio sources, both the sources will have the volume set. 
to that and after the for the entire duration of the game till the time you change this volume again uh, everything will play at half its volume okay cool uh, any any questions so far so let's just come back to unity make sure everything's compiling all right I'm just gonna delete this and then try to use it or anything all right um let me see okay so let's just track and sounds for static so yeah you can um uh, look through the assets and see there are a lot of different sound assets that are available uh within the uh the project the 2d project that we started with so you can start implementing those specific sounds and connecting them to specific things like player death enemy death uh picking the key uh, that's a special sound effect so things like that you can connect them okay um yeah so going over to the next topic now um where particle effects so particle effects much like sounds is a fairly um uh, complex topic it's from a programmer's perspective you should know the basics of getting a, a particle effect set up uh, but practically for good particle effects more or less you would need um uh some external help be it from another programmer or be it from another artist uh some art assets and such like that right or even you know um, there are a lot of open source um freely available particle effects that are published that you can use so typically these are fairly complex systems um and and you can think of you know particle effects as uh you know like if you have a uh, um a win condition right like like when you win the level and there's like confetti flying all over the screen right the those are typically particle effects explosions fire um a lot of these are basically particle effects where you have a lot of these small particles which can take a certain shape a certain size and then you can basically um by default like you know configure uh how high they fly whether they fly in a specific direction things like that right so typically particle effects are slightly complex to handle um and and controlling and getting a hang of them can be pretty complex in itself uh i'll give you a basic overview of how to go about setting up a a particle effect uh and and you can do that for basically both 2d particle effects and 3d particle effects and things like that uh but for now we'll just look into something for 2d particle effects so let's check if we have some assets uh for particles let's see we have health particle we have particle and bubbles heat uh project tile all right so let's set up uh something all right so as you can see here there unity has this kind of shortcut right for if, if you go inside effects there is a particle system effect so i'll expand this so you guys can see clearly okay so as you can see it attached this uh custom component and it has so many of these sort of um in some sense almost like a child component and each of them is basically expandable right so this has certain properties this has certain properties they're grayed out because they're disabled very much like how you could disable and enable certain uh components on a game object so each of them are disabled by default the first two and the last are the ones that will more or less always be enabled right so emission shape and render so what emission um, does is basically define how your particles are generated right uh, are they generated over time are they generated in a, in a burst uh, what distance they are generated on things like that 
right? Uh, so that's basically controlled through emission. And, and of course, like if you hover over them, there's a nice helpful tool tip that uh, usually indicates um, what that's supposed to do. Uh, shape basically just defines the shape of emission of the particles. So uh, are the particles, so if you have like a, a cone uh, of fire, right? So the shape of the particle system will be like a cone, right? Versus if you have um, a rain cloud, right? Then the shape of the particle system might be a, a circle uh, pointing downwards, right? So the rain will fall straight down, things like that. So, so through shape, you can control a lot of that behavior of how, uh, if it's a, uh, if it's a rocket going at this way, then the shape of will be again a, a circle, but pointing in the reverse direction of motion, right? So things like that you can control, and then render much like. How we looked at image renderers and, and uh, sprite renderers are nothing but uh, things that let us control how they look and appear on the screen, right? Like what color they have, what material they have, what uh, physical properties uh, they have. Do they have a trail? Do they follow? Uh, do they react to the lights in my game? I know we have not talked about lights yet, uh, but we'll cover that in the 3D game project. So a lot of these kind of things uh, are basically covered under the, the render section. So uh, let's see. Um, so here, if I double click, right, like you can see this uh, particle effect kind of spawning. Uh, right now, it's just nothing but uh, simple sort of bubbles that are just kind of going upwards, but changing you know these kind of things these properties that we are seeing right now will basically let you uh, change uh, how and when these particles get created and formed right so let's say i change this to a thousand right so now you see there are a thousand particles getting spawned right uh, and they're getting spawned over time so uh, let's see right over distance so there's so many of these properties that you can even each of these properties you can define a custom behavior so right now you can just see that uh rate over time is just a number right so if i change this to say uh 10 or 20 right we come back to the small value but you can also uh define not just one value you can define a bunch of different ways in how to create these things right so you can define a curve where you can sort of customize how uh, on a scale of something lower to higher, you can change these values. So uh, let's see, double picking is not letting me open the curve editor. So let me see. So you can even define a variable uh, range that I want my particles to spawn at, like give it a randomization, right? Like uh, sometimes, 10 will spawn sometimes up to as much as 100 will spawn right so you can give, give this ranges as well so so now uh, since there's a smaller range uh, between somewhere between 90 or 100 particles will spawn so it will look consistent right so things like that so there are a lot of these other properties that you can define as well so uh, rate over distance is how basically um, over a specific unit of distance how much um, particles get spawned. Similarly for shape, right now they're spawning in this cone shape, right? So uh, so if you can switch to 3D view, I don't know if you guys can see it, but there is a, uh, let me try to, so if you can see, right, there is a small kind of a cone kind of a shape here. Uh, let me increase the angle so hopefully you guys can see now uh, so there is this cone uh, kind of a boundary uh, yeah so if you can see now i can actually drag this cone out and now the particles are kind of spawning so you can control how these particles spawn and if i want it to be more like a jet stream behind a uh, you know, something like a rocket or, or a car or something. Now I've narrowed it down so it looks like a jet stream and my jet flies, right? So if I zoom back out, it's like going backwards, right? So something like that. Um, similarly, you can actually change. So as you can see, there are these different kind of 
shapes that come inbuilt into uh, into Unity as to how you want. So I want now them to spawn in a sphere. So now they basically spawn at the center and just go outwards everywhere, right? And at the center of the screen, you have that sphere that very much like a Unity, uh, you know, game object. You can click and drag around to change its shape. So now they're spawning in the sphere and moving outwards. But if the sphere is smaller, they'll spawn at the center. And now you look at the spawning densities. So all this shape is defining is where within this 3D space the particles are spawning. So what we will do is we'll change the texture. So right now this is the default texture that any particle system comes with. It just looks like a, a white image with like a center. Uh, uh, let's say help. Mm, this also looks pretty plain. Uh, let me see particle. What are other assets do we have? Uh, let's use projectile and see if this looks any good. Okay, so we'll try to make some projectile part work. Um, so instead of sphere, let's switch to a cone. And yeah, so here I can control how my cone sort of behaves and how finely it kind of shoots a stream of particles in the angle, right? So you can play around with a lot of these properties, of course, you can make, since it's a standard game object, uh, you know, you can move it around and much like that as well. But as you can see, like particles are spawning over time, right? So if it was like a car that was moving in this direction, the particle stream would look something like this behind it, right? And uh, within the editor as well, you can actually just stop the entire thing and hit play again and it will start spawning. So this way, once you change certain settings, you can play around and get an effect of how uh, these will look in the game when you uh, before even having to play them because there's so many properties to play around with it would be nearly impossible if you every time you have to hit play and edit these uh, values and then hit play again and jump into the game and things like that so unity lets us play this inside the editor with before we even connect it into our game um, all right cool so as you can see a lot of there's a lot of these different properties um, uh, you can specify even say 180 degrees. So in 2D it won't be visible, but in 3D, uh, if I look from the top, it will basically give you a sense of that it's spawning particles from like half of the arc. Um, you can specify looping, so it will go around spawning. So as if I don't know if you guys can notice, but it's spawning in like a in like a disc kind of a thing. So almost looks like a ring. Uh, so let's increase the angle and almost looks like that. So as you can see that, you know, uh, trying to control and get a specific behavior out of it can be very tricky. So you need to have a good handle on how uh, these things uh, will look. So here you can see, right, like we specified a 180 degree. So it goes, spawns 180 degree and then loops around and goes 180 degrees and then loops around. So it's spawning particles in like a, a cylindrical shape. Right. Uh, if I change this to 90 degrees, you'll see it's spawning only in one quarter. Right. So you can do a lot of these kind of things to play around with different particles. We can specify their positions and colors and whatnot. Um, so we'll change a little bit about the in the render. We'll just change. So in this case, we are talking about 2D particles. So we're just using billboards, but you can specify mesh as well. Then you want to do 3D particle effects. Um, in you know when you're building like a 3D game, right? So you can do something like that. Um, default particle. That's just the material to uh, specify how the particle will look on screen. Um, so let's see, you have a trail. Do we have something for a trail effect? Gonna damage trail. Yeah, so it's like a projected trail material, right? So normally when a particle leaves, it will leave a trail behind, right? So you can specify a specific material for, for a trail as well. I think there was a specific asset for it, but we'll have to figure out. But more or less, what I just wanted to show you guys is that it, we have a very complex system and you can control a lot. So let's say if you want to change the color over time as well, right? So here we have, um, so right now by default everything looks white 
So you can change a color. I'm just going to change it to fixed and change this color value to be uh, red. So now you can see that um, over the time that particles are alive, um, you know, they change in like in, in like different color values, right? So so they're red for the first um, so say I'm just gonna say 50%. So in the exact halfway mark, they're red and then they transition to white. So you can change these color values. You can do a blend as well, which gives you this smooth transition. So you start with white, uh, so sorry, you start with red all the way up to the 50% mark, uh, and then you slowly gradient out into a a white right so typically things like fires and explosion will use this kind of an effect where they're strong you know orange or dark red or something at the center and then they turn into a yellow uh, towards the edge of the flame right so you can create a lot of these complex kind of things um, as well but controlling it fine tuning it making it look pretty is something really uh, hard to do and you can even change the color so here we change the color over lifetime which means if my particles are alive for say 10 seconds then half a mark will change it to this particular color. You can also specify uh, based on speed, uh, you can change the size of the particles over uh, lifetime. So let me show you this quickly. Um, so what you can do is, uh, some reason it's not letting me edit the curves. Uh, it's letting me edit color values. Yeah. Okay, so there seems to be some error. Ensure retry is enabled on the particle system texture. Hmm. Okay. Let's see. Hmm. All right. I'll press transparent is advanced. Retry. So I'm not sure why it's not letting me edit the curve, but I agree the curve is basically, uh, it just lets me easily define, um, just open the editor and see if the editor lets me. So if I have, okay, yeah. Um, so yeah, so here what we see is basically um, uh, defining what the size of individual particles are over their lifetime, right? So right now particles spawn with uh, zero size and they keep increasing in size, right? So what we can do is we can define that the particles spawn with say half their size, right? Uh, or if it's half, then I'm just positioning it here and I can say now particles are uh, spawning at half their size and like going up to a full size when when they're at the edge right uh, but I could even reverse this right so I could say that particles spawn with uh, half the size and then shrink over time so as you can see now they've shrunk down to zero size when they're basically there uh, near the edge so here but what's happening is that you know you can control a lot of this behavior but you get this tangent so you can control how this curve behaves um, by clicking and dragging this tangent out so i'm just going to put it down here and for now I'm, I'm going to try and just flatten it out so it looks like a straight line more or less so here you can see that they're starting at half a size and when they reach the edge they're basically going down to size zero right um, and let's say i want them to all start with their max size Right? So now you see it's completely reverse of how we had earlier. They're spawning big and then in the distance, once they hit the 10 second mark, uh, which is their lifetime, they basically, uh, you know, shut down. Uh, I, if I want their decay to be fast, that they start decaying super fast, but, you know, uh, it's more like something like this. So. So they start big, but then they shrink down super fast, and then they're just like small particles scattered midair, right? Because it's almost the size is almost down to zero. 
So you can control a lot of this behavior through this as well. Um, you can define that they start rotating after a time. So as you can see, like we just played around with only a handful of these values, but we're still able to generate this even though ugly, ugly looking effect because we haven't applied proper colors and textures and whatnot, but still we try to generate so many variations um, within these different effects, right? Uh, let me see if there is something else here. Uh, typically, uh, as we have discussed before, right, you can even have uh, particle effects that take uh, how, like a tip, like a um, uh, like how we took a bunch of different uh, um, sprites for player and put them into the animation, right? So similarly, you can have uh, particle effects that use an animated sprite. Um, so it will basically, this is like a bubble disintegrating kind of a thing, right? So initially it will look like this, then it will do this. It's, it's growing and then it just kind of disappears, right? As it, as it moves around. So, so you can have particle systems that take not just a single uh, image, but they take a, a sprite. So uh, let's see where we can set that up. Uh, so we have shape, it should be in the render section. Uh, let's see. So if you go to render, uh, billboard, sort, fudge, where is sprite? Uh, Normal, normal, normal surrender. Let's see if it's in some other thing. Custom data. Shape. Physics down shape. Bone. Texture. So this is the individual texture. Let me see if we can directly apply the asset one to this. I think it will not uh, work. The reason being is because it's a, uh, these are multiple images and not just a single image, right? So this is something I'll also have to look up because I haven't set this up in a while now. So uh, so normally, you know, you can specify the same kind of a behavior that you do through an animation, but on particles, because now you want individually all of these particles to show like those bubbles, right? So you can uh, do that. Here, sorry, I'm out of touch with a lot, lot on this particle effect. Again, most of the time on bigger projects, is you have dedicated artists and whatnot. But this is something that you should be comfortable going in and uh, you know playing around with. Uh, now that being said, normally the best sort of uh, uh, or rather the simplest solution is that you simply Google for a specific kind of a particle effect that's available uh, for you to freely use in the project, right? So. Uh, let's say if you want a fire uh, particle effect, right? So simply Google for it, there is ample free resources available online on the asset stores and such. And these are typically fairly complex to set up, right? Um, so um, don't worry, but what you should be comfortable doing is that once you import something that's free, so there are like these particle explosion effects that are available, Unity has a specific, uh, uh, you know, full setup of its own different types of particle effects. Yeah, I think I've played around with this one. So, uh, you know, they've also published a bunch of these different particle effects. Um, let me take this out so I can just place it in the background. And uh, typically, you know, uh, so you have these flamethrowers, explosion, different types of sounds, um, trying to control how they look. Then here also, if you see, right, a lot of these fires are actually not one particle effect. There are a mixture of these different particle effects. So you can see there are these small flames at the edges which are just flying off differently. So this probably one setup is a mixture of two to three different particle effects. Um, and that gives it the full look, right? So these are fairly complex to get the visual look, right? So don't worry too much about, uh, you know, hey, how do we, to set them up from scratch and such. Um, but you should be comfortable that once you say import one of these effects in your game, right? If there is some tweaks that you need to make, some adjustments you need to make, things like that, right? You should be comfortable going in and uh, playing around with these uh, properties that are set up. So you make them look and feel the way, uh, you know, it should in your own game, right? 
So uh, you should be comfortable from that perspective. Uh, and typically, you know, um, you need um, very much expert level people to set up particle effects. So, so yeah, that's pretty much, uh, you know, like uh, more or less uh, that covers, you know, uh, the different basics of particle effects. You can go in and create these and very similar to how uh, we were controlling sounds in the game, right? Um, you can similarly control uh, particle effects uh, by just enabling, disabling the game objects. Um, so I'll quickly show you on the code side of things, how you can control different behaviors on them. So, and more or less any time, uh, you know, um, let me just quickly put the script and create a new script. Let's call it controller. And so imagine you have a particle effect that flares up, um, throws a confetti or something, right? Uh, whenever the player wins. So uh, during the level, you can have a game object very much like this particle effect, have an actual uh, Factor. So just minimize this. So what you will do is typically you will just have this particle controller on it, right? Much like how we have added a controller for each and everything that we wanted. Now particle system is nothing but a, a specific uh, component that Unity provides us, right? So what we will do is we'll just switch to our code editor, uh, jump into a new particle controller remove what you don't need and all you're doing is you're defining a particle system and saying that this is my particle system right and now whatever uh, functions you want to provide right so say we want to play a uh, particle system that when the player wins right play player win effect right so we've configured uh, the particle system to show like a confetti kind of thing. So in this case, uh, all I need to do is I need to just go in and say particle system dot play, and that's it. And it will start playing the confetti on however you can, uh, however you have configured it. Now, very much like how we had sounds, you could have a simple play function and do that. But then you have a lot of other controls that are accessible through code as well, right? So you can define that, hey, is this particle effect looping or not, things like that, right? So as you can see, you have a lot of these different functions. Most of them, the name itself is um, sort of self-evident. Uh, one thing that you can do is you can define something as play on awake, basically. So right now it says it's deprecated, so Unity has probably changed this. Um, okay, so it's by default set to true whenever a particle effect uh, is started. So normally, if you have a particle effect for a confetti, you'll keep the game object disabled, and the moment uh, you need to show that particular particle effect, all you do is just enable the game object, right? So this way, it gives you um, better control. Earlier, this the one that I was showing you, that play on enable kind of a thing, you had to by default enable it, right? Uh, now Unity by default internally enables it and you just have the same access to enabling and disabling the game objects. Cool. So similarly, you can just go around, look into this class and you can figure out, um, you know, you can start learning more about it. But this is something that is purely from a visual aesthetic perspective. So something that if you uh, don't feel too comfortable, it's totally fine to go in, reuse some of the assets that are available openly, uh, be it a 2D particle effect, a 3D particle effect, and just put them into the game and play around. Uh, use that as like your starting point and start playing the, uh, playing around with them and you know controlling behavior, changing the colors, changing the shapes, and things like that. Right? Uh, cool. Any questions so far? No? All right. Oh, so one more thing. So typically you need, uh, you need uh, uh, a camera to look at the particle effect. So that's why if you, uh, you know, switch to the game view, uh, even though 
I keep this enabled. So inside my uh, inside my scene, you can see the particles are spawning, but inside my actual game view, I don't see them because we don't have a camera in this particular scene, right? So when we switch to uh, when we switch to a level, uh, so let's see, we switch to a level where we actually have a camera. If I create a particle effect here, uh, that will basically be visible on the screen. So let me switch and there is the setup. Uh, let me zoom out. Okay, so it's not set up close to the player. So player is at some position. I'm just gonna copy these values and put them here. So let's just move it at zero 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 for now. And here you can see that the particle effect is spawning. Uh, I just moved it closer to the player, right? So I'll just double click and zoom in. And now, as you can see, that this particle effects looks huge compared to the player, right? Uh, switch to 2D. All right, so you can control the size and whatnot and the, how high they fly, whether they're looping or not, things like that. So um, here, the scene has a camera. So naturally, our particle effects are visible. Um, so just make sure that you have a camera that's able to see that specific particle effect. And again, the same rules of all the layers apply to particle effects as well. Uh, so here my player has, if I look at uh, the sprite, my player has the order one, so it's in front. And by default, this would be in order uh, zero, right? So let me show you where that is. So it should be in the render section. If I go to layer order, where is it? Um, sorting mode, render alignment. Yeah, so order in layer zero, right? So because my order is zero and player is one, so the player is in front, right? If I bump up this to two, now you can see my particles are spawning in front of the player. So they're covering the player. So this is how you can even control a lot of the behavior as to where these particles spawn. So now I move my back to, so they're behind the player. So player is in front. So you can control things like that, where if you have like uh, the actual level background, then you have the confetti flying over, and then you have a, a view or a pop-up on top of, uh, you know, your this thing. The confetti doesn't need to come on top of the pop-up, it needs to come behind it, right? And the level is even behind it, right? So you can control this, how we have control always through using order uh, value and the higher the value, the closer it is to the camera and it will be rendered on top. All right, cool. So that pretty much covers the basics of particle effects. So, so, so far you'll, you know, go in and create some of the particle effects and, and the most common use cases uh, when a level gets completed or when, you know, there's a pin condition. Um, that's where most common effects are. If you have, you could have small effects when you pick up some items or you pick up a key, you could have a small, uh, you know, uh, confetti or some kind of a glow effect or things like that as well. So this is something that you guys can go ahead and pick, you know, play around with and see how you can set up a simple particle effect. Um, so uh, you can have a specific one for finishing the level successfully and a specific one for Say failing a level as well, right? Uh, where you know things fall down from the sky, giving that sad effect kind of a thing. All right, cool. Um, so, so far we implemented one basic enemy. Uh, we did add in as a bonus assignment that you can go ahead and create multiple enemies, but pretty much that covers all the core concepts that we wanted to cover. So we. Um, uh, more or less if by now you've implemented all the things that we have covered you should be in a good position to even start working on your own uh, simple 2d projects and start implementing some of these um, uh, systems with animations and tools and whatnot um, as well so any questions so far before we wrap up the 2d project uh, one thing i wanted to do is uh, just put down your questions in chat if you have any um, one thing I wanted to do was just take in any um, uh, small feature that you guys 
would think would be nice to have and we can just implement it right now within the next uh, 15 20 minutes uh, and and you can get a sense of how i think about creating something that that might be new uh, as well right so any suggestions uh, of some new feature that you'd like to see in the game uh, and i can show you how i would normally go about implementing it uh like uh, uh, i want to see like uh, like a bomb blast uh, with a sound clip and uh, the particle system both working together a uh, bomb blast with a sound clip okay yeah that's pretty straightforward right like it's not something uh, complex to implement at all actually so i'm just going to assume that this is a particle system that plays a bomb blast uh, we don't have the assets to show that bomb blast. We could import the standard Unity one that we were looking at. Uh, so let's say uh, when where's my player? Yeah. So okay, enemy, right? So whenever an enemy, uh, uh, whenever you touch an enemy, the player basically dies, right? So you could have a direct link of public. Uh, particle effect and uh, this is like a say uh, you have set up a bomb blast uh, kind of a particle effect right and then you don't need anything for sound simply you can switch to the uh, uh, your sound manager class sound manager inside the sound thing you'll implement um, bomb blast if it has like a unique sound right um so you go in and add the sound effects inside the inspector and then switch back to your enemy controller and whenever there is a collision happening all you need to do is you need to say uh sound manager dot instance sound manager dot instance dot uh play sound and give it sounds dot bomb blast right now this will play that one shot sound that we talked about and it will just fire the bomb blast sound and also if you have that bomb blast particle effect all you need to do is set active uh, sorry play so with these two lines you can just get it set up now of course uh, for actually having a visual bomb blast you will need to import the right assets set up the right particle effect so typically uh quickest way is just search for it so unity bomb explosion particle effect right and this will most likely give you some assets that are available that are readily available right so so bracket has a bomb grenade or a bomb explosion thing um uh, there is someone okay this is like a nuclear explosion apparently so so you can import any of these free assets and then uh, just put them on the okay this is probably too big for what use case you mentioned uh, this seems definitely too big uh, and more 3d and not 2d so you can even say 2d bomb blast bomb explosion particle effect 2d so uh, we'll see if there is something 2d specific that can show up as well so yeah bomber van is another perfect example where you can have this kind of thing so yeah, but, but you will have to search whichever is the right uh, particle effect that looks correct for you. If you have an artist on the team, you can ask them to create that uh, uh, specific, uh, you know, assets within like say a Photoshop or something uh, and, and they can give you that specific asset to give this effect. Uh, but more or less, first spend a little bit of time figuring out if there is something available freely that you can directly use and then uh, you know, uh, invest time into building something for yourself. Uh, more or less 99% of the time you will have something. And if it is a very specific requirement, uh, you most likely are better off having a dedicated artist on the team as well, who can create some specific asset for you, right? Uh, the other thing you will need to do is you go to the lobby and inside the sound manager, you will uh, switch back to inspector. You'll have to create uh, a new uh, add in a new uh, 
form blast and connect it with uh, like uh, say if I search it, there is a blast or explosion uh, grenade explosion right so let's we can use this grenade explosion right so so now this is connected to bomb blast and, and now our job is done um, so we have flare death we have bomb blast we have music we have fire. so all you needed to do was add one element to the sound and use that enum to trigger that sound from anywhere within the game and uh, say if a bomb blast is happening on level right um, so here if i have this particle effect uh, let's see i'll just disable it and have the let's show you the full thing uh, particle controller on it now the particle system is just this itself and on the player um so where did we call this one second let me see so we have this on the enemy controller right uh, the bomb blast explosion so on the enemy we have this enemy inside our level enemy and this enemy will basically enable this particular explosion um, and that pretty much will just work so i think one thing we need to change is in this play function uh, sorry not this play function uh, this is the particle effect right we need the not the particle effect we need the uh, particle controller uh, by that so particle controller bomb blast bomb blast and then not play we have bomb blast dot uh, did we create in the function here play effect so we'll just rename this to play effect to be a generic controller and instead of this all we'll do is game object dot set active to true remember how we just looked at that you know the game object will be uh, set it to true uh, whenever the game object becomes enabled the particle effect will start playing right so all we are saying is play on blast or play effect uh, yeah so it's not able to find out particle controller and play effect mm. okay let's see if there here he shows some error should be good okay so enemy now we have this particle controller we drag our game object in and now everything should be good the moment we touch that particular thing you'll see the particle of course it's not the actual bomb blast but you'll hear the sound as well all right some error let's see what the error is so here it's saying not reference game over controller player died uh object reference not set so let's just check what object reference is complaining about sound manager ah because we didn't start from lobby so we'll just start the game from lobby and actually flow uh select the play okay, what error is this ensure retreat is enabled on the ah because we have a part of the system here let's just delete we need it inside the level so hit play all right uh, are you guys able to get the music yes we are getting the music so hit play hit level one and in the level one so if I switch back, so you can see the particle effect started playing. Although here in this case, our game over screen shows up on top, so the particle effect is not visible. But uh, if I, uh, you know, reduce the transparency of the game over effect for debug purposes, you'll see that the particle effect in the background started playing, and there was that explosion effect as well. Uh, yeah. We played two sounds. One was the explosion effect, and one was the player death effect, because both were triggered at the time the player died. Right, so that's why there was like a mix of sounds, and it was hard to understand uh, what sound uh, got played.
okay so we can uncom like we can comment out one and only call the other so that it's clear that there's an explosion and then this is part of it so what because we have connected everything so uh, you know uh, we've broken individual components down into smaller things naturally now we are able to uh, plug and play these anywhere so i can have as many particle controllers on different game objects and just call them play effect and just start playing and if i have custom behavior for changing the color changing these things etc i can create custom functions on top uh, that let me access this particle system and directly uh, change any properties on it as well cool does that uh, you know uh, partly at least answer the the because we didn't actually import the explosion effect uh, that is something i i uh, i'll leave it up to you to play around with and, and import it and set up the particle system was implemented on the enemy or on the player neither so particle system is independent okay so the script we was at, uh, doing like something that that it must be implemented with enemy kind of thing mm, say that again uh the, in the script he was mentioning something like the that uh, we should uh, use that particle system in the enemy so that when it touch touches the enemy it will play the uh yeah so we just need, the enemy needs to know where the particle system is so that it can start playing it that's all but it's a separate particle system is a separate game object so this is like the explosion uh, or basically the death uh particle right okay so the enemy just needs to know which effect it needs to play uh when a particle or when the player dies that's all so we just connected it by dragging it here that's all okay, okay. um but it's a separate game object uh the same effect could have been played by another enemy so if this enemy uh was this is the cpu if this was a duplicate enemy and it was here right um uh, it might play the same effect so it purely depends on uh uh you know which enemy the player died with and and it just needs to know which is the effect that it needs to play on that uh, so that's that's pretty much it but they are completely independent things okay okay cool so that is more or less uh covers our um core sort of uh 2d sort of a platformer game so we covered uh let's quickly recap on all the things that we have covered so far um so week one week one we looked at a lot of uh you know how we can read inputs how we can set up uh anchors what some of the core fundamentals for unity are what these components are ui scenes basic things like that um we to we we to the model to be cover yeah we basically started covering our set up with basic enemy or rather a player not an enemy but have its animation set up keyboard movements controller player and basic player controller then we looked into um, you know actually adding movement to this using uh, you know the input that we uh, learned about in class 1 um, from there on we moved into uh, you know uh, defining these specific levels creating an actual level using unity style map system as well uh, we learned basics about the physics uh, how you know player can react to gravity stand on platform learn about collisions and such um, from there we moved on to creating multiple scenes multiple levels uh, so now you can even have like a lobby screen we looked into how we can create data for creating such levels and such where uh, you know you can define that the player has unlocked certain levels and uh, the other levels are locked which you cannot play it till the time you finish previous levels and things like that um, we added uh, communication between different scripts where uh, you know certain things will call certain things based on certain events so such as um, like we saw right now right the enemy would call particle effects to play a bomb explosion particle effect whenever a player dies uh, how we can set those basic things up um, we looked at uh, you know uh, last week we looked at some of uh, one of the most important concepts which is basically singleton 
and how we can actually create a singleton, use that to manage all our level information. Today, we looked at how to use a singleton to manage all our sound related information and have that, uh, you know, uh, consistently available all across all our scenes. And uh, uh, we looked at how we can actually set up uh, some of, you know, um, some of these polishing ele elements such as particle effects and such. So overall, we've covered quite a lot of things in a short amount of time. So feel free to, you know, uh, as you're going over this uh, 2D game project, feel free to drop a message in Discord anytime you guys feel like you're getting stuck somewhere or not able to implement any of these, uh, you know, topics. But more or less, uh, uh, if you've cloned all these Trello boards, you can continue working on that in your own time. Um, next week onwards, we'll be switching into uh, a 3D project. So we'll be again starting over fresh from a 3D project and learning some of the new core concepts around Unity as well, uh, such as scriptable objects and uh, a bunch of other things. Uh, we'll look at camera systems as well, again, because 2D cameras versus 3D cameras are slightly different and set up differently. Uh, again, we'll be covering some of the same details, like setting up a new player controller, but in this case, we'll be setting it up in 3D space instead of 2D space and things like that. So some parts, of parts will be a continuation of things that we have covered here already. Others would be new, but more or less, uh, this will give you a good exposure of how to go about um, setting up a 3D game project as well. Uh, if you want to ever work on a 3D game, right? Uh, so first half of the entire course is more modeled towards 2D and now we'll switch over to 3D as well. Cool. Um, so that's pretty much it wraps up for today as well. And uh, let's, uh, uh, you know, try and get these games implemented. If you're running into any other issues or trying to implement any other features beyond what we have covered as well, always feel free to just put that in Discord if you are running into any issues and, and I'll be there to help you out uh, with any implementation uh, and things like that. All right? Cool. Awesome. Thanks for taking out the time to watch this full tutorial. I hope you learned something. If you liked this video, please feel free to comment below and leave a like and share it with your friends. If you are interested in taking game development to a professional level, then please look at our six months game development program where we train developers to be industry ready at zero upfront cost. You will find all the details on our website at www.hubscale.com. I hope you have already joined our Discord community. For those who haven't, the link to joining would be in our details below. We usually publish a lot of information such as interview questions, hiring patterns, what's the latest and the greatest happening in tech industry, both in gaming and web technologies. In order to stay up to date on relevant information, please follow us on our social media channels, link below.